call the meeting to order in accordance with the open meeting law. The board states for the record that the meeting is being recorded by NORCAM and may be recorded by other local media. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome everybody here this, e this morning, <laughs> Watch. this evening, and uh, Chief, you want to start? Sure. Um, thank you for having us. I appreciate the board um, taking their time in the Finance Committee, um, Finance Director and the Town Administrator for hearing our budget proposal this morning. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce to my right, uh, Lieutenant Kevin Brennan, um, to my left, Lieutenant Detective Tom Romeo, and um, to his left, Lieutenant Mark Zimmerman. Um, today, today is going to be just an overview of our budget proposal. Um, I did su um, submit a detailed budget proposal packet um, with supporting documents. I hope everybody got a chance to look at that. Um, and if you have any questions during the proposal, please feel free. In that packet I gave you, um, it details our organizational chart, our mission and core values, our organizational structure, what our primary role is, um, our budget statement, any proposed organizational changes for FY18, uh, a complete operating budget, updates on our prior FY17 goals and objectives, um, statistics on our performance and workloads, uh, our grants that we've received throughout the um, FY17 and the year of 2016, what our department's goals and objectives will be in the FY18 um, budget, a fleet management update, which you'll hear from today, um, and a complete list of our police department programs um, to include statements of um, accomplishments, workloads, job descriptions, and responsibilities. Um, so our overview, the presentation overview today, as I said, we'll, I'll go through some of the, um, the over uh, summary of, of what we've done over the last year um, and what our goals were last year to give you an update. Um, I will give you an idea of our caseload for last year, how many, how many grants we received and the funding involved with that. Um, and I'll go through our budget statement, which will include um, our operating budget, our expenditures, and um, a detailed list of our overtime. Lieutenant Romeo will give a fleet management update, and then I'll finish with our FY18 goals and objectives. So um, one of our goals last year was um, to become reaccredited. We went through that process in January. Uh, we were successful in um, becoming reaccredited. This is our third time being accredited. Um, something we're very proud of has, has brought our department um, um, into a level where um, we're a model for other agencies across the state. Uh, our second goal was transitioning the schools um, into the ALICE program. So we have two offices that are trained in the ALICE, uh, as ALICE instructors, and the school also has two uh, faculty members that were trained. Um, that team, over the past year, worked together to inst institute the ALICE program. ALICE is a school safety program developed in 2000 to offer additional options to students and staff when dealing with an arm intruder situation. Uh, the program was created as an enhancement to school safety um, plans that are currently in place. Uh, the letters ALICE are an acronym that stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate. Those five components form the basis of the program, which is um, age-appropriate training. So during last year, that team of um, police and school administrators um, instructed approximately 350 teachers and staff through presentation and on-site drills. They also instructed approximately 2,500 students through assembly and classroom presentation. There were successful full-scale drills completed at all five schools uh, to include the administrative offices. Um, and our offices are being trained through presentation of live action training drills. Um, very proud of the team that put this together and, and, and has brought the, um, the school within um, the best practices of school safety. 
and it's, and it's certainly not the only ones, and I'm not going to discuss publicly what's in place, but this is certainly a significant enhancement to what was already in place. So one of our other goals was to initiate and develop a Citizens Police Academy for our seniors, and we've done that. We still have um, work to do, and we have a, a, a the first meeting planned for March. So what we've developed with um, Mary Kennedy, Um, is coffee with the cop. So local yeah. local seniors will be able to now that you're back in the room it's good. Try again? Sure. Um, as I was saying, we've developed um, monthly meetings with our senior citizens that will be billed as coffee with a cop. Our local seniors will be able to meet with department members in a relaxed atmosphere to talk about current issues that may be affecting them. Uh, we've identified several topics between police and other services to include recognizing suspicious activity, knowing who to call in an emergency, signs of domestic violence. Uh, fraud protection, target hardening their personal belongings as well as their home, and recognizing substance abuse in their families. Um, so our first copy of the COP is scheduled for March of 2017. And also, one of our objectives is creating a strong relationship with our business community. We've been reaching out, um, sending um, documentation through our social media um, as well as just um, through email letting local businesses and, and um, retail establishments know of local tri tri crime trends and um, patterns that affect their businesses and any immediate security threats that might impact their retail products or employee safety we're also working with local businesses offering workplace violence and active shooter training the training is provided free of charge to local businesses and designed to prevent and mitigate casualties in the event of an active shooter to attack a business. Um, this training is being conducted by our community services sergeant who is nationally certified to train this course. It's scalable to fit the needs of, of the business. Uh, we've already conducted one training and there are other trainings that have plan. been very well received. Um, so part of our objectives and, and you've seen us here before you before talking about the continued efforts to um, minimize the overall and social impacts of illicit drug use um, is, is recently I think we've all seen the media reports related to significant increase in opiate addiction overdoses and overdose deaths um, statistics as well as our own experience tell us that the epidemic is getting worse. We saw last year in our own community, community an investigation of the Department of Public Works which resulted in several arrests and the resignation of nine employees. That investigation was related to opiate abuse. Intelligence from that investigation led to several more arrests outside of our jurisdiction to include a large New York based prescription pill organization. A joint investigation with the DEA led to a seizure of several thousand dollars and a loaded handgun. 
since January of 2016, we responded to 24 opiate-related overdoses. Of those overdoses, three resulted in death. During that time, police officers in North Reading administered Narcan 15 times to suspected overdose victims. And those statistics only represent what was reported to us. It doesn't include the unknown numbers of, of overdose victims that were saved by um, other members of our community or family members who carry nasal Narcan. So in 2016, our community as well as the local region and um, the whole Northeast saw a rise in the abuse of fentanyl, which is a powerful synthetic opiate, which is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. Pure fentanyl is very lethal, uh, not very lethal, it is lethal and very profitable because this drug is made in a lab and is extremely profitable. Drug traffic is looking at it, at it as simple math. A very small amount of high potency fentanyl mixed with a harmless cutting agent can create a larger quantity that can be divided up and sold. To give you an idea, one kilo of fentanyl can produce a street product equal to 80 to 100 kilos of heroin. There's no silent, silent, science behind using the cutting agents. Drug traffickers are not measuring with the measuring cup and making sure the drug is evenly dispersed. The cutting agents only used as um, something that create more product and therefore more profit. It's clearly a profit-based business. Drug dealers aren't concerned about the safety of the users. They're concerned about their profits. On our end of it, public awareness and education about the dangers of fentanyl and the use of other drugs laced with fentanyl are a priority to us. Um, so, Lieutenant Romeo is going to talk to you about a few of the, the um, few of the investigations we've had with with fentanyl. But the reason why I bring this up, um, there is no solution for this problem. It's something we just have to continue to work at. I think prevention, education. Um, is a priority on the local level. This is much bigger than North Reading, much bigger than Massachusetts. It's, it's not only throughout the United States, but it's worldwide. Um, a lot of the fentanyl came from China um, and still comes from China, but they have outlawed it, but there's still the illicit um, end of it because it's so profitable. And whenever there's money involved, um, there's, they're always a step ahead, meaning the drug traffickers. So um, there is no simple plan. There's no single plan. Um, I wish there was because this drug is destroying families as we all know. Um, so our goal on the local level, and we do work with our partners throughout the um, uh, federal and state agencies and also at the DA's office, but on our level I want you to know and the community to know is that we're doing everything we possibly can. Um, as well as trying to influence other agencies that are also in this together. Um, a lot of the focus has shifted to uh, recovery, but, and I get it, but we also have to stop the flow of the drugs because without the demand, um, without the, with the supply, the demand is certainly going to be a lot difficult. Um, but there's always, they're always one step ahead. Fentanyl was something we never heard of last year. Um, and, and now it, it's pretty much all we hear of. So um, when I talked about no science in cutting the, the agent um, with the cutting, um, unfortunately with, with fentanyl is, is, is even if they cut with just a little bit of fentanyl, um, it's not as fine as heroin is. And, and, and when you see the deaths occurring, it's usually happening because they're getting straight fentanyl. So. Um, that being said, uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit about, more about what we're doing through our FY18 goals, but Lieutenant Romy is going to speak a little bit about um, what their experience in, in his detective unit. Mr. Romy, before you start, I have a question for the Chief. Chief, uh, is Narcan effective against this new drug? Not as effective. Lieutenant Romy is going to speak a little bit about that, but um, it, it's, um, no, it's not. And the other question I had was, uh, listening to a news report about a skyrocketing cost of Narcan. Yes. Do we pay for it? Or so, do we get it from the state? So we do pay for it. However, the DA's office, uh, through a grant, had um, given us a significant amount of it. Unfortunately, the atomizers that go with it, there's two pieces to it. The atomizers were on back order, so they're essentially useless to us at this point. Uh, we've ordered the atomizers, so we're just waiting for them to come in, but there's a significant demand for them, and they just fell behind on production. So it's, it's, it's 
Narcan scarce at this point. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Bob, to answer your question related to, to the Narcan, um, it's been our experience if someone is overdosing on fentanyl, we have to Narcan up to four or five times before it's as effective as if it was a heroin overdose. So the officers and, and the EMTs are administering, like I said, multiple doses to try to reverse the effects of the overdose. So through our investigations and the intelligence through um, the cases that we've been working over the last year, the Lawrence-based drug dealers are dealing less and less in heroin and more and more in fentanyl. And the chief touched upon why they're doing it. It comes down to economics. They can make a lot more money on fentanyl than they can in the heroin. The drug fentanyl has also become the choice for the addicts. They demand um, the fentanyl because it's a higher high. They, they, it's more bang for their buck. And the intelligence that we've got, we've seen it firsthand through uh, digital communications that that's what they want. They said, don't get me heroin, we want fentanyl. And that's, that's local addicts. So the fentanyl obviously poses a, a greater risk to life, not only to the, to the user, but also to the emergency response uh, people, police and fire. Any airborne particles, um, any exposure could lead in death. Um, state police just put out a a PowerPoint presentation for all law enforcement and first responders related to how to deal with fentanyl on scene, which we went over with all our officers during roll call. Over 70% of the powder that the North Bending Police seized last year tested positive for fentanyl, 70%. Last year, the North Bending Police Detective Unit seized 80 grams of fentanyl at a local apartment complex, and that was a, uh, a DEA uh, joint investigation. Intelligence from other law enforcement agencies revealed that dealers are now lacing other drugs with fentanyl. This lacing is done by the dealer uh, for his, uh, excuse me, this lacing is done by the dealer for his product to be highly demanded. In other words, they'll take, in this one particular case in Massachusetts, they, they actually lace marijuana with fentanyl. So once again, the end user doesn't know that they're getting fentanyl, they know that they got really high and they're gonna want that product again. And they're gonna go to that dealer, thus, uh, being more profitable for the dealer. This next subject is, is pretty touchy, um, and I, I don't really feel too comfortable talking about it, but, but I want you guys to know that due to the poten uh, potency of fentanyl, we've seen a spike in abuse by our youth, specifically young females. Because of this trend, we've also observed a sharp rise, not only locally, but regionally, in human trafficking by the way of prostitution. Our investigations have revealed four local females in their late teens and early 20s, all of North Reading residents, are victims of human trafficking and prostitution to support their habits. This is real. This is happening every day in our community. The North Reading Police Department is committed to assisting addicts and their families in recovery. We actively refer treatment facilities through the court system as well as private treatment centers. We also continually assist and communicate with families willing to speak with us to obtain either court orders or treatment options for their loved ones. As I said, this is a real problem. This is not only locally to North Reading, it's regional. CDC came out with a, you might have saw it in the news last night, CDC came out with a, a study on opiate abuse in, in Massachusetts is twice the national average related to opiate abuse. New Hampshire's off the charts. I think they're second in the country. Um, like the chief said, you know, this is, this is a, a, a never-ending fight. There's no answers. Every day is a new day for us. We're out there, we're trying to do our best to, to put a stop to it or try to curtail it and help as many families as, as we can. Um, it's not easy going to these uh, overdose scenes. Um, it's something that stays with you for, the, for your career. Um, in dealing with the families, we try to make it better for them the best we can. There's no short answer. We're going to keep trying.
continuing with the PowerPoint presentation, um, last year we responded to 12,106 calls. Um, this was an increase over 2015 by over 2,200 um, calls for service, or an increase of about 20%. So these are the grants we've obtained through FY17. A lot of these are, are state and federal grants. They run a little bit different um, than our fiscal year, so uh, but I put them here. Essentially, this is what we received in 2016. Michael, is this an increase in grants over previous years? They go up and down. It all depends on a lot of the grants are based upon our needs. So the 9-1 training grants are based upon the amount of hours, the amount of offices, the amount of firefighters that um, have. So part of the 9-1 training grant and incentive grant includes the mm -hmm. fire department's training. Um, and, and we have upcoming additional training, which we'll receive additional grant funding for the new, new next gen um, 91, which I'll explain a little bit further. So it does go up and down. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Steele. Yes. Um, as far as uh, the grants are concerned, grants are monies that you have to solicit, is that correct? Or is um, no, the, uh, all these, we do solicit some grants. So there are some grants that we do go out and look for that w if, if we see a need, a specific need. A lot of the grants that you see here, we've had in the past, they're, they're essentially um, to assist us in, in supporting our, our um, operations. So the 911 <coughs> grant, it's a mandate, our 911 system. So they provide all the training. So all the 911 grants are Essentially, we apply for them, but um, every community in, in the state is required to have it. Um, as far as traffic enforcement, it's an opt-in on our part. We don't have to participate, but we do. So there are, depending on what the um, trends are, um, typically they're, they're um, drunk driving enforcement grants, texting grants, um, and then we also have mm -hmm. our underage liquor enforcement grants. So, most of the ones that you see here are, are ones that have been provided in the past. But we will, I mean, the grants are difficult to get. We do apply for many other grants that we don't receive um, through the COPS FAST program, which I know some of the board members may remember way back when, when we received oh, yeah. that. And, um, but we, we have applied for them, we just don't meet the criteria. But in all cases, you have to, if, if in, you know, in all cases, you have to uh, let the state know that you want the grants. Correct, correct. yes. Right. We apply for them every year. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Continue. <coughs> so, um, so going through our um, budget, this reflected what was requested of us, which was a level services from our FY17 budget. Um, so we've been working on that since since the fiscal year started on July 1. So our proposed FY18 budget reflects an increase of 135,651. Um, it's 3.6% increase from the appropriated FY17 budget. These are some of the reasons for the increases. This is not a total, this is just an overview. The, the, the um, detailed um, increases and decreases uh, are in your packet. But um, due to the contractual settlement wages for both the superior officers and the um, Sergeant Patrolman's Union, there are some increases in uh, personnel costs. Um, there's also increase in our overtime costs. But our overtime, our overtime cost from this year to last year, as you can see, is only $7,000. Um, with our increase in our average overtime rate, which is how I figure out our overtime, we had a significant increase in, in as you can see, in the wage increases. So that overtime, there have been some reductions on our end of it um, through not only um, essentially time off, as contract settlement um, has removed some of the days off that the offices had. Um, so that, that number is actually small compared to what the increase in the overtime rate is. Um, so I just wanted to point that out because the number seem, may seem small compared to what the FY16, 17, and 18 um, contractual settlement is. As you can see, the tuition reimbursement um, is 
is $36,000 higher than it was last year. It, it's requested. So this is due to more officers requesting to attend higher education classes. Um, the contract settlement um, has incentivized offices to get their education um, going forward. So, and as you know, and I'll talk a little bit about our goals and objectives, but we have gone to the non-civil service um, hiring process. And as part of that process, we're, you know, one of our goals is to get highly educated offices. So um, I anticipate that that number will be decreasing over the years. Um, the last one, the decrease of $11,000, it, it's a decrease um, due to our dispatch module, we transferred over in 2007 to the new system that we have currently today. Um, the, the old system, the new system were not compatible. Um, so over the, the um, essentially our vendor, which is IMC, had um, floated the $111,000 of um, conversion to, from one module to the other over a 10-year period. That 10-year was completed, will be completed on June 30th of this year, so we no longer have to pay that um, $11,000 increase. So that, that will be going forward, we won't have to pay that. So this is the um, comparison from FY17 to 18. As you can see, um, our request of budget, again, it's, um, 135,651, which is a 3.6 percent increase. And you'll see the small capital. We'll, we'll discuss that during our um, fleet update. This is our detailed overtime <coughs> request. Again, um, it's just 7,000, just over 7,000 dollars increase. The um, Sick time is significant. That was cut in half due to contractual um, obligations, and that's going to be um, something we probably won't see on an annual basis, but I think you'll see some long-term savings to the town um, when, when offices retire. Holiday comp days, which essentially were um, an option for offices to take, are no longer available to them, so that has um, decreased our um, liability on that part of it as well. Uh, th there haven't been many increases in the amount of requests. Uh, the only thing that was really increased was the dollar amount due to contractual um, obligations. And again, this is our uh, just a detail. This is in your packet. Certainly, if anybody has any questions regarding it, feel free. So I, I just put this slide in comparing um, our total overtime from FY17 to FY18. Um, but I wanted to compare, I went back to FY15 and as we're looking at our accrued time off for total overtime, we had higher requests in FY15 than we do this year. Um, that is due large part by the contractual um, settlement between um, both unions. Um, you know, that, that number, if you look at the number for the accrued time off, that's a significant number because of the, um, the contractual increases from FY15. It's a four-year period, um, and we're still under that going forward this year. So um, I think that both um, the board, the town administrator, and the both unions should be commended by working together, and, and that number is certainly um, reducing. So I'm going to turn it over to Lieutenant Romeo, um, who has a fleet management update. So as you can see, the, the, uh, the fleet has been uh, <coughs> analyzed. I, I do it quite often, uh, several times throughout the year. I, I look at a lot of different factors to determine what our needs will be. Some of the things I look at is <coughs> obviously the road miles of the car, the age of the car, the engine idle hours of the car, and a review of all the maintenance costs and the projected financial liabilities moving forward to FY18.
This is a brief history of our purchases over the last five years and the <coughs> cars that we've requested. Once again, it does fluctuate. The, the I've been managing the fleet for a little over 20 years, and traditionally it was, the formula was two cars, two cars, three cars, two cars, two cars, three cars. That was the formula. That was just standard. There was no rhyme or reason. There was no analysis of what the needs would be or projected needs would be. As you can see, it, it fluctuates. In, in FY14, we didn't need any cars. We, we came before you for, for no request. In 15, we only needed one. It, it depended on a lot of different factors. So in this particular cycle, we have three cars that are reaching the end of their lifespan. And the normal formula, there's no, there's no national formula for the lifespan of a police car. The agencies that have a lot of highway uh, operation can have their cars last into the 100,000 mile and plus range. Local police departments, it's more like a taxi cab. I mean, it's stop and go, stop and go. A lot of things wear out and a lot of things break. We also look at the engine idle hours. That's the most... Um, controlling number when you look at the, the viability of the vehicle moving forward. So if you look at these cars th that I'm requesting to replace, you can see the engine idle hours on the first car is 13,000 uh, 13, hours. The formula that Ford associates with engine idle hours is 33 road miles per every engine hour of idle time. That's straight from Ford Motor Company related to um, the drivetrain. So if you, if you incorporate that into the actual miles of the vehicle, you're looking at over 500,000 miles on that car now. That car is still in, well, the car is still in service, however, it has just been diagnosed with about $2,000 worth of repair needs. It's currently not in, online right now because it's pending a repair. The other car has 400,000 miles on it, and the last car has 550,000 miles on it. Once again, that's not road miles, that's the combination of both. And there's always a delay by the time of approval through town meeting of whatever cars are uh, purchased. By the time we purchase them, by the time they are built, by the time they're delivered, by the time they're upfitted, and by the time they're put in service, that delay can be six to eight months, even last time could be 10 months. By the time July 1st, by the time the car comes on service. So obviously these numbers are all going to increase because these cars are all in service. So hypothetically, these cars could have a lot more hours and a lot more miles on them by the time they're actually replaced and a lot more repair costs. There is one correction on this, uh, on the previous slide, Chief. I don't know if you can put it back one. That first car, that should have been uh, 2012, not 2013. That car was actually bought uh, in 2011. Even though it's a 13 model, that was when Ford Motor Company stopped making the Crown Victorias and moved into the SUVs. They actually, there was a huge delay, and they actually, the model year 2013 were actually built in late 2011 and 2012. So that's, you may be a little confused on that, I just wanted to clarify that. So, <clears throat> we are requesting three vehicles. And, and the perfect analysis is the car that I just spoke of, that first car, car 14, is the oldest car we have in the fleet now. It's, we're looking at about a $2,000 repair on that car, and that was, that was just diagnosed last week. The chief and I are contemplating not fixing the car because it just doesn't make financial sense to fix it. It's going to leave a shorter car. And the reason why we're contemplating not fixing it is if I was to trade that car in now or to sell that vehicle in the open market as a trade-in, we'd be lucky to get maybe $2,000 for that car the way it sits. So we're putting 100% of the value in an investment to try to keep it on the road for what the car's worth. It actually makes no sense. If I can replace that car for $28,000 and get five years out of it, it doesn't make financial good financial sense to put $2,000 into a $2,000 car. And, and that's kind of the way we, we look at things. I can buy these units for $28,000 um, a piece. There are, there are these 
uh, upfitting costs that have dramatically decreased from uh, FY17 due to the fact that that 90% of the equipment on the car can be transferred to the new car. We didn't have that luxury before because we were moving from sedans to SUVs and none of the equipment would transfer. So that from a, from a ten or a $12,000 figure last year for an upfit has now been cut down to 6000 or 6500 So <clears throat> I think our last year budget for two cars was around 85000 uh, This year we're, we're requesting three cars and the total number would be the 105. When I was looking through the, uh, the budget and, and, and the mileage, have, have you, uh, is, you know, it seems like idle time is the killer of these guys, or one of the major killers of the guys. You looked at hybrids. Um, we have looked at them. However, they're, they're not as viable in, in police operations as you would think. They're, they're not tested nationwide. They're not tested enough to say that they would be a viable option for, for law enforcement. Um, you know, Ford, <coughs> Ford makes these cars. It's good to, the Ford Motor Company has their own plant for police cars. And that's all they're doing is pushing off police cars. These are, these are purpose-built vehicles. They're not a converted Explorer. They're actually, they don't even call them Explorers. They're, they're called Interceptors because really nothing on that vehicle is compatible with the passenger car or hybrid type vehicle. It's all, it's all purpose built for heavy duty, long life, and, and high speed. Um, at this particular point, it's not a viable option. Down the road where more communities may demand it, they may put more research and development into it where it could be a viable option. But right now, it, it, it's not. They're not available. Um, I wouldn't say that they're not available. They may be available, but certainly for our operations, it wouldn't work. Mr. Yule. Uh, do, do any other uh, car companies specialize as Ford does, or is Ford the only one that is? Uh, no, there's, there's a, the Chevrolet and, and, and Chrysler have, are both have police vehicles. Ford traditionally has 70% of the nationwide market related to police operations. That's just a, a rough estimate. You know, traditionally, I look at the bigger agencies, what they go, what, the, what their vehicle of choice is. I can tell you Boston Police um, had moved to Chevrolet short-term experiment, left Chevrolet, they're strictly all Ford interceptors. Mass State Police, they're committed to 500 units interceptors. Michigan State Police, who's the, the nationwide authority related to testing, all say, you know, bank for the buck is the Ford interceptor. Yeah. Plus, plus transferring equipment from one vehicle to another. Yeah, one we've already made an investment in equipment <coughs> Saves over the last five too. or six years related to interceptors. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do the other car companies offer a more uh, competitive price compared to Ford? They were all pretty much similar yeah. to, to price. Um, I'm not here to bash one company over another. I mean, I'm not prejudiced. It's just a really. price question. Yeah. It's not a I, I can tell you, you know, we don't do our own studies. I look at other agencies, the big agencies yeah. that do it, and, and the vehicle of choice for a specific reason has been Ford for, Great. for a long time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think. Gentlemen. Sure. Um, so you have a $2,000 you know, expense if you were to repair that. Are there other major expenses that you typically see around the like 400 500000 mile mark? Well, you know, you, can you foresee like a $5,000 failure happening on any of these at any time? At, at, any, at any time. When I purchased these vehicles, excuse me, when the town purchased the vehicle. But when <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, my wife says the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> We buy the extended powertrain warranties for a specific reason because we, we can't we can't absorb a cost of a of a transmission over an engine failure during its life cycle. It just it just doesn't make because an engine or a transmission. I mean, an engine could cost you five thousand uh, dollars, and we have replaced engines in the past uh, after they're out of the warranty. 
these vehicles are all at the end of their life cycle and will be will be out of warranty and not covered. If we lose a transfer case because they're all wheel drive, if we lose a transfer case, a transmission, or an engine, it's a, a catastrophic failure. It, it, it could cost four, five, six thousand dollars very easily. Right. And you expect that that could be so when you say that they're at the end of the life, like literally within the year or so, they'll they'll be beyond that warranty period. Well once again <laughs> when I say the end of the life cycle, I say the end of the life cycle for for emergency operation. Um, the car, the car could last another four or five years if it was in a single driver and in a normal operating procedure, because they have been well maintained. However, these are these are vehicles that are, you know, driving at high speeds and driving 24/7. I can't predict, but certainly you can look at the you can look at past history related to when they start breaking. I, you know, the old adage is Ford Motor Company has a lot of engineers know when that car's gonna break, that's when the warranty runs out. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. yes, Joe. Uh, can you just give a quick explanation of how you're determining engine and idling hours? The new new vehicles, every vehicle that we have in our fleet now actually has it programmed in the dash. So we can actually just hit a button and I can tell exactly how many hours are on the car. Going back to, if I may, <laughs> going back to one of the questions you asked about hybrids and stuff like that, I happen to just by chance met with the Northeast uh, representative from Ford. And while they think it's a it's something that they're looking at, um, there's not a lot of call on it for, for, um, for government use, especially uh, on state trooper vehicles because they're, unlike local police, they're constantly moving. Um, so there's not a lot of, like you know, like uh, Lieutenant said, there's not a lot of use for a hybrid in a, in a uh, public safety vehicle at the moment. So just I just want to reiterate what he said. Gentleman there, then Mr. Eagle, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's just maybe an operational question. What happens if you, I mean, is there a difference in performance, response time, or something if you just sh shut these cars off when you're not chasing anymore? Or? There's, a, there's equipment inside the vehicle that needs to be um, kept at temperature control. Mm -hmm. So uh, not only the officer, you know, if he's sitting on the side of the road, if it's hot or it's cold, but also we have uh, defibrillators, we have the Narcan, and we also have computers that are running in the vehicles mm -hmm. along with two-way radios. The two-way radios and the computers draw a lot of power. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, 10 minutes off that it, it would kill the battery, but any prolonged period of time with those operational, the car won't stop. Mr. Yule and then Michael. Uh, yes, with regard to the idle time, and, and I, I'm sure you, we get this question asked every year, how can idle time be reduced? Now, I read uh, in a few articles that I've seen that some police departments have the, the police car being moved almost continuously, it, it, even if that means just driving slowly around the community uh, to constantly uh, cover the whole community, but keeping the car moving, you know, you know, 10 miles an hour, 15 miles an hour through the community at night hours and, and so on. So it, how can you reduce uh, those hours? Because the, the idle hours are the appear to be the most damaging to the car than, than anything else, other than an accident. <laughs> uh, I'll answer that. I don't know if it's the most damaging. I think operating the vehicle is probably the most damaging, but it certainly adds to the, the overall miles of the car. So um, some board members may remember um, three or four years ago when um, we were one of the first departments to um, put a plan in place to reduce fuel costs um, because of the escalating fuel um, prices back then. So we do have a plan in place and the plan is that, you know, any extended period the officers are out of the car, if they're back at the station writing reports, the vehicle is off. I think what you're envisioning is, is just them sitting there doing nothing. They're, they're running radar, 
um, yeah. they're actually doing something. So when they say that, they're, they're in positions where if they're running selective enforcement, um, if they're at a domestic call, if they're at an accident call, they're not going to shut the car off. Uh, there are too many things that, um, that are involved um, to do that. You know, essentially, you're rebooting the computer. There's, there's, there's just so much there. Um, but we, we do a lot to reduce that. And, you know, certainly we're not just, you know, allowing the officers or even on their part of it, they're trying to do what they can to, to save as well because they understand the, the impact on the idling hours. Michael? Can you just summarize again the last three years what you've received for or what you acquired for police cars again? So 14, 15, 16, or 15, 16, 17? In, in 13, there was two. 14, there was no cars. 15, there was one car. And then 16 and 17, there was two cars each. Okay. So the, the, the average is uh, 1.4 cars per year over the last five years. And even with the three cars would be 1.6. 1.6. Thank you. Is there a way of getting the uh, getting us to obviously it wouldn't be 1.4 per year, but from the point of view of we got, you got three cars in the budget this year, uh, and I gather that's got to do with the fact that you know <coughs> things get stacked up and they wear out over a period of time. But have you given any thoughts to try to manage the usage of the vehicles so that we could be in a two-year two car per year versus one, two, and three, or whatever? I'll let the chief answer that. <laughs> so we do have a plan in place. There, the cars are rotated so that the, the mileage is not being put on the same cars all the time. Um, we have eight mark units that are 24-7. Um, my philosophy is to come to you with what we need. So back in 2014, if you remember, there was lengthy conversation of why we were not asking for cars. And we didn't need them. Mm -hmm. So, and I understand that you can't carry the money over from year to year. It would be, I think, um, for us would be very beneficial because we could just put it in, a, in an account and, and save up for when we need it. Um, and I understand there are times where the, the, the general government, un doesn't have the money for it. Um, if we get on a two per year, there are going to be times we're going to be trading in cars that don't need to be traded in. There are going to be times where we don't need the cars. So I don't think that that's financially responsible on my end. Um, coming here and asking for three, uh, I didn't even I didn't even bat an eye at it because it's what we need. So same thing in 2014 when I came to and and weren't asking for any. The board actually brought it up. Why aren't you asking for any cruises? The, the only thing that I can say is maybe this would be better off in, in the capital planning um, where we would know going forward what we're going to need. I just, you know, it's in our operating budget. I don't know how many other departments have vehicles in their operating budget, um, but that may be something for the board and for the town administrator to think about going forward. Uh, as you can see, that one vehicle from 2013 that's going on its fifth year at this point. So, you know, it, it probably would meet the criteria. It's just, I think, something if we're looking to plan going forward and not have it in the operating budget so you can plan your financing better. Um, but I, I just can't sit before you and say, give us two every year. Um, and as you know, we've, we've been had unmarked cars purchased through the, the town. And, and we haven't had unmarked car purchased since 11. 2011. So we're purchasing that through, through other funds, um, not municipal funds. So that certainly has you know, saved the town a significant amount over the years. Um, so I, I think it's certainly a discussion we should have about how we plan going forward um, so that the town can better plan for it. Don? <coughs> is, is this three of the eight cars, my understanding is correct, there are eight active Marking. marked cars, so three of the eight are being replaced? Correct. I suppose one way of, of, of trying trying to plan for it, and, and you know, I know you're at the point now where there is no residual value to to these cars, but um, to think about maybe that you get on a schedule where you're replacing on a regular basis, and perhaps the the trade-in value of the cars going out a little earlier than than you you would you would want them to go out, may be able to offset some of the costs and, and smooth the program out because. 
you know, three three of eight's a big big hit. Um, to to be able to get that on on some kind of a, a normalized basis, I think would would make some sense. I think, look as I say, look looking at trade-in values of a, a car that really isn't on its last leg, maybe maybe that helps. Yeah, and I I don't know that they're going to give us much more. Um, you know, you're talking maybe a thousand dollars. So over the last couple of years, we've been essentially recycling our cars through town hall. Um, yeah. They're Crown Vicks, and I, I think the last one was an all-wheel drive. Going forward, if if the town administrator um, feels it's it's the best option, these are all-wheel drive SUVs that can be now used for the town. Um, so it, it didn't make sense for us to trade. A vehicle in last year it yeah. made more sense to recycle it through the town uh, you know we can certainly speak about it I just I understand from your perspective the finance perspective where it's at but from operational it doesn't make sense to us now uh, like I said if we if we look at a, a different plan down the road um, you know through the capital that might be our best option um, but I just, I just can't come before you and ask you for something we don't need, even though it's a year behind. I think running it, running it through capital doesn't, doesn't really change the, 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 the economics of it. You're still either purchasing at odd times because they're, 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 they're beginning to fail at odd times and you're just hitting a, a capital budget versus an operating budget. So I'm not sure that that, that smooths anything out. I think the idea of maybe trying to recycle them through the rest of the fleet program in the town, uh, if, if, there, if the trade value isn't, isn't there, then maybe there is a, uh, in, in the town fleet, there is a way of transferring that over so that it's going to get um, less demanding use and may, may last a few more years, but it can let you get rid of it earlier and get on to a, you know, two cars a year cycle or whatever just a thought mr mr chairman mr chairman uh, um, sorry go ahead michael no, i was kind of thinking the same thing and i think the suggestion about bringing it into capital well maybe we can't do that but there should be some communication between the two processes because if you guys have a vehicle that's being requested for capital that we could maybe take one of these a little earlier from them to satisfy your need, we may be able to find some synergy there and have some savings. And so I'm not sure how that process actually will happen, but maybe you, know, you two smart guys can get together and figure that out. Um, because I think there would be some value in that. Because the vehicles, if you do it a little earlier, still have a lot of value, right? It, it would depend on the, for the, the Well, no, it should depend value on the use. Value was a police car. Yeah. Right, not as a police car, but for the use that you're looking for. If you have a Perhaps. department head Perhaps. that is just really going from one site to another, doing some inspections, whatever, it's very benign. Maybe we can get, rather than going out and purchasing another twenty or $30,000 vehicle, you could turn it over to you, maybe make a, a few thousand dollar investment. It's a win. So just put it out there for, for thought. I think that, as I recall, the, the reason why the police cruises are in the police budget was because it was a recurring Great. thing. And even though the $25,000, it's now above the $25,000, which I think was the limit That's for correct. capital, right? Uh, it still made sense. Uh, maybe we can find a way of just saying we're going to budget annually for two, and no. even if we don't buy them, we can find some way of carrying that money forward. It's not. Yeah. Just, just a couple of things in response, and, and I wasn't here at the time the capital committee was established, but my understanding from the finance director is it was actually the useful life of the vehicles that was excluding them from the capital process. They weren't lasting five years. They are more like three or maybe four years, oh, okay. depending, depending upon the year. And just a second comment to Slevin Frisco's uh, suggestion. There have been a couple of instances in the past few fiscal years where departments have come in and asked for vehicles for dedicated purpose. We've been able to negate or, or uh, uh, eliminate the need for the capital request because we've assigned a vehicle from one department to another. And the one that sticks out uh, the most uh, was the senior van, which we deployed here at the town hall for human services to use, which 
avoided the need for a joint request from both veterans and youth services. <coughs> so we, we do look at that. I think we should look more closely this year. I'm thinking particularly one of the DPW vehicles that's being requested that might be able to be um, addressed through uh, an SUV that may, may become available. But uh, we'll, we'll look at that this year. Thank you. Any other questions regarding the vehicles? I support it. Yes. So I just wanted to clarify. You, are, you said previously that, that the typical formula was, was it two, two, then three, two, two, then three? That was the formula when right. I took over the fleet 27 years ago. And I think that, that, the, that you've been managing it and maintaining it, and you're in the best position to know this doesn't have a durable life for us anymore in the service that we're providing. And I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure taking it out of the department's hands, you are the ones that best know this. This is your office. This is how you travel. This is how you work. You need this to be a functioning, durable vehicle for yourselves and I agree with with Mike and I agree with the suggestion that perhaps it has a different type of useful life when it's done with you and that maybe we can you know put it into a town fleet even just a transportation vehicle or something like that that we hear this need for but in terms of the law enforcement function if their need is three cars they need is three cars and and that's the bottom line and they they seem to be managing the managing well with all of their statistics that they're amassing on this and they know what their need is and it it seems like at a base rate of twenty eight thousand dollars it's a pretty good deal and i'm sure that you're also working out with the provider because you're continuing to go back to that provider i'm sure you've worked out rates that are better for the town too in terms of that you know acquiring them as well so i just feel like you know, I understand the issues, and three in one year is a big deal. However, that's their need, so let's get them what they no, need. No, I, I don't. I don't disagree with the need. I'm just saying that maybe we, we can manage it better. I yeah. mean, there's there is a re capital request this year for a, 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 a vehicle in the fire department. Now, I don't know that any of these three vehicles are now in a state where they would be appropriate for that or not. But maybe a year ago they would have been. And with less intensive driving right. on them, it may have served as that replacement vehicle without going out buying a new one. I think we just got to look yeah. at that that mm. kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah. And I think if that, if we make that sort of commitment versus you know we'll just put in the budget two, two and three, two, two and three. I think it's better this way because I think they, you know, they might have a vehicle that they need to replace in two years, and I, I'd rather see that they're doing it in the way that they're monitoring it very closely. Um, and again, they're the ones that best know what works for their department, you know. But yeah, I agree. If there's some life left that we can use, it's not, doesn't need to be as durable for law enforcement. I, I think that'd be great if, if we could, um, you know, utilize it for other town services. Uh, Bob? Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> I concur uh, with both. Uh, Mike and Kate, I think that the the conscientiousness that you, your department puts into the purchase and utilization of your police cars uh, overall would appear to result in a significant savings relative to to the item that, that we're talking about. Um, because you're washing the cars and the last thing you're going to want to do is get yourself into a position where you have a car that's not functioning properly and maybe have to wait for a budgeting uh, schedule in order to get that car. So I don't think we want to get ourselves, or I don't think you want to get yourselves into that, that situation. And again, uh, uh, your due diligence is, is obvious uh, to me that uh, even though we're, we're seeing three cars this year and two cars previous two years and so on, um, uh, it's on a need basis, not not any schedule, and, and I, I think that I think that's appropriate uh, with regard to the uh, uh, CIP uh, committee. Uh, you know, I think what Mike, uh, uh, the TA, indicated that the reason why it doesn't go into the, into the CIP is because the the lifespan is less than five years. Is that what I heard you say before? That's correct. That, that's my understanding of the practice. Okay. Um, 
maybe that's something that should be should be discussed because if you're doing it on a need basis, we're only paying for something that we need to pay for, and every time we don't need to pay for it, we're saving money and we have money that can go someplace else, be used for a different project, and, and so on. So, you know, I commend you for for your approach, and I think that's a, a good way to continue. Thank you, Michael. Uh, is in the miscellaneous capital line item in your budget, is that include the police cars? There is, I don't, the, that is yeah, that is it. There, that there is, is no, we, last year we had the um, speed signs included, and this year we do not. No, I'm just looking at the d delta between 83,000 and 105. So that, so that, there, yeah, there I'm was. I'm just wondering if that uh, the cars were included in that number, yes. or I'm looking at the wrong line. Item. No, you were, but it's the 83,000 did not include the, um, Signed boards, which were eighty, eighty one hundred dollars. So essentially, the cruisers were ninety four thousand three hundred sixty seven dollars. Okay. Right. So that that's right, so the cruisers, said are, 83, the cruisers are in that line item. I was yes, to, to, trying that's to correct. That. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? <coughs> <Is there> <coughs> <any>? <coughs> Michael. Oh, I'm sorry, Jefferson. No problem. Um, We kept going back and forth about the best way to replace these vehicles. And while I appreciate what police does, and that you know they only want to make sure that they buy them as they need them, I think I have a little bit of a different philosophy in the fact that a reoccurring replacement policy over the course of you know however many years you're going to get out of a vehicle, I think makes a little bit more sense. I think you're going to be in a situation where you're not going to have a situation like this 2012 that needs to be replaced right away, needs work and is gonna sit for a while. And then it also makes it easier to, to um, commission them to other departments within, within the town. So, you know, in all due respect, please, I think they need to look at a reoccurring replacement program based on the number that, that they feel is appropriate. So whether it's three every other year or, or two every year, I think it's something we wanna look at because then again, we can take those vehicles to have less stress on them and send them to a different department at an earlier, an earlier mark, and uh, and they'll probably last longer there. And then you can look at maybe using CIP because you may get three years out of police, but you may get five years elsewhere out of those vehicles. So that, I think that's a way of looking at, at whether they can go through the CIP or not. You know, I, I raised the question because you know that's good. we seem to be in a perfect storm going into FY 2018 in terms of available revenue and what's needed right. and you know I'm not disputing the request here in terms of what's needed I'm just looking going forward is there a way of trying to prevent you know this is an additional car this year in the budget which right. has an impact and right and I and I appreciate what the, what the chief and his people are doing they're trying to minimize those costs in off years the problem is is I, I think personally I'd rather see two vehicles every year budgeted as opposed to, you know, nothing last year and, and three this year. And I think it I think it'll work out better for them as well. Again, I understand their philosophy and I appreciate it. They're trying to, to get the most out of they can. But I think in the long run it'll allow us to use those vehicles elsewhere at an earlier mark and then allow them to get uh, a vehicle that won't need as much repairs and won't be down as long as, as they have been in the past. Okay. So basically factoring in just annually, you're going to get at least one or two, and that's going to be Whatever hard. they think is, I mean, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to make that up, but whatever they think, and again, that'll give us the ability to use them elsewhere a lot sooner. And they're, and they're great vehicles, they really are, it's just that they have a lot of, we are in tear on them because of what they use them for. I don't disagree with that philosophy, and it actually makes good financial sense. The, the only issue is, is timing. So sometimes, I can't get the cars upfitted for 10 months. Yeah. So I'm actually, and then the next year I could get the cars early. So I could get, from two different um, budgets, I could get cars probably on the road sometimes four or five months apart. So I could, so it, sometimes it just doesn't work for us. And that's what you saw happen in FY14. The cars were late coming in one year and early in the next, so we were able to, you know, in, in a calendar year, 
have four cars, but they were two different budget cycles. So four cars is 50% of my fleet. So that's why you saw the, the decrease in the what we needed for cars. Two different budgets, just it comes down to timing. I can't control the timing. It's when Ford can get me the car. I didn't get the cars for, for this last FY17. I didn't get the cars delivered till October. They weren't built and on the road till December. So that's six months. It happens. Okay, I think, I don't think the, the board is, I think everybody's satisfied with the answers associated with the need for the three vehicles. Real educated. Yes, Michael. Just one more. So certainly there are a lot of factors involved here, and, and we will work through the town administrator's office at any request that capital has for vehicles that may fit um, what we have in stock. So, But I just wanted to mention, you know, as many of you know, the mechanic retired last July um, 1, and um, Tom Romeo took over. Um, essentially the duties of the mechanic on the police end of it. Um, I just wanted to commend him for, for what he's done over the last eight months. Um, he's done it without asking for anything. He did it on his own. I didn't ask him to do it. He just essentially took the ball and ran with it. Um, in addition to all his duties um, that he has at, as in charge of our detective unit, um, you know, he inherited a fleet that was not well maintained. Um, he's turned that around. So a lot of what we are seeing with this third vehicle is probably because it wasn't well maintained. We're hoping going forward that that um, you know that does change. This is short term. Um, we're working with the town administrator, the fire department, the DPW on a long-term solution. Um, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, I mean, I've certainly told him I appreciate his efforts, but I thought that the board should know um, how much time he's put in, in addition to what. Um, his responsibilities are in charge of our detective unit. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. <coughs> the maintenance cost over the last several years have gone down. You can see it. So whatever you're doing, managing it, whether it's through warranties or whatever, it's it's certainly showing results, positive results too. So you should take some credit for that. So just um, reviewing our FY18 goals and objectives, um, we have um, training in de-escalation techniques on schedule. We have an officer who's nationally certified. Um, he went to a course um, over a five-day period, um, which essentially we're, we're dealing with a lot of um, individuals with mental health illnesses. I came before the board, um, I believe, two years ago in our FY16 budget. Um, and we've trained the whole department in dealing with people with mental illnesses. Um, this is, this is uh, furthering that effort. Um, this de-escalation technique um, teaches the officers empathy in, in trying to essentially de-escalate um, the situation, where, whereas people's perceptions of what's going on around them um, may not be reality. Um, certainly our officers aren't mental health. Um, Technicians, they're, they're, they're police officers, but we think developing skills and de-escalation techniques is certainly going to help reduce any injuries to um, any citizens and our police officers. So um, we have that plan for FY18. Um, as many of you know, um, our town voted to um, remove our police officers and future promotions from civil service to non-civil service, uh, working with the town administrator um, on working um, on policies, procedures, and, and um, an RFP for a testing company to administer a, a test um, for our open patrol position. So we're going to be working on that, uh, transitioning our whole department to non-civil service, which essentially is, you know, I didn't realize the amount of work that goes into it because we're essentially changing every form that we have um, that, that pertain to civil service. Um, so we're working on that and in, in going forward in 2000, uh, FY18, we hope to complete that process and have somebody in place. Uh, we will be transitioning to the new next gen, which is our new 911 system. Um, the state's been um, visiting our department and, and preparing us um, on the technology side of it, um, our officers will be trained <coughs> in the new next gen, which essentially is going to be um, a new system to keep up with the technologies that our citizens have. So 
people will be able to text the 911 system, send videos to our 911 systems. Um, so it's a, you know, it, it's going to be a big undertaking on our end of it. Um, they'll be training our call takers, which are the police officers, and then they'll be training also our firefighters in taking calls um, through our transfers. Lieutenant Zimmerman is going to talk about some specialized training that um, we're planning on um, going forward as well. So just like the chief said, to further our uh, goals, um, we've located two training, specialized trainings that we think will enhance it. Uh, the first one is the first responder training, recognizing veterans with uh, post-traumatic stress disorders and adding tools. I went to the training, and a lot of it deals with tools and resources that are out there for uh, combat veterans that are returning home and some of the um, troubles that they're having when they're returning home. Um, on top of that, it also, there's a whole component of it for veterans who become um, law enforcement officers and some of the struggles that they have. And it deals with resources that are available to them and resources that are available to us to help them and assist them. And it's also gonna deal with um, our officers how to handle or how to you know, maybe de-escalate a situation if they, they encounter a combat veteran who's suffering from one of these disorders. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is the specialized 911 call handling. And that's another one that goes back to the next gen um, to assist us with that. And that's gonna be done at the Essex Regional Facility, which is up at the Middleton Jail. And they are the experts and they've put together a training and what we'll be doing is we'll be putting our officers through this high stress training so they'll be handling um, calls that they've that the um, Essex Regionals has captured and our officers will handle those calls not live but uh, in a training atmosphere and it will have some of those calls will be missing persons multiple car accidents active shooters and things like that and they'll also assist us in some of the um, 911 handling as far as mapping and, and other tools that are available the systems that we don't deal with on a regular basis that will assist us with that so those are just a couple of specialized trainings that that we were going to um, be doing next year michael you talk about you know the fact that uh, and the training reflects on some of the concerns you have what's driving this? Is it the drugs or is it some other things that uh, I wish I know. You don't know. I, I certainly think drugs are, play a part in it, mm -hmm. um, but not, not in every case. Um, so I, I, do, I don't know. I mean, we, we're, we're seeing it and we have to adjust to what our society is. Um, so, you know, it's not just us. It's certainly across the board. And, that, and that's why they specialize in these specific trainings. Michael. <clears throat> well, me mental health is becoming sort of a greater issue every year. And it's one of the things I had in my notes after reading your budget. And we talk about dementia, too, becoming now another, you know, Alzheimer's. In our communities, it's becoming more and more prevalent. You know, are you, are you familiar with the Silver Alert Law? Yeah, we're, you know? we're involved. And I think that's something that we should consider in this town, even, you know, a lot of towns are building a dementia registration, you know, allowing our uh, residents that have family members that have dementia or any kind of other um, life or what do they call it a um, you know any kind of a like threat for themselves be able to come to you register those individuals in town so when you do respond or the fire department responds we already have them in sort of in a database so you know when you get a call to go to those locations what the type of people you're you're doing I, I would like to see us consider it and maybe it's part of a the community impact team as well to get involved in that, but I think it's a worthy thing that you guys should consider. So we, we do have that already. So it's through the Sheriff's Office. Um, we partner with our Elder Services on that. Um, essentially, we're, we, we do a lot of the marketing of it, so to speak, to, um, through Elder Services, um, but we've also put out um, things on social media. Um, we also have a similar program for um, kids that are on the autism spectrum. Um, so participation isn't as much as we would like, you know, but certainly it's there for people. Um, so we do have a database and, and, um, and, you know, we utilize it if need be. So there are, there are plans in place, you know, but we can certainly 
Well, know, Chief, I would recommend every town meeting it at least gets brought up uh, through the through the CIT. Oh. The community doesn't know these registrations are available to their family because every year there's some new family in town that learns that they have dementia or an Alzheimer's in their family or some other type of a illness. And if we don't continue to keep reminding the community we have these things, they're just going to stay stagnant. So I'm not putting the onus on you as the board. We have to do a better job as well <coughs> communicating with the community. And I think through our annual town meetings or however else we can do it creatively even through the CIT, because this is a great program. That Silver Alert program is, I think, pretty slick. So sure. I'll leave it at and, that. and I'll also um, talk with Mary Prenny regarding putting it out in her newsletter. I think that's important yeah. as well. And it's good. Certainly. But mental illness, is, it's only getting gr greater, not less. So um, last, I just wanted to just touch on the, um, you know, going mm. forward with um, our continued efforts. Certainly we're working with uh, the DA's office on um, education prevention, intervention, treatment and prosecution. Uh, we've shifted our focus um, to prevention and recovery and certainly um, arrest and prosecution are a last resort for us. Um, but sometimes that's the only option, uh, unfortunately. Um, you know, families out there, you know, at, they don't have any other options. And, you know, sometimes just arresting and getting somebody um, mandated help, um, so to speak, is, is sometimes the only option. So we're going to continue to work, continue to um, work with CIT and uh, with our youth substance prevention coordinator um, on getting the information out to our, our youth um, because I think it, you know, clearly starts there. We're not going to stop at all, but we certainly need to start somewhere and we need to do something. Um, you know, we'll continue to work on the, the enforcement end of it um, with our, our federal partners and state partners. Um, you know, our detectives are involved in a lot of cases. Um, a lot of cases originate from here somehow, some way. Um, so we'll continue to do that. And, um, you know, it's going to take the community to do it, not just our our department um, so we're we're gonna work with the community to get as much information out there um, and you know so we can at least minimize the effects of this and, and hopefully <coughs> stop one less family from being destroyed one less life um, so that's the end of our presentation um, certainly open to any questions Jeff yes um, it seems to me that you're a very proactive police force, which is obviously a positive for the community. And it seems to be that uh, you're looking for opportunities to better police the community uh, through programs that, that are available uh, so that when you come across a, an event, for lack of a better description, uh, you know what you're what you're facing uh, versus simply somebody just robbing something versus somebody uh, suffering from dementia mm -hmm. or PTSD, whatever the case might be. So you you seem to be uh, uh, seeking out programs like that, seeing what's available, uh, and and make use of them so that again when you you confront the situation, you know what you're confronting rather than responding in the blind. Is, is, is that a, a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're certainly can't prepare for everything, but known issues, um, we certainly do. And we've had our own programs where we've started from scratch that, um, you know, that we're sharing with other communities as well that, that may be successful. So. You know, I'm I'm part of many organizations th with police chiefs. Um, our lieutenants certainly have their contacts in, in the field and our offices as well. And every one of them, when they go to a training, you know, we ask that they bring something back that we can share with our own department. Um, we, we put out training bulletins. You know, we want our offices prepared, certainly. Um, but the special, I don't want to call them special, but they are special situations where, you know, s dealing with somebody with mental illness, you have to have the skills um, or else, it, you know, the outcome's not going to be good for somebody. 
and we don't want that. We, we know we're, we're certainly want to be able to provide our offices with whatever skills and, and abilities they need um, to be successful and minimize yeah. any injuries. Well, I'm, I'm not going to uh, say that I'm an expert in any stretch of the imagination, but my observation is at this point that we have, if not the best police department in Massachusetts, one of the best. So I, I have to compliment you because I can see from, from going back, from when I moved into town, but going back uh, the previous time I was on the board uh, through now, um, I see nothing but a, not only an efficient and effective police department, but I, but I, but I see a sincere, um, uh, that's what I'm looking for, a conscientious effort for the community. There is a connection between you and the community with the way that you function, and, and, and I appreciate that and Thank respect you. that tremendously. Ben, then Catherine, then Michael. Thank you, so. Okay. So I, I fully agree with those statements and the amount of detail um, that sort of went into the budget and the presentation. The only um, question I have is, um, and I think it's more towards the town, um, is that the, you had called out the tuition reimbursement, and, and I fully believe that there's no other department. I mean, it's, it's the most important area, I think, to combat all the challenges that, that you guys see. Um, it seems like the tuition reimbursement line item falls outside the specialized training, I guess. Um, so my question, I think this came up last year, is you know, what's the town policy overall on higher ed reimbursement? I think there, we had agreed last year that it needs to be an overall program across the province on that. Michael? So uh, there's been previous statements made with regard to what the town policy is, but the fact is that I don't know that it's necessarily a policy and more a, a practice that's tied to individual employment agreements or collective bargaining agreements. And so the issue of tuition reimbursement is something that has been uh, discussed, and I'm not going to name any one particular unit, but it's something that's coming up in, in discussions both at the table and then amongst the board with regard to um, potential changes that might be made to it. Um, they are, it is a, a benefit. It's something that, we, that, that does require some interaction with those who uh, have a contractual um, uh, right to the benefit, and it's something that we're working to address. Uh, and beyond that, I'm not sure there's much more I can say to it in a public forum other than it's something that we're aware of, we've been working on for the past year since this came up last budget season. And um, we do have an open dialogue with uh, um, one of the units that's in, uh, in this department um, with regard to this matter. Uh, it's, I, I can't say that it's totally resolved, but there is a dialogue that's going on. If I could just add in regards to, the, to that. That's one of the other strategies we took during the negotiations to get out of civil service so it gives the chief some future hiring opportunities to hire people that already meet those education levels. So hopefully going out, looking outward, this will be trending downward. Yes, that's a very good point. Catherine? But also, I think in terms of just directed at the police department, it's more of the chief's review of the program and approval comes directly from the chief. Is that right, Chief? Under the agreement it does, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. essentially, it that's how it's always, your program has always been ma managed right there. by their review. We're trying to do something s where it, it's still with our program is the TA has to approve it and, and it's a reimbursement. So there's a, um, you know, the, there's, it comes after the fact, in other words, someone asks for approval, gets the approval, has to to meet the requirements that, that are set forth. So we're just trying to maybe make something more uniform across the board to, to be applied. But I think it, it's, it's probably already in operation with the police chief in their department. Catherine, you had your hand raised for I a just question. wanted to, I, I wanted to just ask a quick question on the overtime, which was that $6,000 figure, and you had identified that it was due to um, contractual um, in other words, salary increases under that yes. would make the overtime figure increase because you're paying a little bit more in, in wages. Correct. I just wanted to clarify that. And then um, also just sort of agree with my, my colleague here. And I also think that the 
interface with the public and the social media platforms is stellar. And uh, maybe what we can do to address, you know, for example, the, mm -hmm. the program that you and Mike were talking about, put it on the, t you know, put it, link it to the town website because I might be looking at your postings and your right. Facebook and your alerts and things like that, but maybe other people might be coming to the town mm -hmm. website. But I do think that, that information that we're getting, and I also want to credit our TA for this as well, there seems to be a great line of communication, a great channel of communication, and it's coming to us too so that we're alerted as to things that are going on contemporaneous with what's going on tonight. I just want to thank you for that and commend you for that and, and commend the TA for also keeping us surprised as to what's going on. So. I really appreciate it, and um, I think that the the outreach that the police department is doing in the community, I think, is excellent. So, thank you, Michael. So, I have two things for you. First one, this was really more for the FinCom folks. I was on the negotiating committee for the new contracts, and so you see that 3.6 percent increase, and, and it's pretty significant. But I think the way you have to look at it, and at least the way we were looking at it during the negotiations with the police department was, you can't look at it just for FY18, you gotta look at it in the out years. So we may have some increases now, but giving some of the controls back to the managers that sit right over there, you should start to see a decrease in some of the overtime because in the way the contracts were structured, they were very limited on how they could manage their staff and how they could control the overtime. But I think now, we've taken away some of those things that giving you a little bit of challenge so you hopefully you'll see the overtime costs go down and we'll have some savings. Am I saying anything wrong, Chief, so no. far? Um, so that was some of our philosophies to it. So we may pay a little bit more this year, but going in the out years, you will s hopefully see some savings. The other thing I have associated with your FY18 budget, it goes back to January of this year where I learned as a board member that this board is actually interested in medical marijuana or marijuana in general. And, uh, you know, I, and I had no idea, you know, going into the start of this new year, it caught me blindsided, I got to be honest with you. But we are where we are today. You know, you read our strategic plan, nothing in there talks about marijuana or medical marijuana or anybody interested on this board associated with creating an opportunity in the town of North Reading for medical marijuana. But, you know, Chief, you saw where we're going with this, and I think there's a... Um, a majority of this board may be very interested in us establishing or trying to go into an agreement with the company to bring medical marijuana to the town of North Reading. And if I tell you that right now, Chief, would you go back and change your budget? Knowing that we may be interested in bringing medical marijuana to the town of North Reading? I mean, would your FY18 budget look the way it looks right now? Probably not. A, a, you know, there is a lot associated <coughs> with um, establishing a medical marijuana facility um, on our end of it. Uh, I, I spoke um, during a meeting a couple weeks ago. There will be impacts on our department. So I anticipate that we would need at least one person additional. So um, if the board is looking at that, I would ask that they consider that as well. Um, and you know, the background checks associated with this type of a facility are significant. You know, the numbers that I was giving um, that evening, you know, was uh, in the thirty thousand dollar range. I think that it's going to be a lot higher, and it's uncontrollable. They can continue to br just bring people to us, um, you know, lists and lists of people, investors and, and managers and workers. Um, you know, we we have a lot that we do now with background checks with, that were essentially. Um, I don't want to say mandated because I was certainly part of that process that we want that to protect our community from people that shouldn't be in certain positions. So there will be an impact on, on our department and you know certainly we would like to have our say in it. You know as far as medicinal marijuana or recreational marijuana goes, we have a drug problem. Adding fuel to the fire is not something that should be done at this point. So um, you know we're, we've taken an oath to uphold the law medicinal marijuana, recreational marijuana, our law right now, but the town should really um, examine everything before we jump in. Well, I think we as a board owe you an answer as you start to prepare this budget or finalize this budget. And I think the board, we need to take the action to give the chief some direction and the town administrator some direction on what is it we want them to do. Because we can't go ahead and approve this budget. And if this board has a uh, desire to 
grant a medical marijuana facility in FY18, we need to do the right thing as well. Jeff? Yes, uh, j just to clarify, I, uh, with the medical marijuana and the intent of the board, uh, there's no indication that the board is seeking or inclined to accept uh, a medical marijuana dispensary in the town. There was never the purpose. It was something that came to us and the board dealt with it. Okay, so, so I think that needs to be clarified. We're not out seeking to uh, open the dispensary at, at all. Okay, the environment uh, set up uh, by the state, uh, by an election, uh, created an opportunity for those who were in that industry to uh, come to go to towns and open up, a, uh, ask to open up a dispensary. Uh, they, we, the town, had set policy where we had uh, selected a specific area in town where we could have a dispensary if we were being proactive, if that were to come our way. But in, in no way was there an intent, or is there an intent, of the town to seek uh, to open a dispensary. Now, in the last meeting, uh, I believe uh, uh, Selectman Prisco suggested that maybe we should go out and uh, do an RFP for it, okay? Uh, that was a single suggestion, uh, uh, perhaps to be considered. Uh, if, if that's to be brought to the board, uh, then fine. Then, then we'll work on it on that basis. But I, I don't recall uh, anybody on the board suggesting that we go out and solicit other than that recommendation. So, um, uh, I, I, and, and specifically, nor an 18, and, but we don't know what's going to come down the line. Now, fortunately, in, in some respects, because now there's some confusion uh, uh, being thrown into the air because uh, uh, President Trump has uh, uh, taken action, or is looking at taking action uh, with regard to the federal perspective on the towns, and I think Selectman Steve O'Leary alluded to that, that, that uh, depending on what the federal government does, uh, the, whether it's recreational or medical, uh, may be a, a moot point uh, because of what the, the actions by the federal government. So um, at this point, uh, the dispensary option or discussion is, is, is a non-issue at this point because it's not been brought to us and we're not looking to establish it. Okay, so. let me just clarify something, okay, Jeff? Don't spin this thing around that I'm making the recommendation that we send out an RFP to bring medical marijuana to the town north, right? The majority of this board seem to be very interested in allowing the CAS facility to come into the town of north, right, to open a medical marijuana. That's the way it appeared. Seemed like the majority of the vote was there. You voted in favor of it. Mr. Masseri changed his mind after he saw the lack of credibility in the cast company. But up till then, I think there was a flavor for the majority of the board to vote in favor of that. And what my suggestion was, since it did end up failing voting cast a, um, a letter of non-opposition, my concern was that the majority of this board still was interested in pursuing medical marijuana for the town of North Reading as a potential revenue increase for the town. And all I'm saying, and I'm not saying I was in favor of it, all I'm saying is trying to find some control to it. My proposal was if you really want to do this, majority of the board, then please use the RFP process. Find the right company that fits right here, the best for the town of North Reading. That's all I was suggesting. I'm most likely voting no for it, but if you're going to do it, I was just giving you an idea of how you can control the process, just to be clear. I think that's exactly my understanding of it, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sir. So we can wrap this up. Uh, uh, in, in response to some of the other comments that were made, Michael, and to the entire department, the police department, I think that uh, one is least nationally, uh, you know, face new challenges, and you know, in a lot of cases, they turn into the bad guys in the news, and uh, you know, it's all wrong. And uh, you know, I think the town of North Reading supports our police department. I think that the police department has gone way overboard to 
assure the residents of this community that they're trained, skilled, and available to deal with the challenges, and you've mentioned many of them, and uh, I just want to let you know that I'm in full of support, and I think it's necessary that we support the police department and the police budget so that they can continue to do the fine job that they're doing. Thank you. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, there's been a lot of positive comments that have been made about the department, but uh, I, I want to make a couple of comments just based on some of the unfortunate activities and, and, and things that we've had to deal with over the past year. Um, but I had an opportunity, um, it certainly wasn't uh, an opportunity that I wanted, but to work closely with the department uh, based on some things that took place within uh, town over the past year. And I just want to say for the board to know, the Finance Committee, to see firsthand the professionalism of the department and what goes into the things that really they're doing every day and we really just don't see it because it's happening behind the scenes. Um, I want to thank the Chief, Lieutenant Romeo, I know I dealt with you and I've worked with Lieutenant Brennan and Lieutenant Zimmerman on some other matters as well. Um, first class professionals and I just want to thank them. They're all right. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. We take a five minute break to uh yeah. we can get started. Good morning everybody. Uh thanks for allowing me to come today to produce the fire department fiscal year eighteen budget. Uh with me today I have uh Deputy Galvin, Captain Nash, and Captain Stats. For the most part, I'll go through the sides. If you have a question, please feel free to ask. So I have the first slides of, slide of the organizational chart. Uh, it's been the same for the past three years with one change this year is that we're fully staffed. Uh, we filled our last vacancy, I believe in August, and our firefighter, um, firefighter Carey, is graduating from the fire academy on March 15th at 1 p.m. So we'll be fully staffed after that. The, the position is full. Accomplishments for 2000 and, 2016. Um, the total breakdown of calls this year are similar to last year. We had an increase, a small increase. We responded to uh, 2,300 calls. Again, the majority of our calls are EMS related. We had 1,255 EMS calls, 53%, 53, almost 54% of our call volume. Uh, fire, we had 61 calls at 2.6%. Special type of calls, uh, technical rescue and things of that nature, 13, which is 0.6%. Severe weather, nine calls, 0.4%. Uh, good intent calls, 7.5, service calls, 17%. That's the <coughs> breakdown of the year. This year through fire prevention, we issued 261 permits, totaling $7,800.15. We had 405 open burning permits. Those are not charged. We conducted 232 smoke detector inspections for uh, $5,800. We received 17 <coughs> fire reports. Now that's fires in buildings where an insurance claim was processed. And we billed for 108 master boxes, which totaled 32,400, and it basically funds the fire alarm system within the town. Also under fire prevention, we have safe grant educators. Um, they provide fire and life safety education to all the nursery and kindergarten students at all the elementary schools. They evaluated all third grade students, their knowledge and retention of the programs taught in kindergarten, and I believe it's in sixth or seventh grade that they work with the science teachers to uh, enhance their fire behavior knowledge and methods of heat transfer. The Safe Educators provided training to citizens from the Massachusetts Fire Services on Retire the Fire with an emphasis on in-home protection. The Safe Grant Educators, uh, we, the department applies for a grant every year. 
generally it's much like the police department. If you apply, you get it. And I think this year we got 40, back, do you remember the number? Over four thousand dollars to do the work in the schools and with the uh, senior senior housing. John, is there anyone over there? Little juice would work. Our fire alarm division, they conducted numerous fire alarm tests at new construction projects throughout the town. They maintained the municipal fire alarm system and made sure it was functioning and operational. Um, as long as we don't have any man-made issues or big storms coming through, generally speaking, the fire alarm system is uh, very secure and safe. But when those days happen, thank you, John. When, when storms and stuff come through, that's when we have an issue. The EMS division. This year, we also had an increase in the EMS, but a decrease in the amount of transports that we had. We uh, received calls for 1,249 calls of emergency medical service. We're up to full staff really seeking mutual aid for ALS. So we're running two ambulances staffed ALS, and we really need mutual aid for ALS. So the town's getting a good revenue there. Our basic level EMTs have completed their state required refresher training to maintain their license. Uh, we continue to provide PALS, ACLS, and 12-lead interpretation training to keep all our ALS providers current and refreshed. We've completed an emergency medical dispatch refresher program, and uh, we put our new ambulance in service in March of last year. Uh, this slide is the same slide that I, I keep in the presentation because I'm not sure that everybody remembers the difference between BLS and ALS, but BLS we can do advanced first aid, oxygen therapy, we can do semi-automatic defibrillation and limited drug administration. On the ALS side we have advanced airway management, 12 lead electrocardiogram, administration of approximately 40 drugs and IV therapy. Uh, this slide is uh, just a basic slide of our ambulance transport history from 2007 to now. And I'd like to point out that in 2015, that was our busiest year ever. We had uh, 962 transports. This year we're at 931. Uh, so we've had about 30 or so transports less this year than we did last year. This is a slide on uh, the monthly revenue that was generated in 16 from July on. Um, and finance multiplied it all out and it looks like that we're on, not record, but pace to make uh, about $671,000. Now that can change at any time with more ambulance calls, but right now that seems to be uh, what we're looking at, $671,000. Bill, uh, <coughs> the as I recall, uh, the ambulance calls uh, settled around 50% were related to... Uh, BLS versus ALS? No. Uh, yeah, that's true, but 50% were kind of related to uh, Mass Health and Medicare, Medicaid versus, you know, the typical normal health insurance premiums and we get paid less for those calls. Is that ratio stayed around the same or is it changing? I don't have the current figure on the ratio. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that it's probably roughly around the same. Uh, there is a different, as you said, tier structure for Medicaid, Medicare patients versus uh, private insurance. Why I bring it up is that we have an aging population as more and more people get into Medicare Revenue, you know, you're getting more calls in that area, yet revenue is not as great as sure. for a lot of other types of calls. So. That is true, but we haven't really seen any, a decrease seen anything in, a re in our revenue stream yet. I think the reason that we're down this year is because we've had 30 less transports. I don't think it, if, if the numbers were exactly the same and our revenue stream was low, I would say that that would probably make sense, but we haven't seen it yet. Um, receipts on net billing fees, 
Um, it looks like, as I said before, that we're going to make about $671,000 this year. And the graph depicts that we had a steady incline, but we're probably right back at 15. They look to be pretty similar. So those, again, those are based on usage. Uh, it can go up, it can go down, but that's the actual revenue that we've made since 2010. The call department uh, in 17, during fiscal year 17, the call department continued to train, oh, that should say 16, I'm sorry, continue to train in an effort to enhance the qualification levels of its members. Uh, one member was promoted to the full-time fire department, that's Mr. Carey, I talked about him earlier. One member was certified as a qualified dispatcher. One member was certified as an apparatus driver operator. The call department in total responded to 28% of the total responses, with some members having high as 43 to 48%. Um, you'll see in a slide further that I'll be asking to uh, put on four more comments. We only have six right now. So um, that number for the six people that we have is, is pretty good. Um, we do get, uh, when we need their help on ALS calls, we have two call firefighters that are paramedics. Um, both of them are full-time firefighters in other communities and they live in this community. One in Winchester and one in Woburn. So, fiscal 17 objectives. Uh, for the most part, the, the objectives are basically the same. Uh, provide the community with trained firefighters to respond to calls for service in an appropriate, timely, and safe manner. Provide fire prevention activities through state-funded SAFE grant program to our, to our elementary students. Continue to work with Elder Services to provide and test smoke and carbon monoxide detectors and replace any faulty detectors. Ensure complete and accurate processing of construction permits using the Massachusetts Building Code. Massachusetts General Law Chapter 148 and the Commonwealth and Mass Board of Fire Prevention Regulations 527 CMR 1 to allow managers of these projects to keep the job site fluid and maintain their time frame to completion. Determine the safety of employees and patrons of commercial properties through annual or more frequently if required by code fire inspections. Explore combining the public safety dispatch or regional dispatch with the police department. This is something that we talk about every year, but I decided to keep it in even though we really didn't do a lot of uh, research this year. I wanted to keep the option open in case the Board of Selectmen wish to continue that endeavor. Continue to foster good working relationships with enforcement agencies within the town and the Commonwealth. Provide the department with re reliable vehicular maintenance. Explore cost savings techniques and equipment that may reduce the cost of vehicle maintenance or repairs to the town. And transition away from ve vehicular maintenance being provided by a full-time mechanic to a combination of contracted service and in-house service of a firefighter with specialty incentive. Fire alarm. The fire alarm division will continue to watch over the aspects of all the job and make sure, make sure that the system is up and running. <coughs> they will test and repair any area that's been damaged due to human error or storm related events. Available to answer questions received from the public related to the fire alarm system. Install new master boxes and perform acceptance tests of new fire alarm systems in a timely fashion. EMS, maintain paramedic staffing to two to three paramedics per shift. Provide emergency medical dispatch to the citizens of North Reading. Provide emergency medical services for North Reading, delivering excellent pre-hospital care to its citizens and visitors. <coughs> Excuse me. Examine and implement advances in EMS that will benefit our patients. Provide continuous quality improvement through the state of art simulation training and call review. Achieve continued success in ambulance revenue collections through a more streamlined ambulance billing process utilizing our electronic patient care reporting system as well as exploring billing trends and options. Call department. Focus on filling vacant call firefighter positions. Um, I'm asking for four, um, that will come up in a, in a slide later on.
Training will focus on applying individual skill sets in team-based scenarios. Fiscal 17 budget requests. Personal services. Increased line item to 57189 those are because of contractual increases, steps, longevities, vacation coverage for qualifying new hires, and mechanic OT move to the union specialty. Repairs and maintenance, increased 20,000. Contractual service for vehicle maintenance. Um, SCBA bottles, increased 9,750. We need to replace eight 30 minute bottles and three 60 minute bottles. EMS, repairs and maintenance, increased that line item $22,000. Maintenance charge on the defibrillators in the Lucas and mechanical services for the ambulance. Training and education, $1,200, increased in the number of members requiring certification next year. Other supplies, $20,600. $2,600 for supplies due to increased calls and $12,000 for ballistic vests. $5,000 for an ALS mannequin trainer, and $1,000 for batteries and charger for the power car. Call department. Um, other charges, $6,451. Those are for medical exams, psychological exams, and background checks. <coughs> A year of responses. These pictures are taken of our men doing their job every day. We have uh, pictures of fires. Um, the picture down on the bottom is a house fire that was, as I recall, on Little Meadow Way. Um, it doesn't look like there's much damage there, but um, they had a uh, pretty significant fire there. Rick, what was the final estimate on that? <laughs> yeah. Um, that electrical fire in the basement. Kate just wanted to know if that was our house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have one of yours, don't worry. <laughs> uh, this is a fire that we had um, at Yellow Freight, Yellow Freight, right, Rick? Yeah. I don't know if you can see that up there, but this is, this is pretty amazing. That's an LP tank that runs this forklift that exploded and blew up right there. Um, that could have been a disaster. Fire was knocked down quickly, no injuries. A couple other fires in town. We have a lot of motor vehicle accidents in North Rock. Typically, how many motor vehicle accidents do you respond to a year? I don't have that number, but yeah. I'm say it's a lot. Well, I got like three, three worst slides of them. That might be a car locate. I'm sorry, what's that? I thought maybe it was the uh, which one? <coughs> the one from the garage. I, Actually, I that's Brennan. I've seen her drive. So yeah, sure. no, this is uh, this is Brennan Lumba. This is a rollover on Main Street. I don't know where the other ones are. Wow, that's great. She was looking for a three-car garage. She was to make it herself. Wow. Okay. I'm kidding. glad they're after you. And not I'm me. kidding. She's a wonderful neighbor. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you guys all remember, this is a bad drought year. We had a lot of brush fires uh, in North Reading uh, in surrounding communities. That's our uh, brush truck up there that you guys don't see unless uh, you drive around back at the firehouse. Um, that had a lot of action this year in surrounding communities. Brush fires were everywhere. Hopefully the uh, snow that we had and the rain is going to take care of that for this year. Safe education. They go to the schools, they have a trailer. Um, is that a regional trailer? We have a regional trailer that we get, I believe it's from the Dams Fire Department. We usually have it for three or four days. And uh, the Safe Grant educators go from school to school doing um, all the fire training and uh, education with the little kids. Uh, Firefighter Carol, Deputy Galvin, Firefighter Zarella. Uh, public tours and public service. That's Firefighter O'Brien right after he saved a duck. You can't get him to smile like that on anything else, but he liked having his picture taken there. Mutual aid. Um, the call up in the top, uh, I don't know if you remember, there was an explosion with uh, serious injury in North Andover last year. 
We had an engine, an ambulance, uh, technical rescue, and hazmat there for two days. Um, that was the real deal. They had an explosion there, I think, five or six years prior where two people were killed. Uh, they since moved to uh, Romania or something. I'm happy about that. <laughs> um, this was Christmas Eve day. Uh, reported kid through the ice in Wilmington. Uh, there was a bike right next to the hole and a hole in the ice. So we had to have the state police dive team come out and take a look at that. It's a fire in Middleton. Some training pictures. This is the call department training on uh, making roof cuts to vent the roof with an axe and a saw and a uh, power saw. Uh, rescue techniques: if you're cut off and you can't get out, you can go from room to room by breaking through the plasterboard and go from side to side to uh, try to get away from the fire. Um, I got some technical rescue pictures. We have uh, five members on the Essex County Technical Rescue Team. Five, six. Three plus me now? Oh, four. Okay, so mutual aid is always a hotbed. I've got the slide that shows that we did 259 mutual aid calls last year. And again, these numbers almost run true. Some go up, some go down. 71% of ambulance calls. Uh, we had 7% of hazmat and, and uh, technical rescue. And 22% fire and fire coverage to other communities. Chief. Yes. Just on that, is there a radius that you go for mutual aid or do you just the, go wherever you're called? Well, the truth is, is that we belong, we're like right in the middle of uh, two or three mutual aid districts and there's something that's called the 10 alarm running card, which distributes apparatus all over the place based on that card. So. If we're on the card, we go, but we don't go to Lynn, we don't go that far. Um, we don't go out to Western now. If there was a disaster like, uh, Donnie, how many years ago was the tornado? So in 2011, there was a tornado in Springfield. That area was totally decimated. Uh, we had an engine in Springfield for a 24-hour segment. So. The governor, I believe, in 19, what year was that, right? You were there. The um, sergeant, the um, mutual aid declaration, was that 71? So there's a mutual aid agreement with, it, with everybody. It has to do with fire, police, DPW. It says that if you're called, you'll provide the coverage that you need. So that's how that works out. So in declarations of emergency, like the tornado, they send a task force from an area not affected down to do the work, um, like in, in this case, Springfield. We went to in um, 1999, uh, was that Worcester? We sent an engine and a ladder to Worcester when they lost the six firefighters, um, along with every other community in the Commonwealth so they could uh, try to find their brothers and then to heal during the funeral and everything that took place with that. Um, we've gone to Gloucester once, um, Marblehead once, those are pretty far away, but those are extraordinary events. So I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So this is the list of the communities that we go to the most, and we can all see that Reading, we had 126 medical aids for the town of Reading last year. And last year we were 136. For a total of 259 responses to other communities, while 90 communities coming to us when we needed them. Yes? Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, why would Reading be so high? I mean, besides that, that we're, neighbors, we're neighbors to Linfield and, and so on, why would theirs be so high? They're twice the population as we are, and they run one ambulance. Michael, you're quiet. Oh, I, we had this argument last year. There's no need for, to go over it again. It's, just, it, it's not mutual. But I understand it, and I get it. But well, that, Mike, yeah. that's probably the best thing that it's ever been described as. Mutual aid is not mutual. Yeah, it's not mutual. It's not equal aid. It's mutual aid. When we call them, they come. And when they call us, we go. Yeah. You know, when it comes to this subject, the fire department guys and I, we've had this conversation. They know where I stand on it. And I get 
their perspective on it. You know, it, it is what it is. Uh, it's, there's no need to debate it. Okay. Uh, I wish Reading would step up and do the right thing, but we cert we have to supplement, and that's the way it works. Bill, and when you we're, and we're making revenue for it as well. Yeah. Yes. Me. Sorry. Do you do you know what the percentage of types of calls in Reading? The percentage. I mean, are they are, are these end up being transports or? I would say the I would say the majority of times that we get called to running, it turns into a transport. Sometimes they call it; they'll get a call for a car accident on 128. Their ambulance is at the hospital. Mm -hmm. We'll start out. Their engine will get there and say no injuries, and we get returned. But for the most part, I would say 80 percent of that 126 is transport. Does Reading run ALS? They do. They've been running ALS for. Oh. Okay. Years. But they only run it out of one ambulance. One ambulance. Yep. There's a piece of equipment I got rid of. I think it was. No. Oh, sir. So on the uh, mutual aid, how, how do you plan for that staffing wise? Because I, you know, it's it's a revenue source, but you know, you've got to assume. Well, there's, there's no, we don't really need to plan for it. I have people at the station right now. If Reading calls, they get in the ambulance and go, and then we backfill the station with two members. So, as soon as it's a transport, we hire two members to come in and back up the second ambulance, but it's not for the second ambulance, it's in case there's another fire. So that's how it's done. Any other questions? So, uh, this week I was asked to provide a slide for mutual aid calls and time of day. Um, there were 89 pages of data and you could see in the day there were 217 calls, and in the night, 121. Um, I'd be willing to try to answer any questions on where that came from. From me. Okay. But it wasn't mutual aid. It was just calls. Just calls overall. Mutual aid, your calls, calls you know, for our own community. Well, I, um, that's not, I didn't get it that way. Uh, I can I can it, it it it's my fault, I probably didn't, Explain it that the majority way. Majority of calls, and we actually had a slide, Mike. I don't know if you remember this. Probably I do. three budgets ago. <laughs> I do. It was a good slide. Up, and the truth is, is that if we did the numbers today, they would probably be exactly the same. I believe our busiest days are Sunday, Monday, and Friday, during the daytime hours, up to probably three o'clock in the afternoon, and then after that, it slows down a little. Do you want me to dig those up for you and mail them to you? No, sir. Okay. I, I, if I could just, if, for the chair, ask some questions and you may, maybe you can educate me a little bit on this. Through the chair. Is it okay if I ask some questions? Yeah, sure. Do you have another slide, <coughs> Chief? I have a couple more, but we can wait. Okay. Um, you know, the budget obviously is the budget, and we're all trying to find better ways to manage the money. And when I went through your budget this year and I looked at your, you know, trying to look at the call volume and, and I read your overtime, you talk about station coverage and you talk about callback. You know, it was kind of odd. Last year, you guys had station coverage like around 2,800 and then uh, callback around 4,200. And then this year it's kind of flipped, which made me start to think like, why? So I thought maybe we could start the conversation off by Explain to us, if you could, what a station coverage is and then what a callback is. And then you can maybe try to explain to me why last year it flip-flopped in the number of hours. Why it was way more last year in station coverage than was callback. Now this year, callback is more, it's less. It generally has to do with how busy we are. Station coverage is ambulance coverage, uh, mutual aid coverage, and things of that nature. And callback is when we strike the box. They're two separate things. So that can simply be because we were busier with boxes last year than we were this year, and we had more calls this year than we had last year. So finance figures out um, the formula, and we try to address it on, on a historical um, history over the last couple of years, and that's how we do it. Um, when I was speaking with Lori Ann this year about adding more or adding less, we both we decided that we would try to keep going with the same formula that we had. And that's why there's a difference. So the thousand in your, it's about a thousand hours, a thousand hour difference from last year to coming, going forward for next year. I believe it's because we haven't had the number of boxes that we had last year, but 
That's callback is boxes. Transmitted box. We trike a box and everybody comes in. Okay. And if we have a busy year, that number is obviously going to go up. And if right. we have not so busy a year with callbacks, that number is going to go down. So what made me think about it was you presented in your budget about 61 calls for fire. And only eight of those calls were real fires. Right? Okay. So in those 61 calls, everybody comes in. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. So a lot of times we might get a call. I had a fire in my house two days ago. Well, now I know I need to have the fire department investigate it. So I took care of that on my own. So we will just send a single engine up there to look at that. Sometimes we get a call that we think is for a building fire and it's really not, or vice versa. So without looking at that data specifically, I'm only guessing on, and a lot of it has to do with the way that they check off, don't, what's that called, the NIMS? No, the um, NIMFRS, yeah. It could be a category checkoff issue. Sometimes we have problems there. Okay. okay? So as I'm going through my thought process on all this, then I start looking at it and, you know, I looked, at, you got about a 300 hour increase or 200 and change hour increase in your overtime for hours. And, you know, I started saying, okay, I get it. The call volume's up and you're projecting the call volume to probably even up even more. Um, and then I started looking at it my mind, okay, well, what's the time where all the calls are? And I know we were in agreement with you to have the five guys, which I think has been working out wonderfully. But, you know, Chief, as we go through this, if we can find a better way to manage it and try to save some money on the overtime, do you have to have five guys when the call volume's really low, like in your evening hours? Do we have to have five guys sleeping in the station? Can we go with four, try to have some savings, try to take that extra almost 300 hours that you added this year, maybe try to reduce that to nothing? Are you asking my opinion? Yeah, I'm trying to educate me. So I'm just most asking. Fi most fire deaths take place after 11 o'clock at night and 6 o'clock in the morning. So if we were going to have a fire, chances are it's going to be during that time frame. And the answer is yes. So we, out of need, we need to have and meet the most minimal national standard, which is 2 in, 2 out. And going to 4 does not allow us to meet that standard. I get that. And there's some risk associated with where I'm going with all this. I know that. Okay. Again, we're talking about money. We're talking about budgets. Sometimes you just have to assume a little bit of risk. So out of the 61 calls that you had last year, what percentage was in North already? Of those fire calls? All of them. <coughs> all 61? Yeah, that's <coughs> true. Yeah, a mutual aid call has a different criteria. That's a different, that doesn't get in that 61 calls. Okay, good. And so what I'm looking at is if we have 61 calls here in town, North Reading, and we really only had eight fires, maybe there's just some level adjustment we can make in our budget. And I assume if the call volume's higher during the day, you don't make it there. You make it in the evenings. That's all, that's my thought philosophy on it. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's the best way to go about it. So like, like I'm going to ask you a favor, Barry, if we can get him the microphone, or you oh, go I'm to the sorry, microphone. Oh, that's my fault. I dropped the ball. Just because oh, so I, I know do that. the f people at home would love to hear this. So, so a couple of examples. Uh, one in particular would be Edgewood Apartments or a school that's in session. If an alarm is received from the Edgewood Apartments, no matter what time of day, or a school that is in session because of the potential for life safety issues, we do a callback. So that's not a fire, oftentimes, mm -hmm. sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's not. And that we incur a cost for callback for those types. It's just simply not safe to answer that type of call with just the on-duty four guys. Mm -hmm. um, another example would be a gas leak. It, it's not safe to respond to a gas leak in a building with the potential for an explosion and basically harming the first in crew so that creates a struck box. So it's not just fires that we would strike a box for. And that, that kind of accounts for some of the reasons we strike a box and there's not an actual fire. Hopefully that helps. 
so you kind of going where I was. I wanted to go with this, and it wasn't really not only to see if there, chief, there was a better way for you to manage. You may try to find some savings in the way you manage your overtime. And my thought was, if you could explore it to see if there's some savings at night, that's fine. But the other piece of it was the next question I was going to ask is, okay, so now we have all these calls. Is there a general area in town where a majority of these calls are going to? And you brought up the Edgewood Apartments. And, you know, and, I, and I look at this and I talk to you guys about it and you have told me there's been a massive increase over there. You, there's a lot of calls you guys go to there. Am I wrong? Am I stating? 60%. 60%. Edgewood, west, west Side Town. I just want to stick with Edgewood. Uh, you yeah, get a, a lot of calls at Edgewood, but that's not the data I did, Mike. That's okay. okay. I'm going somewhere with this. All right, go ahead. So our bylaws today, the way they're written, doesn't allow us. You know, we should be allowed, we should have to go to car certain calls, certain locations on a common basis. But when it goes above reasonable, we should have the ability to build back to the owner of those facilities your services. I'm, be I'm a believer in it. And I know it can be done, but I don't know if we have the law. Yes, sir. We already do that. So if you go there already so many times. I've already built, uh, what's the company? Oh, sorry. Edgewood has yeah. a project going on. Through the construction, we try to keep the Chief. services in. Chief. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> it's so good. So Edgewood's doing a major well, sprinkler Mike's. upgrade, and through this project, we try to keep the systems, because people are living in the building, up and running as much as possible. So we have had some instances where um, the alarms come in quite a bit recently, where we've incurred costs. And I, you know, as the fire prevention officer, I explained to them if, if this gets to be a problem, we're going to bill you. So we have, you know, if we go and investigate, and they were negligent in doing what they were supposed to do, we've sent them a bill. We don't routinely do this, but during this project, we have done this to Edgewood. And well, we have, I think, paid for three or four uh, callbacks. Well, I'd like to explore this, op this idea, because I believe it's been done throughout the Commonwealth <laughs> in different towns and cities. But I think you have to have a bylaw or some kind of a structure in place that allows us to have, it goes above and beyond the reasonableness. And I, and I just see a trend happening with our fire department going in certain areas. I believe there is a bylaw already, and I think it covers police and fire, that says after the third nuisance call, they can be billed. It's already there, Mike. I, I can't put my finger on it, but if you go oh, I'd love general, to see that. I think it's in the uh, yeah. general code of North Reading, it's uh, malicious false alarms, and they can be built. It's similar to the police responding to a house alarm. I think, I think, it's, I think it's in there. It's a bylaw. I love that. Yeah, I got to read that. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll it's there. And just so you know, when, as the deputy explained, if we go there and they're doing something that they're not supposed to be doing, as an example, we told them we want all the smoke detectors in the area that you're working to be plastic bagged and taped. If we go there and they've done that, we're not charging them. They've done what we've asked them to do. What the deputy's talking about are cases where they have not listened to us and basically said, we're gonna do what we wanna do. As soon as I hear that, they get billed. It doesn't have to be three times. I've had some serious issues out there, and the deputies called and told me what's going on, and I say, tell them they're getting a bill, and they pay for it. So we're doing our best to curtail that as well. Okay. So I just wanted you to know that. So, good. Well, I'll look into that by a little bit more, but those are the two things. And the last thing I had for you was, you know, in FY17, when you were here, you presented your overtime budget. You were at um, about a little over 17,000 hours. It was like 17,100, and now you're at 17,433. That's, I think that's because of the new guy? Yep, that's okay. okay. You computed it at 4916, but my calculation is 70, it comes out to $75. That extra 300 hours is at $75 an hour, so I'm not sure if there's a calculation issue or am I misunderstanding the way it's calculated? Um, so if you take the 300 is, hours. It's calculated for me. I'll have to look at that because I, I did not. I, don't know where you're talking about that. Okay. Please, please. If you take 300 hours, right, and you divide it out, <coughs> it, if I'm calculating it right, it comes out to about, at your average, 
I just don't think it adds up to uh, 49 and 16. I think it comes out something different. Are you referring to the fiscal year 17 budget document itself when, you, when you're pulling that number? Because we're not finding that number in this, in this document. So you, I'm assuming you have, you've opened it and looked at last year's budget. It's not on that. It's not on this year's paper, right? Right. Just make sure I have it right. That, you don't have to answer it today, but okay. if you could look into it. No, but is it, are you referring to something in the budget? I've just looked at last year's compared to this year's, and I looked at that 300 hours and how many, right now we, I'm, it, said, it states 49.16, and it's 300 hours in there, and I don't, I just think it equates to more than 49.16 on average. But I could be wrong. If you look at the dollar figure, the total overtime, you look at total overtime numbers, 857. Go back and look at what the overtime was, or FY, what you presented. 834. 834. That calculates to $75 an hour. I'll have to compare the The difference between the two is $75, right. not $49.16. So there may be a, a formula issue or calculation mm -hmm. issue. That's all I'm saying. Other than that, it's a very good budget. Thank you. So um, generally, at the end of my presentation, I have a, a national study or something that says why we need five guys all the time. And um, this fire right here, actually, Liz, is this the long one, please? Yes, okay. So this fire right here shows the benefit of having a lot of people to available to fight a fire in a short amount of time. This fire came in right at shift change on June 9th, and um, I think it will answer a lot of questions. And it's nice to see something about North Reading firefighters doing the job that you pay us for and that we're grateful for doing. And I think that this shows what kind of fire department that we have and we appreciate all that you do for us. It's about six minutes.
on uh, Kingston and Burdett, I believe. Um, 18 minutes. What, what was the cause of that fire? Um, it was caused by a short circuit to an old, from an old electronic panel inside the garage. And uh, the day that it happened, the winds were very bad. It was actually a brand new pickup truck right behind the white car that I moved before the uh, fire truck got there or else they would have lost their car, their other truck as well. So um, these guys, they do a great job every day and I'm grateful to work with them. That's Jim. Thanks, sir. Mr. Yule. Yes. How soon were they able to uh, move back into the house? They didn't have to leave the house. They could have stayed, but they chose to stay with friends. Um, they lost a couple of windows on the back side of the house that all they had to do was have them board mm -hmm. up. There was no damage inside the house. It was all stopped on the exterior. So it was an elderly couple, as I recall. Um, I they, went across, they went next door. Is there a family member that lives next door? So they didn't have they didn't have to move out. However, if you were, did not respond as timely as you did, I think it would have been a different set of circumstances. Thank you. Video depicts you need manpower to get the hose lines in place and knock the fire down. And if that wasn't achieved in a timely fashion, the house would have probably been lost. But it does show, that was as, as I was watching it, and I've watched it before, how you keep pouring water onto it, water onto it, and fire is uh, very uh, stubborn. doesn't like to stop until you put so much water on it that it can't go any further. So, um, there was propane involved in that fire. There was gasoline involved in that fire. Water. Oh. OK. Yes. Uh, a community that relied on mutual aid like some of the other surrounding communities did, would that have been a much different outcome? No, because though, I, I think so, but those communities are different than we are. They have two engines, a ladder truck, or even more available. Like Wilmington, they run uh, basically three engines and a ladder. Reading runs two engines and a ladder. Andover runs three engines and a ladder. North Reading runs one engine at a time. So those communities, although different from us, would have acted the same way. I pointed out that the fire came in at 1730. We were lucky to get the second engine on the road within five minutes. Had that call come in 15 minutes later, we would have had to wait for the firefighters to drive from their houses to man that engine to get to the call. So, you know, the, the, the communities that have the coverage there all the time, they would have probably put that fire out exactly. But I guess what I'm saying, would Red, is, is Redding ever calling on us for those type of events because they don't have Oh sure. There? So yeah. if we were kind of like them and we relied on them to help us in that situation. They yeah. did they did help us. They were yeah. there. But Wilmington went to the fire and Redding came to cover. I guess I'm sorry, I'm not sure. <coughs> no, I'm not saying will we be able will we able to have such a good response time because we have you know X amount of people on hand where if there's other areas in which we had less people on hand because we relied on maybe other mutual aid, would that have affected our response? No, see, see, the thing is, is we don't rely on mutual aid. See, that, that's, a, that, that's a, something that needs to be stressed. Mutual aid is supposed to be used when you exhaust your resources. So if we had a call for a house fire today, if we're receiving calls, we might start an engine in, but we won't call anybody until we get there. Do you see what I'm saying? Sure. sure. So, yep. You know, we, we call our, our members in to fight the fire in our town, and then once we get there, that's when mutual aid comes in. And I don't know if you uh, heard when I, when I said we have a work and fire, as soon as I said that work and fire actually means that we're gonna get an engine to cover, another engine to the fire. So, uh, Captain Stats? And that's exactly what I was just going to explain, is our process is that when, when the chief uh, indicates certain things, like. Uh, working fire or second alarm fire, that puts automatic mutual aid companies moving right away. Okay, so, and that happens throughout every community in Massachusetts, depending on their size. Okay. Bob? Thanks. Catherine, go ahead. So, I, I guess I, I just wanted to kind of follow up. So why, um, 
and I don't, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but why are Reading's mutual aid calls so high? Is it because of our proximity, or is it because they're not staffed? No, they staff one ambulance. Yes. They have twice the call volume we do. You can't look at a fire call and an ambulance call is the same. They have one ambulance. As soon as that ambulance goes out and they get another call, they're either calling North Reading, Woburn, Wilmington, or Linfield, depending on where the call is. So those mutual aid might not be for a, a fire? In other we, uh, the, the slide that I showed you yeah. for Reading this year, we did not go to Reading one time on a fire call. Okay. As I recall, not one. So, so that so could just be for an ambulance call right. or something so that they, they were being reimbursed for. Correct. If yeah. they had a house fire on the Havel Street line and they struck a working fire, one of our engines would be there or vice versa. So Mike, I know what you're saying, Mike. So we're, we're getting reimbursed for the call, but we're not getting reimbursed for manning the station during the call, which is putting two more people in the station. Well, in essence, you are. Um, three budget cycles ago, I was asked to do a little test, if you will. I went back. I ran all the mutual aid calls for one month and the amount of money that we built. We built out $8,000. And it was um, $800, uh, $900 in overtime. So we made a profit of $7,100. So I, wanna, I just want to ask you, just for my clarification. So you need four. That's your minimum, right? You need five. Excuse me. I'm sorry. You need five. Right. When they go out to a call, and I'm, I hope you, you don't have to every call you make is a, an act of fire. And, and, I assume most of your duty is prevention anyway, so you're responding to stuff to prevent that circumstance from elevating or, or you know, communicating to the house next door, I guess, and things like that. But when you do that, you're bringing two more people into the station when the whole station's out, right? Can you it just- depe It depends on the call. Okay. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll go over all of it. If we were to transmit a box today, which is a first alarm response, two engines, a ladder truck, and an ambulance. We would send out a page that would, all of our phones would go off with a code so every firefighter knows that they're needed. They would go back, they would man the trucks, whoever's available, they would go to the call. That's call back. Ambulance coverage. When our ambulance, whether it transports from in town or out of town, commits and says, we have a transport, we hire two guys back to make the shift five. When our engine goes to a fire or to cover, we call back four guys to man the station. So the only time there's a general callback is when we get a call for a building fire or a serious car accident or gas in the building or a building collapse, only in North Reading for the most part. So when they come back, when they come in for a, the call back, is there a specific period of time that that's paid, or is yeah, it so for the duration back, of the event? A or? call back is three hours minimum okay. per contract, okay. and station coverage or ambulance coverage is two hours minimum call back, okay. according to the contract. Yeah. So in other words, that is more um, manageable fiscally than just manning the station with eight people. Say, or well, six people. Or there's always talk about how many people do you need so you don't have to use overtime. And there's been studies that have been done by our finance department over the years that have showed that right now it's more economical for the town to pay us than to have extra staff. Now at some point that's going to break, but every year that's a question that gets asked. And um, that's the way that it's been since I started here. It's just with the but with the uh, benefits that go along with new employees, it's easier to pay us to come back and use us when you need us as opposed to not needing us. That's been the philosophy of the town. There is one factor though, Kate, that was discussed last year that I brought up was the wear and tear doesn't get captured in all this on that ambulance and that means the replacement for us comes a lot sooner. If we didn't have to go to Reading for 126 times and then transport from there 80% of the time, 
Think about that wear and tear that we don't have. And then, so we're replacing that vehicle even sooner. We don't ever capture that cost to replace sooner in all these numbers that we do. That, and, and I just take issue with it. And, and I know you guys respect my position. I truly respect your position. But I just think it needs to be out But, there. Mike, I really think we do. And I'm sure that if you don't agree with me, you're going to tell me. We collect money on that. And we buy our ambulance with yes, that money. Yep. So you're probably right. We don't charge for specific oil, fuel, and things of that nature. But the money that we generate from those calls go into that account, and we pay for our ambulance with that money. Well, in fact, when you're doing a transport, right, mileage is part of the uh, charge. Correct. But I'm talking to Mr. Prisco's point, the wear and tear on the vehicle. Do you have more, or? Oh, no, I'm done okay. unless you so guys have more. Open, open it for the questions. Michael, go ahead. Chief, you know, last year, um, Mr. DeCola brought up something in his budget that he was thinking about doing, and that was um, drone, using a drone to do his inspections on some roofs and stuff like that, which I didn't see in his budget, but I hope we, the, the conversation comes up because I think it's actually a pretty unique way for us to do inspections. And I was thinking about the fight department where you guys do a lot of building inspections, and some of it's up high, and even um, you guys do some pole locations for your wiring and things like that, which is all up high. Do you see a need or a service that could be useful for you hiring a service to do any drone inspections for you guys? Well, I mean, that would only be one aspect of the inspection if we were using it to look at roof lines and stuff, but the majority of our inspections are actually the exterior of the building. The majority of the fire code is inside the building. Yeah. I, yeah. So. I was just curious on the outside. I don't know, it might work in a certain scenario, but I don't see it as something that we would be using on a regular basis. Okay. What do you think? I, I, I don't see it. Maybe, Ricky, what about you for far along? Don't see it. Sorry. Mr. Yule. Yeah. Well, for Mike's point, the drones, how do you do a roof inspection? Wow. Up so climb what up they do for a living. Stairwell, a hatch. I, 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 I knew the answer to that question. So I think the, the, the drone, the drone scenario, yeah. uh, creates a, a if it is a workable See, solution, it creates a, a more safer environment. I, I agree with you, but on one hand, I don't, because we don't do the fires that we do on a regular basis. It's great to bring the ladder truck up and throw a stick to the roof so that you're doing some training at the same time. So if Barry has to get on a roof or we're helping the police uh, going up for a bank robbery or someone up on the roof, that's training. So when someone's hanging out the third floor window with smoke coming all around them, they've had access to that piece of apparatus and they're using it. So yeah, there's always great ways to make our life easier, but sometimes it's better off that we position the apparatus, we throw the stick to the roof, and we climb up and get up on top of the roof, because that's our job. That's what we need to do. Okay. Thank you. I think it might help in a public safety situation, a lockdown or something like that, but then you'd still need someone who's capable of manning it and being able to communicate to whoever's on the, in the, in the area, what they're seeing, you know. I, I do know that some large city departments, mainly out in LA and things like that, use it for wildland. You know, they're looking at perimeters, they, they have helicopters, but for us, I don't see the application. It could, it could benefit someday, but right now, I just don't see it. Uh, yeah. Plus, you probably have to have someone man the drone. So that's a I'll volunteer to be <laughs> Well, your video, it's a video. You could have anybody go out and do the video and then deliver the video to the fire department. They do their review. So and here's something else that you may know. If we have a large brush fire, um, the state police have the ability, excuse me, to send microwave down from their helicopter to us at a communication um, truck that we would get from war. We've used that twice before. So if, there are, if we need something like that, there are mechanisms out there that we, we can 
not a drone, but we can get a helicopter to come out. We can see what they're seeing from above. Bill, will you talk a little bit about the state of the uh, fire trucks and uh, replacement plan? Um, the state of the fire trucks, we're really good. Uh, <coughs> sound. The replacement plan um, through my career here has been um, a plan much like the police department yeah. talked about today, except um, the finance committee suggesting that we stay on a plan that we buy like every X amount of years and we try to stick with that. It's a seven year cycle. We have the NFPA that guides the um, age of our vehicles and they need to be replaced when they're older than 25 years. I actually have three items in front of capital improvement right now, a new vehicle, a new fire engine, and some radio equipment. Uh, because next year, engine three will be older than 25 years old. So before I became chief, somehow the, the mechanism of year replacing vehicles fell apart a little bit. I don't know how or why. But engine two was replaced, I think, two and a half years later than it should have been replaced. So I know that Chief Murphy spoke a little bit about his mechanical issue and Detective Romeo, Detective Lieutenant Romeo taking over uh, when Mark left. Uh, I have the same issue. I have Firefighter Burke, who is uh, handling all of the, I would say, minor mechanical issues. And we're sending our trucks out to uh, local vendors that um, handle other fire departments within Massachusetts, like Cody's, North Andover goes there, and there's other places that do that too. If we have a major malfunction, which we did this year with Engine 1, we had to have, uh, John, what was that car? The whole pump PTO system on Engine 1 needed to be replaced for a of about 14K. So other than that, the trucks are in excellent condition. They've all been maintenance, they've all been inspected, and uh, they're good to go. So I have no issues, and I want to thank John for all the work that he did. Not only is he managing the equipment, but him and a few guys at the station um, actually cleaned the whole cellar in the heat of the summer, and uh, it hasn't looked better. So uh, I appreciate all the work that the men in my department have done, especially John, so I thank him for that. And you and I have had this discussion about the uh the need to send the fire truck out with an ambulance. We have. And we're talking about wear and tear on the fire trucks at the time, I believe. Yes. And uh, is there another way of dealing with it? I know that the presentation you made to me was that, well, you know, we've got two men out, we've got two men in the uh, fire truck, they're there to assist, and if a call comes up, the fire truck's ready to go. Correct. All right. And uh, the issue is, additional manpower to deal with a medical call? Well, it, it's twofold issue. That is correct. When the ambulance goes out, it's chased by the engine for two reasons. First reason, as we said, you may need more than two guys to handle a medical call. Cardiac arrest, you're going to need three guys, maybe four guys. If the paramedics are dropping lines and intubating the patient, someone needs to be doing CPR. You need to be extricating the patient from the house. Two people can't do that safely. So the other, the other part of that equation is that when the call is over, I have two members ready to go in the event they receive a call for a house fire. So I can't fight a, fight a house fire in a pickup truck. So I need to send the engine in case there's another call. And it's happened to me twice in my career where I've been out on a medical and been in the pickup truck once and in an engine another time. And being in the engine is a much more safer event for everybody involved. So that's my, that's my point. It's twofold. Extra manpower, and you're able to handle the second call in the event that it's a fire. Anybody else want to add anything on that? Don? We can go back to the mechanic, just so I understand what's, what's happening here. Sure. In the, in the, uh, the budget, um, last year there was a $50,000 item. That's gone. And if I'm reading it right, in you know, what you heard what you're saying, you're going to be doing a firefighter is going to be doing the, the minor mechanical work. Is that what the overtime item is here? The $6,600? 6, 
Yes. So we're, we're trading the 50 for the 66, but there's got to be some other things that are being Yes, in the budget, right. In the budget this year, yep. I asked for an increase on EMS and operations of 20 grand, just for repairs. So yes, that's correct. Right now, that overtime increase was taken from the mechanics account and put into operations because John is actually a union firefighter. So the money had to go from the mechanic account so what's our what's our net change in our cost of mechanic then in well, from last um, year to this year's budget? About four weeks ago when I met with Liz and I met with uh, Mike, we ran some numbers and we spent about nine thousand dollars worth of salary since July fifth. Right. Let me let me phrase oh, this is that, that you, you, you had a fifty six fifty thousand you had a fifty thousand dollar budget item last year. What is the equivalent Cost wherever it is in your budget for fiscal 18. So I, I think I can <coughs> probably answer okay. that. Um, we last year there was a salary light item for the mechanic of approximately sixty-one thousand dollars. That was the base salary. Then there's longevity and all that added to it. Um, so that is no longer in the fire department's budget. Instead, there is budgeted overtime for vehicle repair as well as emergency um, repairs for a total of $16,470. Um, and then you also increased your repairs and maintenance budget by $20,000. So um, there's a savings of, call it, you know. Okay, so 36 versus the 60. Yes. Okay, that, that, yes. Was, that was my question. Oh, sorry, I didn't get it. Just trying to see what, what, what we're, we're doing here, what we're saving our, our what are the additional costs were. It's a saving. Yes. Gotcha. Yes, I'm sorry, Kathy. Chief, I think you mentioned um, the replacement. So did you put that in as a requisition this y this year? I don't understand. To replace a fire engine? Oh, that's through capital. And is that in there? Yes, it is. is. And can you, do you know what the co replacement cost would be? $575,000. And, um, what do you do with the old? Engine. Same thing the police do with this. I'm going to let them drive it around top. <laughs> <laughs> the truck is no good. It's it's over 25 years old. Yeah. It's so there's no use for that. Uh, it's going to be the TA Three. vehicle. Yeah. Be a flower pot. Three. Three. No, I'm just I'm just curious if there's a. Yeah, the the, if there's a repurposing of that can be um, done for that. They give us a small trade-in, and the truth is, is it generally ends up, in my opinion, if someone, like, someone in this room bought one of our old right. trucks. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I hear they get sent to other countries that can't afford fire engines that really don't have the rules that we have. I know. I'm familiar with them being auctioned online because pe there are people that like yeah. to buy them, but I, I don't know what that would be. I'm just curious what the current cost so, of So in capital improvement, I have, uh, as Keller said, I asked for a new car, mm -hmm. radio equipment, in no order, by the way, yeah, yeah. and a new fire engine. Okay. Michael, you, uh, you wanted to put the first was just to highlight that while the, the state of the fleet is very good, there is a, a significant capital request that's on the horizon for, the, for this department, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, with regard to uh, the request. And the second is just with regard to the mechanic. I mean, obviously, this is something that we're in a bit of transition with. Um, we do see that there's a cost savings that, that's in there with regard to the fire department budget. Um, you know, it's a little different in the police department budget because they don't have the staffing dedicated. It was kind of being used uh, as needed and charged back as needed, if I understand it correctly. Um, but it's something that we'll continue to look at with public works as well, and that'll come up in the next uh, budget hearing going through this fiscal year, but we weren't prepared to, to responsibly make a recommendation at this point in time to make any further change to FY 2018. Thank you. What do you mean? Do, that you want to put a mechanic on staff? No, or? no, just, uh, again, it's an, an, eva an ongoing evaluation as to the best way to provide the service to all three departments, and it's not something we're prepared to make any further recommendation for change from what we're doing right now. Okay. Michael? Are we at the end? Because I had one thing I wanted to bring up that Chief and I have met on a few times. Mr. Messier, if I just have a few minutes to sure. do that. Yeah. Um, but I want to say first and foremost, though, you know, we talked about the opioid issue in town and the drug use and the, and the uh, overdoses. Um, and, you know, 
you, you listen to the police chief and the amount of calls they have, but you know, our ALS guys are the ones that are responding and they're saving these people and, and it's not easy. So I really want to thank you guys for everything you do because I know you physically see it and you have to deal with these people and I know that that's got to be emotionally draining. So I don't want you to ever think it goes unnoticed and it's much appreciated. So I've met with the chief and his staff. Um, you know, we're starting to get prepared now for our economic development in town. So I've been meeting with them and presenting to them what we're thinking about what we're doing. And the Pulte sale is one of those discussions that we've had. I wanted to make sure they understood the magnitude of what's going to happen over here at 104 Lowell Road. And we get a presentation. Uh, we have a uh, proposal on the table, a uh, PNS on the table for 450 units being built over here on Lowell Road. And what's that impact to the community? What's that impact to our fire department? So I've gone in, I've sat in their station, we've talked about it. Because when we go into March 13th to the special town meeting, I'm going to have to stand up in front of the public and present this, those warrant articles that are associated with the change in the zone and to allow that to develop. But I know the question that's going to come up, and it should come up, is, okay, what's the public safety impact? And actually, we, are, we had the bidders submit in the RFP. We wrote in that we required them to submit what impact on the public safety would we have with any proposal. And in this particular case, you're going to have almost 1,000 people, maybe even over 1,000 people moving in the to this location, you, know, you heard the chief say earlier, about 70% of his calls today come on this side of town. You know, in the past years, we've done studies and we talked about, do we build a west side station to address these increasing calls? Now here we are talking about adding another 1,000 people over here to this 70% area. So that's why I wanted to see them, to get their ideas, to get their feedback, because when I stand up there in town hall, I mean, at the um, town meeting, and when these questions come up, we should have an answer. And I think as a board, we really haven't had a lot of opportunity. We've all been so busy to really discuss this public safety issue. So as we were going through it with the chief and his staff, they come up with some ideas. And I believe it was Captain Nash that actually had the suggestion because over the years, they've heard me come in and talk about the, the cleanliness and the building and disrepair over there uh, where they are now. And I've been pushing for some capital money to improve it. You know, going through those discussions, Captain Nash, would, he, he stated to the chief that, you know, it makes no real sense for us to make a massive investment in that existing building. It makes it, we have to make some investment, but when we talk about this increase now in call volume on this side of town, and we have to make an investment at some point, it would be probably the most sensible thing to, to decide now to do a feasibility study to build a new brand new fire station on this side of town rather than invest in a building that has no more square footage for growth you know the chief's talking about getting new vehicles new vehicles probably take up more space and things like that so this it, it made a lot more sense to me when we started looking at it so we've met now a couple times we've gone through this and I wanted to present to the board this idea while the FinCom was here it's really not an FY18 budget issue but it is something that I was going to ask you in June town meeting that we put a warrant article out there for a feasibility study to build a brand new fire station on this side of town. And with the, you know, the sale of the JT Berry is going to bring in some money. And it's certainly going to have some future revenue numbers. But the one thing that is going to definitely happen, you know, the money will work itself out. Their volume is going to go up. Their, their workload is going to go up. And I just want the board, I would like to just share that with you today and I have everybody here in the room I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to get it out to the public so when we go to the meeting on March 13th that we're all on the same page because this question is going to come up and I would like to look at them all and say we're going to support a warrant article to do a feasibility study and where do we build that is something that we have to discuss between now and then we may not have to have the answers on March 13th but I would like the commitment of everybody in this room that we're going to work towards something for June town meeting you know, when you look at the, where we sit today, this location sits on 10.4 acres of land. It's amazing. If you, I want you to go online, go to our GS, um, GIS mapping off our town website, and you can look at this facility. It goes back quite a bit. Very little wetlands here, so we have the room to grow. We could actually even do a feasibility study to build a new fire station here on this location attached to a new town hall. You know, things like that should be studied. We can't wait any longer. Their current location is aging. It's getting worse for them over there. And their ability to respond and deliver 
to be in a safe environment over there, it's getting harder and harder. But I agree with, agree with Captain Nash. It probably makes more sense dollar-wise to build something new where the majority of the calls are, and then maybe we flip-flop the idea. The existing fire station becomes our remote location or our satellite location for uh, secondary response, and then gives the Chief Murphy an opportunity to expand a little of his space, his foot space over there as well. So I know I threw a lot at you, but I figured I had everybody in the room. We had a few minutes. I want to take the opportunity to bring it up. And maybe, Mr. Viserys, so this is something we bring up at one of the meetings between now and our March 13th special town meeting to make sure we're all on, on board. Well, I, I agree that we need this kind of a discussion. Whether we need it by March 13th, I don't think is necessary. If you're talking about doing a feasibility study. I think I heard you say, maybe you didn't misspoke, is that it wouldn't be a 2018 budget issue. It Sorry. seemed to me that it would be if you're going to do a feasibility study. Right. Meaning that it, it, we would put money in the warrant in June for a feasibility study. That's why I brought it up. I wasn't sure. I'm looking for direction. I, I but think I think that we have two board, things. I think it's something the board should discuss, and I don't disagree that input from our public services, public safety, on both sides, uh, should have input to this. It, and I, I think maybe taking it in two paths. The first path is that we go to town meeting on Mo special town meeting on March 13th in agreement that in the we have to address this issue of public safety and the ability that the fire department has what they need to take an increased volume in the next five years. There this is, is something that's going to evolve over the next five there years. There is no article on the March 13th. That's correct. No article. That requires any decision with respect to what you're talking about. That's correct. Right. But when people stand up at town meeting, we have to get the public to come and vote in favor of these zoning changes to build residential housing, age-restricted housing here. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, I believe there's going to be some people showing up that's going to say, before I vote to change that zoning and give you this approval, what are you going to do about the increase in public safety over there? We're gonna, that means we're going to have more impact on our fire department, more on our police department. How does our fire department respond to more calls on this side of town? Because this subject has come up in the past. You've approved in the past, even before I was on the board, to do a study about a potential West Side fire station. There's actually been, I believe, two studies. And, the, and there's valuable information in those studies, and I'm sure the chief can brush the dust off those and provide it to everybody on the board if you want to read it. The justification, the rationale to come up with a solution for a quicker response on the West Side of town, it exists. And I don't think anyone can debate that. And I think we're going to acerbate it as we make an approval to build new residential homes that are going to bring up another 900 to 1,000 people. That's all I want to do is just be ahead of it so we can look at people in the eye on March 13th and say, we're going to address a warrant article potentially in June town meeting to do a feasibility study for a new fire station on the west side of town. Well, I think that's the way I would answer a question that would come up on the March meeting. Well, I couldn't say that without us having this discussion and everybody shaking their head yes, including the FinCom, because, you know, what, they have to play a role in this, because what I'm talking about here could have a significant magnitude of money here. So. Don? I, I, I'm not so sure that the feasibility study is the first thing that you need to do. Okay. okay? I mean, they're, I'm they're looking for help. spending money on trying to design stuff that you, you, you don't know how you're going to pay for it. I think the first thing to do is to look at the the issue, look at the, the the potential of financing such an endeavor, whether it is a new fire station, whether it is a public safety building like some other towns have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the even even the, the, the location where the police department is now is certainly is not ideal. But I think that it needs to get looked at, but I don't know that I would go spend money on a feasibility study now. You, you already said there are a couple we could dust off. Well, this, and, I, and I'll, I'll speak for Abby because this would be something she would, would say that 
you know, what we don't need is another study for something <laughs> we can't afford to do. So I think the, uh, the, the thought here would be say, all right, we need to do something at some point, whether it's next year or three years down the road. Let's look at that in conjunction with all of the other things that we need to do in the town with, with, with respect to, to major capital investment. And this could be one of them. How does it all fit in? Okay, and once you've determined how it fits in, how you can you can pay for it, then you do the feasibility study with respect to siting it, size of it, what it includes, whether it's police and fire, whether it's just just the uh, fire, uh, whether you keep the old fire station open or not. Those things I think are come after you take a look at the 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 total need and and how you could possibly go about financing. Oops. Feasible study is a good idea, but it's, I think it's premature to spend I, that kind of money right now. Like and I called it that. I wasn't sure what to call what is it I want to do. And what you're saying makes a lot of sense, and you'll get no disagreement from me. I wasn't sure what that process is. And what, so what do you call that? And, and is there any financial? Well, I think it, it's a commitment by the, the, either the, the selectmen or, the, or, or, or an assignment to the Capital Improvement Planning Committee or some other organization, or the, the TA, I don't, I don't know where, but there has to be some commitment to go and let's look at how would we do this if we, if we decided that at some point in time we have a need on the west side more so than the east side, if that's, if that's the, 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 the situation, for some other kind of a facility. Okay. Mike, Mike uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, the only question I had, we talked about cows uh, on the west side, but I wondered if a lot of those cows are right now for EMTs, or are they for uh, where someone's doing construction and they're generating the cows? I thought new buildings hopefully would be more uh, up to date with fire protection. And I, and I wondered, is it a station that we need for a post service station that might be needed? Or is it mainly for uh, a lot of residents who may need EMT? And I don't know if any of that so, cow data we have on the west side yeah. would answer that. Well, the chief can, you can chime in if he wants, but my discussions with them up at the fire station a few times now, you know, the call volume majority is EMS call or ALS calls. And we're putting an age restriction units in, 55 and older which means they're gonna require more ALS calls. So that piece is gonna go up. The buildings, no, nobody's gonna doubt you on that, but I think you know, what, you've, what you know now is that the majority of the calls over there are really ambulance related. I think what you're angling at there is does it require a full station or just an EMT station? And I, don't, I have no idea so that's the thing. So we're in our, our dis yeah. My hesitation, Michael, Finished. My hesitation, Michael, is looking at we have this meeting, Monday night we have a meeting, the following Monday we have a meeting, and then we have the town meeting, and we have pretty full agendas for those three meetings. It's going to be difficult to have a lengthy board discussion before the town meeting, uh, before the special town meeting. I don't think it takes a lengthy board discussion, Mr. Masseri. What I think it takes is in agreement by everybody in this room that what I'm talking about is real and that we're all in agreement that we're going to figure out something so I can look at the public in the eye and say when you vote for this and we're going to award this comp, this purchase and sale to a, play, a company that's going to build 450 units, we're going to come up with a public safety solution to protect the people that are going to be moving in here and the people that live on this side of town. Mr. Chairman. Who had to hand up? Well, first, the I chief wants to make the gentleman's question there. The microphone, if you don't oh, mind. Sorry. The microphone. Oh. You can't hear me, Mike? No, it's the people at home, Bill. Okay. So <laughs> your, your question is, is do we need a smaller station or a larger station? Yes. I believe is what you're asking. Yeah. In my opinion, we should build a fire station on this side of town that can handle the next 40 or 50 years of service to this community. In my opinion, it does not make sense to try to take a totally congested fire station over there that's been documented by two previous studies that it is beyond its useful life with all of the stuff inside that building. 
it makes more sense to build our headquarters, if you will, over here now because 60% of our calls are over here. I've been on this fire, not as long as Ricky. I've been on this fire department since 1982. 60% of the calls are better are over here. In bad weather, it takes us a very long time to get here. Back when I started the job, the majority of the firefighters lived on this side of town. It made sense to put an unmanned west side station over here. That is not the case today. An unmanned station over here to alleviate the storage problems at the fire station on our apparatus floor does nothing for the remainder of the department. It doesn't increase our space needs at all. It makes more sense, as Captain Nash said, to flip-flop it. Put our headquarters over here where 60% of the calls are and leave that side for now unmanned with hopefully moving to a manned station and at some point reducing the overtime. That's a long way away. That's more manpower. We're a long way from that, but the discussion needs to happen. That station, when we order our next fire truck, it's going to be tight. And that's what the space study says. It's four point, I just shut the book, I'm sorry. It's, I think it's $4.9 million to address the needs over there on the apparatus floor, the bunk room, and a few other items. It's $7.5 million for a brand new station to handle the next 40 or 50 years. The, in my opinion, that's the way that we should be looking at this and turn that into the satellite station. Most of our people are responding from the center of town or just over the Middleton line. That's just my opinion. I just want to make sure that everybody knew what we were talking about. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> no, I, recall this, Go ahead. I recall this from last year. I mean, I think that's neutral of the, of the very problem, right? I mean, that is, whether, whether, we, whether we permission this or not, it's, it is your Still a problem. Yep. To have it on this, on this other side of town. Yes, sir. So it's neutral of that. Right. I mean, it's part of that proposal. That's but right. We acerbate it. We make the problem. I, I, th I think it's a mistake to suggest that this 450 unit thing is going to somehow cause a public safety crisis. It I does. think it's a mistake to approach it like that. No, it, I'm not saying it does. I'm not saying I, it's a I, crisis. Yeah. I'm just saying it, it increases their volume. Correct. It's going to, over the next five years, over the next five years, that will be all built out. And then their vo call volume is going to increase every year as it builds out. That's the point I'm trying to make. So we have to. We're already going to make an investment in a solution for a problem that already exists. And what I believe the suggestion of Captain Nass makes is a lot of, makes a lot of sense is why invest the money over there when all the call volume is majority of it's here and we're going to spend the money. Why would you put it into an old building when you could just build new? It would probably make more sense. You know, you've got to think for, you know, the next 30 years here that you know, this um, investment. Mike, if my public safety officials are telling me property proposal is going to cause a public safety crisis. I might need to change my vote that I provided. Well, if I said I crisis, I apologize. We talked about this before. We talked about it in our strategic planning. We know the need is there. But if it's going to be a public safety crisis, okay. I'm going to modify how I voted on it. Okay. Uh, if I use the word crisis, I, I did I use the word crisis? Uh, I if think I did, did, I might, apologize. But we're going to take care yeah, of that right did. now. And, and Yes. We will handle what comes our Absolutely. way. Absolutely. I but feel like we have a qualified <laughs> yes. force here that, to me, from this presentation, is professional and, and managing a whole lot, not just for us, but for other communities, you know. But I'm, I understand bringing that, and we have a need to address. But it's, it was already there. The need Correct. was already there before this proposal came in. I think it what sounds Mr. like you're even addressing the higher volume of calls directly related to the Edgewood properties, too. Sounds we're like we're addressing those, but Mr. Prisco is right. I, I don't believe it's going to be a crisis, but it's definitely going to increase our run volume. And if we're having more and more runs, there's going to be, at some point, the, the star that bakes the camel's back. We don't have anything out here. We could be down at the Thompson Country Club and get a call for a cardiac arrest out here and we're just not in position to handle that. So someone might say that that's a crisis to an individual, but it's going to increase our call volume 
And that's, I think that's what Mr. Well, my point was we have to make an investment no matter what. Right. And by adding another 1,000 people over here just increases that issue. That's all. Right. That's all I'm saying. And, and it's over time. It's not like something happens. It has to happen next year. And we have an opportunity now to make an investment in really coming up with a solution. And if you look at our strategic plan, and when we all sat and met this year, we talked about town hall and the fire department are two infrastructures we have to invest in. So I think the timing is right. And all I'm looking for is the ability to sort of outline, I don't know what the process is. If it's not a feasibility study, whatever it is, I'd like it to be in the FY18 budget, if that's the right location for it, to start to get serious about finding a path forward. That's all I'm looking for. There's no crisis. We're all good. I just want to make sure that we have a path to address it. Because we've been talking about it a long time. Chief, we had two studies, and we still haven't done anything new. So I don't want to continue to do that. Okay. Any other questions regarding the fire department budget? Well, do we need money in the budget to discuss? There you go. <laughs> Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, just a comment. During the chief's budget meeting with the finance director and I, we had a conversation with regard to the issue of call volume in the department. Uh, and a, a, a portion of that discussion was related to potential future development on the west side of town, whatever, whatever it is, whether it's because we're doing a sewer study on Main Street and we're going to try to increase the amount of business that's there, whether it's because we attract housing or mixed use on Main Street, whether it's because of a potential development proposal on the Wilmington line. There's a number of different things that we hope are going to generate additional activity on the west side of town. And the discussion that he and I had was, should we be looking at some sort of evaluation of the long-term location for a fire department facility based on that change. We discussed whether we should put it into the fire department's uh, budget. We determined that probably wasn't the appropriate place. It was more appropriately discussed as a Warren article item. And it would, would have come up or will come up depending upon the discussions for June town meeting. The, I think the, <coughs> I'm gonna reserve my comments for now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. Uh, I think the good news about all of this is we have the dialogue, and the dialogue needs to continue. All right. Whether you know Mike has some very good points, uh, whether it should be an 18, uh, 2018 budget, we need to talk about. But we have the dialogue, and we know that we can go to uh, it at the special town meeting, and we can say to the community that we are having the dialogue because it is, it is part of the process and we need to consider these things. Uh, we may not have a final decision right now, but we are moving forward on it because we have the dialogue. And I think Mike bringing it up at, at this meeting is very good for us to, to, to look at this more seriously than just simple conversation. So. Any other so, questions regarding so, the fire department budget? Uh, Mike. Again, Mr. So I, I will yeah, add to my right. comments. So thank you, Mr. Ewell. So I guess the, the Finance Committee, the members of the Capital Improvement Planning Committee have heard me stress that we know there's needs at the fire department. Um, there was a discussion two years ago, and we've put a, a small, I don't want to, not, not very small, but a, a smaller amount of money to try to make some uh, improvements to the facility in, in the interim. But the need for the facility has been there and we will continue to be there and we know that and the most the second study i think that you're referencing is two years old now or a year and a half old if i'm not mistaken right the studies in 2006 and there's one before that from 74 okay so I, i'm i'm referencing the built the building studies yeah the space study the, the, the facility the my point is that the facility need predates the proposal that's out there on the west side thank you mr chairman so can i make another comment then yes just because I think, I don't think we need another study about it because we know there's the need and we have spoken about this need. So can't we do something different where we have the, you know, we have a, a land available, can't we do something different which d definitively focuses in on the timeline that the Chief's talking about acquiring a new engine or what we can do here in this space or in this location, can't we focus on that, move it forward because they're not going to be able to park this engine in the parking lot. They're going to need a place to house it and 
that it fits and everything well, else like that. Can't we? We don't need another study, in other words, I on that whether we need it or not. I, we know you know, we I, need I, it. I think going back to what Don said was that uh, you know, I think everyone on the board, and this goes back for a long time, is quite aware of the issue of the fire department, fire station. We're also quite aware of this building and the issues associated with it. Michael's been outspoken, outspoken on both of these issues more than once. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we have an opportunity coming as a result of getting some capital that we desperately need. And uh, I, I think we need to, now that we see maybe a little light at the end of the tunnel with the opportunity maybe to move a couple of these projects forward, I think we need to have a, a total review of the projects uh, and uh, dis decide on priorities and how we're going to get them done. I, uh, and we have other challenges too. So uh, I, I don't disagree with getting a dialogue going and it's in our strategic plan. I mean, it's, this is not something that's fallen out of the, the sky. It's just that there's a little light under the tunnel associated with maybe a way of moving it forward as a result of the sale of the Berry property, which isn't completed yet either, so. Nope. <laughs> uh, sorry. Bill. You're absolutely right. It's been around for years, but I think that we need to look at it differently than we've looked at it in years past. No, I, I don't think, disagree with that either. I think that's I, the know, moment. I, think we all I don't want to just, I, I'm, what I'm trying to say gracefully is it's not that we don't want a West Side Fire Station, we actually think that the West Side Fire Station is going to be the answer and it really should be headquarters and over there, we let that be smaller. So, you know, the studies say a small unmanned West Side Fire Station, that's not what we're asking you, sir. I just want to make sure that we're clear on that. I, I think, if, from my perspective, I understand that clearly. Okay. Because to, to make major re renovations and make that the central fire station where it is, right, we're out of space, okay, and it makes no sense. And it's been like that, and maybe that's why nothing's been done, but because we need to do something else. I just wanted to and make now sure the opportunity that is good. moving in that direction. We're getting more people on this side of town, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to close this if there's any, you know, unless there's some additional questions regarding the proposed fire department budget. If not. Uh, I just want to end this by one thanking all the members of the fire department, those that are here and those on, that are not here, for the job that they do every day for the community. Uh, uh, I think the community has high respect for what you guys do, and certainly the Board of Selectmen appreciates all the effort that you put in to make this community what it is. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So it's just, again, uh, by way of introduction, uh, Andrews here is our DPW director and has been since uh, October, appeared before the board in January for introductory purposes, and uh, he's brought with him today uh, Julie, who's the building superintendent, and Mark, the water superintendent. And uh, I will uh, turn it over to, to Andrew. All right. Thank Andrew. you. Thank you, Mike. Um, good morning, Chairman, um, committee members, board members. Um, this is Department of Public Works fiscal year 2018 budget overview. Um, there's a brief agenda there at the beginning. Uh, we'll go through, obviously, as we go through. You know, feel free to ask questions. I'll try and be as, as brief as possible. Please. <laughs> um, currently, the DPW staffing, this is where we stand at, the, at, at this point. Um, the DPW has 28 positions, which has been in place for quite a while. Of that, 22 are currently filled. There have been five new hires since June 2016. Um, there are currently st still six vacancies. Three are heavy equipment operators, two are water treatment plant operators, and one is an administrative assistance, assistant. Excuse me. Um, we have Still working off the authorization of to fill those three of those positions, um, and then the r remaining three will be carried into the salary pool. Is not reflected in the DPW budget. Andrew, just a brief question. You, you note here two water treatment plant operators. Who's covering that? Because that's something has to be covered. 
Correct. We, we still have water treatment plant operators that are, that are staffed here, um, so we were able to manage that. Utilizing all the time? Correct. Thank you. For well, the regular. Right. Yes, Michael. So just to clarify on, on that comment, so the water treatment facilities require daily maintenance, obviously, as you're, as you're aware, and for the board members who don't know, it requires daily maintenance. The overtime would be for the days it wouldn't ordinarily be working, so Saturday, Sunday, holiday. But otherwise, they're doing it within the context of the regular work day, as I understand it. Correct. Right. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chair? Hmm? I'm sorry, Joe. Oh, just a quick question back on the two water treatment plants. Are those one of the, are those two positions part of the three that are authorized to fill? Yes. It, well, we, I believe we carried one and we put one in salary pool, I believe. I believe there's one, yes. So can I just throw something out there? If we're talking about going to MWA by 2019, I believe. July 1st, 2019. We, we want to relook at that and maybe contract it out for two years as opposed to having two bodies on that may not be required in two years? Something we could look at, sure, certainly. Thank you, Joe. That's it. Okay. Um, th so this is so this is currently the um, DPW organizational chart. I apologize for probably the tough to see. Um, oh. Mr. Chairman, yes. through you for the board members who have their uh, iPads here. The presentations are actually uh, in the Dropbox folder for FY2018. Liz, is that right? Thank you. So you should be able to bring oh. it up and scroll, zoom in. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Liz. Under where would they be? The FY 2018 budget folder. Thank you. Oh, they're in the budget folder. Okay. It says DPW. Under right? It's in the FY18 um, budget folder. Yeah. Under um, right? It's actually, I got it. top I got one. It. I got it. <coughs> Thank you. Gotcha. Sorry. Great. Thank you. I'll set you a minute. You want a minute to take a look at that? I think part of the obstacle is the finance committee members don't have the benefit of the ability to zoom in on it, so I wouldn't right. spend too much time on it. I'll make sure that you all get a copy. Just a quick, quick question on that organizational chart. That foreman, the operations foreman position, that's the acting, it's an acting person right now? Correct. Are you going to address that at some point when we go through this? Um, not specifically. It's, there's still okay. some negotiations going on. The... Um, the other the other foreman positions are still acting also. Those those have not formally been filled either. And that is a union position, right? Correct. That's correct. Do you think based on a past that maybe that's something that's gonna be considered to be coming out of union? To be more a real managerial position? I'll defer uh, that question to the town administrator. I would say that uh, that there has been an ongoing discussion relative to the table of organization and uh, uh, the structure and, and the assignment of duties, and that there are a number of options on the table uh, for potential discussion. Thank you. Chair, one suggestion might go be if you can't put one on the union, maybe a different union than, than the people he's overseeing. Good story. Thank you. Um, this is just kind of a layout of the vacancies, how they Oh, we got to this point. Um, prior, prior to me, there were a couple of retired retirements early in 2016. Then it, additionally, we had the eight res, as, excuse me the eight resignations in March, um, and one uh, one personnel transferred. Since then, we have we've had three hired. Of those three that were hired in June, one of them left for another job, um, and we've since hired. Two in January and one in February, and that's where we're at with the vacancies. So we're we're moving forward 
the intent was to take our time and hire the right people, not just fill positions. So. Um, just some department updates on some of the things since I've rolled in the door. Um, I've been here since October, so we've only had a few months on the ground. Um, we have implemented a few things. Uh, we have daily, I have a daily DPW staff meeting with the DPW foreman or foreman down at the shop every morning. Um, in addition to that, we have a weekly staff meeting with the staff up at the town hall and um, and I have also have a weekly meeting with the town administrator to review where we are with, with issues. Um, in addition to some of the day-to-day the, the -day stuff, we're also working on clarifying numerous policy issues and, and how we address things moving forward. And that'll be, that'll be an ongoing process for quite some time, if not for my entire career. Um, we've also implemented quite a bit of additional training as, as we can get it in there. Um, We've had a, we had a large contingent of snow and ice training in the beginning of the season. We had every, every single person in DPW involved in that. We brought in a trainer Thanks. from outside sources, um, kind of went over a, how we operate um, in addition to some new technologies and, and some new processes. We've also um, had all our personnel attend trench safety training or all personnel that, that work in that area that would require them to be involved in trench safety and there's some other training coming up that we're going to continue to look at and that you know everything from safety training to techniques of, of how to do stuff properly one of the things we're also looking at is to leverage technology a lot more um, to make us more efficient and, and economical um, we are looking you know we're looking at utilizing our, the GIS system in the field you know we have currently deployed a couple tablets to both the water and the highway side and they've um, they've been utilizing those in the field in addition to we've established a electronic work request system prior to prior to me there was a, a paper ticket system which is quite antiquated doesn't doesn't give us a lot of ability to track stuff um, so we were looking at a in this this short window it's a do, kind of down and dirty way to get us into the electronic work order system. I don't think it's the end result, but it's, in my mind, it's kind of a pilot to get us in that mode of functioning properly and give us a better better use of the information that we, that we have. Um, that's currently being utilized by the foreman and the water crews for, um, for service requests. They, they can operate that off their smartphones or a tablet that's been issued to them through the town. Uh, there's a picture of it. Um, that's kind of what the dashboard looks like. Um, it, it's it's a very low end version of of a, of a program, but it, it gets us started in this direction. Uh, and I, I think as we look forward over the next year or two, we'll probably be back having discussions about you know a, a more robust system with, with better reporting. But but right now we're kind of in the pilot process of it. Um, it's it's been very very positive. Um, the information we get back and even the, the crews that are working it um, have been very, very positive with it. On some of the budget stuff, uh, these are the areas versus the de department's request versus the town administrator's um, budget where, where the discrepancies are. Uh, a couple minor, minor things, both on the in engineering intern was one, and the seasonal help was the other. Um, as you notice, the en engineering intern is, is split between engineering, between DPW budget and water budget. That's why it's shown in two places. It's, it's actually one, one person or one position. But the total amount is two times the 8100. 16 two, correct, correct. And that'll show up as we go through the budgets. Um, so this is the engineering budget. As we just mentioned, um, we had asked for the increase for the engineering intern position. Um, the intent is that position would be split between DPW and water on the, the tasks and duties that, that we could utilize that individual for. So 50% is funded under the DPW side and 50% was funded under the, the water side. Um, Mr. Jim, 
Yes, yeah. We're a little confused. Is it 81 total or is it 81 to each department? The so latter. It's DPW to Correct. water. It's the latter. So it's 16 to? Correct. Yeah. That's the question I asked a minute or two ago, Joe. Yeah. And for how many positions, Andrew? That's for one position. I think we had 16 weeks. I believe is what it was, somewhere in that area. Thousand dollars a week for an intern? It was. I may retire and take it. <laughs> Where are the interns coming from? The intern coming from? Uh, well, well, hold on. Let, let's rem let's remember. I'm not recommending them. He's he's asked for them. Right. I'm not in a position that I, I feel oh, I can okay. recommend them at this point in time. What, what but would not, the, what would that be for, though? What's the need for that? I don't understand. What? Why would you need an engineering intern? All right. So. Typically what we would use an engineering intern for would be something that we couldn't necessarily get done in-house, uh, and it's not necessarily something we want to hire a consultant for. Um, some of the things we've already identified, cataloging and scanning are the remainder, the remainder of the plans that we have in the office on both the water and the engineering side. Um, and we're in the process of building that electronic library. We can't really, you really need someone who knows something about looking at a plan. Um, to do that work. Not necessarily something we want to send out if we can avoid it. In addition to that, we can utilize them for quite a bit of the field investigation work that's going on. Um, a lot of the stuff falls, whether it's under the GIS or whether it's under stormwater, they can go out, they can inspect catch basins, um, outfalls. Um, we can capture information on our GPS system and then bring it back in and put it back into our GIS to up upgrade our mapping. Don't you have people doing that right now, though? We have a consultant that does some under storm water, but we don't have anyone in-house doing that. Do you have people in-house that are qualified to do that kind of work? There's people that could probably be qualified that, that, are, that would be capable of doing it, yes. But that would just take them from their other jobs. I mean, we have three water guys, and they don't have the ability to take a day and go, go do that type of work, or we can do that work. So they would, you know, we would have to farm that out to either a consultant or somebody. Bob? 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 Yes. Yeah. Come in. Um, is this on a, it's a, con it's a contract that you would have, but is it on an on-call basis? Or would it work, I think you mentioned something like 16 weeks? Did I hear that correctly? So this would be, this would be a co-op student, is what we, we would get an engineering student from Wentworth or Northeastern or one of those places. Um, and, and work. We've done it in numerous other locations. Um, we get a, quite a bit of work out of them because they have the, gotcha. a little more of a technology, technological and engineering background. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Move on. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so in, within the engineering budget, we also a added uh, an additional um, cost to training of $1,000, and that's to cover some additional training we'd like to like to see done. Kind of, you'll see it running through a couple other um, departments or, or areas within the department. We've, we've really kind of added to the training and the education piece within the department. Um, I'm a big proponent of getting people additional training. Um, there's, there's a lot going on nowadays, a lot of technologies, a lot of opportunities to do things differently and better. So I, you know, I would like to see us take more advantage of that. Um, you know, we have procurement uh, courses, that are, there are procurement courses that are out there that directly impact how we operate on a daily basis that we really need to, we really need to understand how we procure stuff according to Mass General Law. Um, so there are a lot of a lot of opportunities that, that haven't been apparently utilized in the past, and you'll see that in a couple other areas in the in the training budget side of things. Bob, Bob, yes. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry. just on that the procurement, and I, I mean, maybe it's more for the TA. Um, the procurement. A, a function I thought was put over to um, the TA. Am I? Is that going to shift back now, or and and if it is, wouldn't that 
be to the department director's responsibility to make sure that everything is in order there. I mean, there was, I, I'm not speaking out of school by saying there was a lengthy review of that and there mm -hmm. was major changes that needed to be made with respect to that clearly. So. I, I think the, the best way I can respond to that is yes, ultimately the issuance and the, and the approval of the contract comes to my office. Um, the, a lot of time we don't have a centralized procurement office uh, uh, from a standpoint of developing the specifications and issuing them on a department by department basis so it is done by department and we've gone through it uh, we did a, a training at a department head meeting probably a year ago maybe a little bit more um, to try to make sure that all of our department heads who don't maybe frequently purchase things of a lot of with a lot of cost were aware of that rather than have them find out at the very end of the procurement process when they're expecting in two weeks time to have something delivered they're just not going to because they're not able to comply um, I think in, the, in this instance again it's one component of the training that's out there um, there is there is an understanding of the procurement requirements by the DPW director based on his training and I believe you're a certified uh, purchasing uh, officer um, I think the understanding is some of the projects uh, such as road work are developed out of the engineering office and having the uh, staff in that office be uh, trained to the requirements that will expedite the development of the specification and maybe avoid some of the back and forth between that office and the, and the director. So I, I think that's the nature of the request. I mean, Andrew can speak further to it. But do, do we have a, a procurement? Is, do we have someone acting as our procurement officer for the town? That's my It's opinion. myself. And, you know, again, without the, necessarily the capacity to, uh, to, to write the specification on a project-by-project project basis um, or, or at times to, to give the department the attention that it might need to develop a specification in, a, in an expeditious fashion. Um, Andrew having the training, that's a big help, but the person ob ob often who's doing it is in the engineering office, and so that training being available to them will expedite that for us. Um, I think down the road. maybe specifically what we also address for these sort of emergency um, hirings or and, and uh, how they were going to conduct those are there some directives now in place or some procedure now in place for that there, there are procedures um, I think that over the past few years you know as different things have come up for renewal or as purchase orders have been presented to me I should say as requisitions are presented to me We've identified that there are areas where we need to uh, to make um, you know, to, to ensure compliance with the procurement laws, and we are doing that. Um, it's taken time, um, and, it, and it goes back further than a year in terms of the effort to do that. Um, but the department uh, has put a lot of that time into ensuring compliance with uh, the law, so that <coughs> on, on the early end of the procurement process, <laughs> rather than on the later end, which can lead to delays. I, I guess more I think maybe what I'm asking you is um, certainly as a result of what's occurred in that department over the past year or so you have um, there were corrective measures that needed to be taken especially in terms of who was awarded contracts even on an emergency basis right I mean I don't think I'm saying anything out of school here so <coughs> were there procedures put in place so that for example if you had an emergency water main break and you needed to go out to an outside so contractor annually you would have so this yes. list already to, to, to answer the question and thank you for the further clarification um, the, the Andrew uh, in his position as a director has, has uh, an ongoing oversight of the purchase orders as they're coming okay. through before they're getting yeah. referred to me and um, you know at, at times there are things that need to be tended to in a more timely fashion than perhaps I'm able to approve a, a, a requisition and that's something that he the finance director and I are going to look at in terms of expediting it but there there's, there's an ongoing involvement on a day-to-day -day basis by the director himself scrutinizing those things um, in in a way that perhaps maybe it wasn't in the, in the past so you do know of specific contractors that should not be considered and are eliminated from being responsible or responsive to, to serve and the town and you you are familiar with and aware of all that 
in terms of your... I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that. There's an ongoing... So, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say whether he's aware of it or not, but there's been an ongoing discussion with um, the police department with regard to anything that, that... any information that they feel we ought to have, and we have identified contractors uh, with whom we, we're not, no longer conducting business. And that, that practice actually, it goes back further than a year in terms of the approach with doing yeah. that, but it, it was obviously expanded. Yeah, I'm just, because you wanted to do this procurement training, I'm just wondering who would be... Well, let, yeah, would maybe, maybe let me just clarify maybe how we operate on a daily basis. Um, so the town engineer um, and both um, the building superintendent, uh, the utility superintendent, they manage contracts and contractors um, on a regular basis. So they, even though they may not necessarily be the oversight of the, on the procurement piece, um, they're still involved on a on a daily on a daily basis with contracts. That they need to understand what the thresholds are, what the requirements are, even if they're not the ones signing off on it, or 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 I'm the one finally reviewing it. They still need to understand what's what's allowed by Mass General Law. Um, the, the paving contracts, um, we have most projects are done under existing contracts already. Um, there are some, some there is some work that's done with quotes as, as it's based on under mass general law. But regardless, the individuals that are involved still get involved in writing those contracts and those specs when we go to rebid that stuff. So they still need to have that understanding on how these, how these projects get awarded and, and how we put it together. It doesn't take, just because they go to a procurement class doesn't mean all of a sudden they're in charge of procurement in the, in the department. That doesn't change that. It still comes through me and goes through the town administrator. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to have a definitive, not falling back into processes that were in place that were completely ineffective, but the buck stops here is what, you know, so this is the person with the oversight and the responsibility to say yes or no, even in an emergency circumstance. That's, yeah, I, I think we already have that, though. I, th I think we're, I think I'm, I mean, that hasn't changed, I don't believe. I mean, it still comes through my office to the town administrator. Any other questions, Catherine? <laughs> That's it for now. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, just on that topic, I want to recognize Mark, who during the uh, the interim period, we did have a, a, an acting director who was here assisting us, but uh, he was here on a part-time basis and uh, towards the end, uh, you know, as needed, uh, before Andrew came on board. But Mark was involved in some procurement as well over the uh, over the summer, and I just want to recognize that. And he's been doing that on an ongoing basis as well for the water department, at least, for a number of years. Um, so again, you know, th there is that kind of day-to-day -day understanding of it and familiarity, but we need to broaden that so that folks know that, that these are the requirements. So thank you, Mark. Continue. Um, so this DPW administration, uh, under the DPW administration budget, um, once again, we've added training and education to that. Um, that covers a variety of different things. Um, Bay State roads, uh, mess, Mass Inspector General's Office, uh, MAPO, those are all organizations and agencies that conduct and provide training that are, that are along the, the DPW side of um, education type stuff. That's kind of things we, we're looking at. Um, very consistent with the whole discussion we just had. Um, under DPW administration is telephones. That's actually a shift for the 5900 to put the phones underneath the public works where where it really belongs it ha apparently it hasn't been in the past it's been in, in a variety of different locations the intent here is to consolidate it under dpw the stuff that's that's public works and then we'll also look at it on the water side and they'll have a, a cell phone telephone line item that will cover the usage on that on that end also Okay, I think before we get into a discussion of questions on the telephone, Don, you had just, a question? Just, just a, a clarification question. Are these additions to the budget you're, you're looking for to the to last year's budget? I, I, I don't Correct. quite get the context of this. Correct. These are these are changes based from fiscal year 17 to fiscal year 18. 
They're in the, they're in his proposed budget. They're in the budget. But they're 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 additions to last year's budget. You want to do two thousand dollars worth of training and education, which we didn't do last year. Correct. And adding fifty nine hundred dollars to cell phone, which we didn't do last year. Well, I'm confused. The, the training, yes. The fifty nine hundred is coming from a different location, right? and maybe. Director, speak to that. I can speak to the 5900. So previously, you know, cell phones and any data plans were paid out of the DPW budget. However, they were, you know, spread all out in different line items, whether it was other charges and expenses, lease and rentals, dues and memberships. They paid them from multiple places. There was not one, you know, telephone line. So what we've done is we've taken what the actual cost is for annual cell service, whether it's for, you know, two tablets that they have or um, for the actual cell phone. Uh, we've also reduced the amount of cell phones that DPW has. Um, <clears throat> so it, the 5900 is in addition. Um, we didn't reduce the other areas because they were truly <coughs> not even ever budgeted for. So the line items that they were using to pay for the cell phone, were not what it was designated for. So what happens to those line items? Are we going to see that later, that those line items are reduced because no. they're not covering this cost anymore? No, those line well, items are for other purposes. But they weren't used for those purposes. Right, but we're trying to realign the budget to make it accurate that they will be used for the designated purposes. I, I find this very confusing. I, I think what uh, Don is saying is this looks more like a $5,900 increase to the budget. Well, again, I, what Liz says it is. It is. Yes. She's yeah. moved the, the, well, These are all the, increases to the budget. All the numbers, yeah. they're in there. They were being spent somewhere else. We're leaving that else budget alone mm -hmm. and, and adding $5,900 to telephone. So the else budget that was supporting telephone last year is, is going to support something else this year. I, I, it, it's a difficult presentation. So these slides do represent, just so we're all clear, these are all increases to the FY18 budget over FY17. For, for DPW. For DPW, correct. Which is why right. like Don has raised yeah, the question of if, in, this is, if there's really no increase in the phones why is the fifteen hundred dollars here? And I think what you, you said was the other budget by fifty nine hundred is a question. Because those budgets that it was being paid out of were not even budgeted for the cell phones. Right. They weren't being used for the particular purpose that they should have been budgeted for. Yeah. I understand, I understand that. that. But we, we seems we've got by with that budget for whatever it was intended for and not not spending. I think Well you have to keep in mind that the FY seventeen DPW budget was cut drastically okay. it was um, yeah. over FY 16 so yeah, you know now we're bringing it up to true spending trends well we, we cut it going into October town meeting right we cut it going into June town meeting June town meeting we had right. DPW's public hearing in April and it was reduced right. dramatically from FY 16 yeah. okay, that, if, I, if I may that would maybe explain it Maybe when we get and look at the detailed the budgets, budget, yeah. Liz can further point out. Jeff. Yes. Uh, just, uh, I, I seem to be along with Don on this in the confusion. But when you take this $5,900 uh, $5, out of those uh, line items, okay, and make a, a separate telephone line item for 5900 you are then opening up those items to use to be used for other things that they designed for. It, it might, is that the correct? We did not reduce the line items. This is right. a new line item in the DPW budget. Right. That's what the I'm saying. Right, so those line items still exist and they'll right. be used for the purpose that, that they, they originally were designed, were designed for. for. Okay. Correct. Okay. Also, the cell phone amounts, meaning the actual physical cell phones that the DPW has was reduced dramatically as well. Mm -hmm. So. This, if I went back to FY16 to see what DPW spent just on their cell service, this is probably a third of the cost. Then where is the other money coming from? From Came not from designated proper purposes. So there are still many more li yes. line, 
So why didn't you do it all at once then? Do what all at once? Why didn't you move all those other line items that you, you just referred to over to the telephone line item? Because those line items were reduced last year for FY17 and they are going to be used going forward for their proper designated purpose. Whether it's other charges and expenses, that's for, you know, employment physicals and other, you know, small items that the DPW budget needs to pay for. Uh, I'm sorry, just, just bear with me, okay? Mm -hmm. That $5,900 came off of line items. I understand that, okay? And you're keeping those line items, that $5,900 that you're taking out, those line items are getting another $5,900 that they deserve, that they've had, and you created a single line item for telephone. But you also just said that there were uh, additional, you said it was one-third. So two-thirds of this is also in some of the line items, all right? And why didn't you just bring it all over and create one line item and then leave those uh, line items as they were. The $5,900 represents actual cell phone costs for all of FY18. My point in mentioning that this is about a third of the actual cell phone costs in prior years, not for 17, because oh. we, we canceled a bunch of those lines, mm -hmm. but for 16 and 15, there you know, was a whole slew of cell phones that DPW had. Now that number has been reduced to about eight cell phones compared to what oh, okay, it was at. Okay, so okay. That's more clear to me. I, I misunderstood you as saying that there was another uh, uh, 20, 000, over $20,000, I mean over $10,000 more on other line items. That's the way I perceive what you said. Mm -hmm. So, But now you're saying it's only 5900 yes. that's being moved up. Okay. Proceed. Oh, sorry. If I dare. <laughs> so, my classroom, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we had an FY16 budget. We went to a budget hearing at, at, prior to the beginning of FY17 and made significant reductions to that budget or changes. We put money in the salary pool, if you remember. We made some adjustments to contra contracted services, and that became the FY2017 budget. Now you're looking at FY18 request, and Andrew, I believe, has called out on the slides the difference in the FY18 request from the FY17 request. So yes, there will be areas, and this will not be the only division where this comes up. Streetlights is one that comes to mind as well, where we were trying to make an adjustment to reflect an actual cost, and in the end the adjustment was too low, or we believe it was too low to sustain it in, into this current year. He's highlighting the changes over 17, but there were changes in 17 made over fiscal year 2016's budget. You know, and, and we could probably provide a reconciliation of what that is, but that's not in his presentation right now. This is just 18 over 17. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, just so Liz. So, so let's say that was three times the amount, right? And I understand why the, it was done, and we're definitely going to scrutinize this based on the history, unfortunately. You are new to this, but this scrutiny isn't new for this budget. It happened last year, I remember. What, what was that being paid out of if it wasn't a specifically designated line item? And I know what you mean, it was... So they were, they were, they were that, that was being paid using a line item that was for something else that, that's necessary, obviously, but which line item was it being paid out of? Whatever Just could. other expenses? Whatever you could. <laughs> I think when we get to the numbers, maybe it would be, you know, when you go look at the budget, we'll go, right now we're going through this PowerPoint presentation. No, but I, she's going to answer the question, Mr. Chairman. She's probably scrutinized this more than anybody, so. Can, do you know the answer to that? So I don't, I don't know the answer to what wasn't getting done yeah. for you know this right. expense to be paid, right. um, but you know it would come from a line item called other charges and expenses or a line item that was lease and rentals. Um, I can get the actual cost for FY, but just to, for comparison purposes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, run for FY16 to see what the actual cost was for. Uh, cell phone service in DPW. <coughs> 17 is not a good year. It was, you know, only a partial year, and we, we terminated services on quite a few lines. So um, just to give you 
you know, so you can see the difference. And then, you know, we could go back even further to see possibly what had been paid out of those line items. Um, you know, this is fixing it. Correct. Us right. We're trying to put no. put yeah. expenses in their proper homes, yeah. um, where they where they belong to be paid out of. Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. see it. Yeah, see you're pigeonholing this into this particular line item. Correct. Right. So you you're gonna know. Right. Let's try again. <laughs> um, drug, uh, drug and alcohol testing. Um, is an increase of fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, that cost is associated with the possible policy changes that would have, that would incur additional testing. So, um, until we until we know what that additional testing is, that's that's the uh, adjustment. Um, travel is kind of goes along with the, the training and education. It's broken out in, in the budget, so um, the increase to travel was was the on the basis of the increase to training and education. Mr. Chair? Yes. Yes. Yes, I have a little bit uh, a short question on drug and alcohol testing. Is this, I mean, uh, I know something happened last year. Is it mandatory testing for all employees or just? Uh, so. Is it, is it also enough? So, see, um, DPW employees that work at the, on the, the DPW, I guess the field crews, for lack of a better word, um, they're all required to be tested under the commercial driver's license federal regulation, and that's what it's based on. There's, depending on what pool of, of personnel we're considered under, um, currently we're rolled into a co cooperative that we don't get tested as often because we're under a cooperative of 2,000 people or so, um, that could <coughs> impact the, the number of tests we have. But it, they are required by, by having a CDL to have their be tested already. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I, I, I want it to be clear that, you know, we have been following the, the requirements under federal law with regard to testing. We are evaluating some improvements to that. And there are some implications uh, to that that uh, have that are collective bargaining in nature, and those are things that we are looking to address. But in, in anticipation of that, you see that there's been an adjustment that's been made. Jeff. Yeah. yeah uh, in regard to the uh, training and education, plus the travel, uh, I mean, I understand why you would have separate line items for those two, but in reality, the training and education is now $2,500, not $2,000. If you have it under travel, the $500, and your reasoning, okay, uh, given, that $500, because it's under travel, technically can be used for anything else other than training and education, having a, line, a separate line item. Is that, would that be correct? Uh, uh, technically, I, I, technically, that would be correct, yeah. Right, so, so then again, if it's designed to go for uh, edu uh, train uh, for training and edu uh, education. Why would you not just put it, put training and education for twenty five hundred dollars? So I guess again, this brings it back to the telephone line item, the newly added telephone line item. We're trying to put things in their proper buckets, homes, however you want to classify it. So the travel expense line item is for reimbursements for mileage. So if we ever wanted to run town-wide, what we spend on mileage reimbursement, I could run it by the travel line item. Um, so that's why things are getting broken out into their proper buckets. This is something that we've wanted to do for quite a few years, realigning the budget and putting things in their proper places. Just like fuel. Continue. Uh, ro the road and street budget, you'll see um, in under non-union wages an increase of $13,520. Um, that is on the seasonal help. That was the one of those items that the was not recommended under the TA's budget. Um, I don't know if we want to go further into that at this point. Um, I mean, I'm happy to just, Mr. Chairman, through you. 
there are, as you saw in the first or second slide that the direct, that DPW director put out there, there are some areas where he's made requests, which uh, you know I, at this point in time, looking at our budget forecast as we look towards reconciling the, the requests with the available funds over the next couple of months, that I, I did not foresee we were going to be able to, to fund. So therefore, I couldn't recommend them. The seasonal help uh, was was one of them. So I'm going to ask on the seasonal help request that you made. Was for what specifically? What isn't going to get done as a result of it? I guess is a better question. So historically, at least it appears there, the town has not utilized seasonal help a whole heck of a lot in the past. Um, so I guess I would say probably not much different than what you've probably seen in the past. Other than we are still short staffed compared to what the staffing has been in the past. Um, it's probably more like a lot of things that, that won't get done that probably haven't been getting done anyways. Um, you know, there's, there's the majority of the work they would do would be, you know, landscaping type stuff. Um, everything from trimming to mulching to picking up roadside trash. Um, that's usually what we utilize seasonal help for. Okay. Um, in the cemeteries, out on the roads, um, kind of where we go with that. Joe? I are these high school kids you're talking about? <coughs> Correct. Correct. Different from the parks and recreation seasonal staff. Correct. So similar taskings, but yes, yeah, very different. different. They they operate their own person seasonal personnel. I don't think we've had seasonal staff doing road street work for a long time, right? That's my understanding also, yes. Yeah. I know it's been in the budget or it's been requested before, but I don't think we've actually executed. We've only executed seasonal staff in the Parks and Rec. And just, Mr. Chairman, for, just for clarification purposes, um, so last year for the FY17 budget, we did have a line item for seasonal help, but that was due to staffing issues, and that seasonal help was a former retired um, employee, so that just, you know, we did have seasonal help budgeted for FY17. However, we didn't end up using those those funds as of yet, um, but they were not high school students. So, I, you know, just one. I believe, right? Yes. We all know the situation. Joe? <laughs> so, I don't know that's a, a, a bad idea to have to, to consider this. I mean, several places that I worked in the past, we've done it, and it does offer a lot of a lot of assistance and takes a lot of burden off of the department. Um, so I, I just, I'm just throwing it out there. So maybe you might want to consider it in the future. Um, I don't know if timing is is good right now, but I think it's definitely something that have, takes a lot of burden off the department, and, and a lot of things can get done as long as it's managed appropriately. So just put it in the back of your mind for now. And I understand that the town administrator isn't supporting it currently, but it doesn't mean that he wouldn't consider it. I hope he wouldn't consider it going forward. Well, I think, again, I'd love to, to be able to do it. I think it's more just so, uh, do I foresee that we'll be able to afford it next year? I understand. Bob, uh, a Bob, couple Bob, questions. Bob, Bob? Bob? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. So is that, was that, um, that 24000 it looks like if you, it's, it's for, 40 hours a week for 52 weeks, right? Was that just for one person? Was that factored in for one person? Or? So this is where it gets a little more confusing. So so the 13,520 is actually the difference of what was budgeted in last year's number for seasonal help, which I think is 11 and change. Um, so the 24,000 number is for four people for the majority of the summer. Um, I think we ran from May to to September or the end of August. So the intent was a four summer help. So for four full time and people for the for four temporary full time helpers. Thirty five hour a week personnel or forty hour a week okay. personnel. Michael at twelve dollars an hour. The okay. the breakdown is in on the DPW um, personnel cost uh, spreadsheet. It's also in the narrative too. Michael okay. I just want to say I, I am a fan of actually this idea a lot. I think it does a couple things. It does allow you to get some of those little things done that you don't typically have a staff member to go off and task. 
I think it should be shared with our buildings and grounds um, department head as well to have access to some of those people because there's probably little things that you can't get to every day that you may have a little list that you can do. And I just think it's a nice commitment to the community to have these jobs available to maybe some of our older high school kids or our college students that have come back for the summer and it does give them a little something to put on their resume. I love I think it's a win-win all around, but if it's just not affordable and this is the right time, that's fine, but I, I agree. Mr. Foley, let's not take it off the table for future discussion. So I think there's a lot of value in it. For 12 bucks an hour, you get a lot out. Thank you. <coughs> next. Um. So the next item is training and education. Uh, follows very similar discussions that, that we'd had. Um, this is more along the lines of the DPW crews. Um, the we've in the new hirings, we're we're finding we're hiring uh, more inexperienced, they, and I, I use that word loosely. I, they're just not as familiar with public works. They are experienced as as either truck drivers or equipment operators, but we we find you know we're we want to make sure that they're getting additional training. Um, there's not a great avenue out there in, in the other parts of the employment where they get the training that we would really want for a DPW. So we've seen it, an increase there to, to get them some of this additional training. And, it, and it's a similar stuff, trench safety, chainsaw safety, bucket truck operation, um, OSHA 10 course, um, competent person training. There's a variety of different, different trainings out there that, that we want to make sure these individuals get, and that's why you're seeing seeing that increase also. Um, <clears throat> under the miscellaneous capital item is $24,000. Um, that covers three automatic spreader controls for our spreaders, or sanders as people call them. Um, to, uh, that helps us, that improves our use of the material. Um, currently we, we spread salt for all snow and ice events. Um, there is a significant savings by going to what's referred to as closed loop systems or automatic controls. Um, it takes the manual control off of the driver. It operates based on his position and speed and a set rate to put down on the road. There's no guesswork. There's no manipulating the dials as they're driving down the road or, or anything like that. Currently the town has one one of those units installed in one of the trucks, one of the newer trucks. Um, we, we see a significant decrease in material usage between that truck and other trucks. Um, we've, we've gone, well, we've, we've, actually I can, I'll hit on it when we hit on snow and ice. We've done some things to improve that also, but we can go into more of that on snow and ice. Um, to retrofit three of the trucks, it, they run about eight grand a piece, um, and, and that would, Put us, that would put us with four of the six trucks on the road with, with these controls. The intent would be to, to get the other two trucks done in the, the following fiscal year. Jeff? Yes. Um, seems like a good idea. Uh, with the trucks that we have that you would retrofit, what are the age of, age of those trucks? And what would be the cost in moving an automatic uh, uh, control from one of our trucks into when we purchase a new truck. So currently the, the six sander trucks that we utilize um, are fairly new trucks. Um, actually there's a, there's a listing of the vehicles in the end of the presentation. Um, we can, I can point them out specifically. They are in fairly decent shape. There's not a whole lot of ability to probably buy a new truck and move those systems over. By the time we're done with those, they've probably seen their, their life expectancy. Which is? Uh, well, the life of the truck is, is really it. The, the salt and the calcium on, on, a, on, a, on a truck that does spreading is, is significant and it does a lot of damage. Um, the corrosion is, is significant. You'll get you know a good 12 years it, you know, you, you're doing good if you get 12 years out of a truck that, that you use on a regular basis for salt and, and spreading. Um, a lot of it's rehabbed. You know, we, we replace pumps on a regular basis on these things because of the calcium that, that wears on the corrosion piece of it. And maybe I'm misunderstanding, but you're talking about automatic 
the spreader controls yeah. versus the spreader. Mm -hmm. Are those two separate things or are they the same no. thing? Two separate things. So, the, so the, the control would not be movable from one truck to another? Um, it could be depending. So you could take the spreader out and move it to a new truck possibly. Um, there has to be some config. There's some config. I'm just talking about the control. Right, but, but it's all mounted on the spreader. Um, it's all part of the, the mechanics. So there's a, there's a computer head in the truck, and then there's a whole bunch of mechanics on the back end of the truck. You can take the computer head out. You can take the mechanics with the spreader off and, you, and reutilize that um, in another vehicle. There's a lot of, the, depending on the style of the vehicle and the, and the changes, there's some retrofitting required. Um, if the spreader is still in good usable condition, then the majority of that control would still be usable. Joe. So, thank you. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for this. Um, one of the biggest wastes when you're <coughs> writing snow is different, it's subjective as far as the person operating the vehicle at the time, how much, how much materials he feels he should put down. Um, I think what happens is management has to make a decision as how much they're gonna put down and then they can set the controls on this device to make sure that no more, uh, for safety reasons, no less of is being put down. I would suggest that you do all of them, that you ask for all of them, not just, because I, I can assure you the, the rate of return, uh, and I haven't done a quantity of, you know, I don't know how much is being used here and all that, but I would be shocked if it was, if it was more than five years per device. And you're going to get more than five years use out of it based on the, yeah, based on the, uh, the age of the vehicles. I mean, snow fighting equipment, you're going to keep 12 years, minimally. So I would, I would recommend that not only do we approve the 24, <coughs> but that we do, there's two more? There's two more. That we do the two more as well. Just so that's suggestion. kind of the road I was going down because I was going to ask the question of when you talked about this one vehicle that has it versus the other three that don't, how much in, uh, how much in, the salt or the supply that we're using extra cost-wise, you know, to me, it seems like this is a no-brainer. You buy this unit, and the money that you're saving from the material is going to offset a good chunk of this, but long-term, it'll have a return on investment very quickly. Right. So I would just do all of them and justify it that way. I would, I would concur. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, you don't ask for it off in the right place. Unfortunately, places. it put me over the twenty-five thousand for miscellaneous capital item, so that was really the well. Big that depends if you consider them individual individual units, then yeah. you're not. If yeah. you consider it as a whole, then you. That's right. Well, but there's some rules about that, Joe. Right? No, there isn't, because John pointed out we do that with computers. Yeah, I was going to say the same huh. thing. Huh. Our IT, we don't do it that way. That's all it is. Is a computer, really? Actually, um, listen. The decision makers are sitting in this room. You know, we we can do the smart things. I don't. You know, the sometimes is, the rules. We have, can't. The problem is we don't have the ability in this year to give to do it in CIP. Well, maybe. maybe. No, Fincom well, has the money. Uh, you want bathrooms? Well, you want yeah, bathrooms? I mean, you yeah. could release a couple thousand bucks. This may end up being a financial issue. So maybe. So I mean, it, 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 it it sounds like it's important to do. And there's a good payback on it. Okay. Knowing what I know right this moment about. About the capital requests uh, and, and the, the, the what's going on down in the field, I, I worry that we could even do this in capital this year. So, Oof. not okay. comforting. One's going to save us money; the other one's going to cost us money. We have further discussion on this issue at this point. Well, how about this? We have a few weeks. Let's do the research to see what it would cost you to get to fix this, add it to all the trucks. Let's not take it off the table. Let's let this thing evolve in the bathrooms and, you know, and if it falls off, it falls off. But I'd like to, you to at least go back and look at your numbers, doing it for all six. No, no guarantee you're gonna get it, but I, I think it's worthy of us going through the exercise. Sure. Okay, you do next. Um, not to belabor the discussion, but here's a picture of the the left side is our manual control system, and the right side is the current automatic control system that we have. Um, if there's further questions on that, we can we can explain it. But it's a nice budget. Next. 
Good, good segue. Um, so this is the Snow and Ice budget. Uh, currently, it's level funded at 175,000. Um, that number currently 318 is actually been adjusted. I think actually the next slide has this year uh, as of yesterday's number um, for uh, for spent on snow and ice, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, salt and calcium. Uh, we are in our last year of that contract. Currently, that contract is those those are the rates for our salt and calcium, fifty nine dollars, which is actually is pretty good right now. I, I would expect to see that go higher. We're on a last year of a three year contract. So so that number's been held for three years. Um, it's at least as far as I'm aware of it's probably one of the better rates that are that are out there, at least in the municipality side. I don't know about on the state side, but uh, calcium chloride. Oh yeah. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. On on the salt. So we had a three year contract, we're at the end of it. Uh, What's out there now? Uh, if 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 now we're at the end of it, are we talking July first uh, it contract? It expires or? the end of this this season. Yes. This season or, or fiscal year? Um, I believe it's fiscal year. Okay. So, what is if you had to negotiate it now? And I guess you're basically starting. I, I would assume. Um, what's what's the going rate now? We're on a well. We're on a cooperative bid with um, the town of Andover. So it'll go back out to bid, and we'll see what comes in on those bids. Other communities, I know, are paying closer to seventy dollars. <coughs> municipalities, anyway. So we should anticipate something like that. I would anticipate higher than fifty-nine ninety. Okay, thank you. That's a great rate. Joe, I can assure you the going rate right now, when you go out to bid, is going to be higher than seventy. It's going to be probably closer to seventy-two, seventy-four. That's not in our budget, is it? <laughs> and that's, again, going back to the previous discussion, why you might want to look at the closed loop system. Right. Um, calcium chloride, uh, that's the liquid pre-wet system that we use. Um, it's a dollar a gallon, dollar four a gallon. Um, it's much more economical to use more of that, which we've actually, which we actually do at this point, um, probably more so than in the past. Um, that also bid rebids along with the salts, so we, we would see that go get rebid also. Andrew, that requires a, a tank, obviously, and something. How many trucks do we have set up with the council? The, the six spreader trucks that we have have tanks on them. Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah. So all our spreaders have the pre-wet systems on them. The only the only caveat to that would be the school's uh, equipment does not have the pre-wet system. They're not technically our our equipment. Okay. Um, some of the improvements we have made this this season, um, beginning of season, we calibrated our spreaders. Even though we have manual controls, we were able to <coughs> calibrate it back to a. a an approximate rate of application. Um, we've seen it's very hard to compare year to year, and it's even harder to compare year to year when I'm not the one that's here to, uh, to be able to compare it. Um, so it's, it's hard to tell how things were utilized in the past. But just in discussion with the, the crews and the general foreman, we've, we've seen a significant reduction in the amount of salt they used to do one treat, treatment of the town uh, every time they go out almost a, a third of a decrease just in calibrating the equipment that we have. Um, we expect to see a more significant in decrease in, in, in that with, um, with the use of the closed loop systems. It also, we've also reduced the use of saw, uh, excuse me, sand. Um, in addition to not having to utilize sand and purchase sand and spread sand, we don't have to also clean it up, which is a significant cost in itself. Um, in addition to the environmental impact that it, that it has. So we, those are kind of a couple of improvements we've seen this year, and we'll continue to monitor that over the next few years, hopefully, and, um, and see how, how that, how that um, shakes out. Um, this is kind of the update on, on what we've done so far this year. Um, we've been out 28 times for, for different events through the season to either treat or plow the roads. 
on four instances, we've had contractors in town to, to plow. Um, we've had a total of 45 and a half measurable inches at this point. Um, we've utilized 1,700 tons of salt uh, and an approximate $102,000. The school department has utilized 82 tons of salt at approximately $4,900. Uh, that 4900 is part of the, the 102. Um, we've utilized 8,500 gallons or so of calcium chloride at a cost of about $8,900. The total snow and ice estimated cost at this point, and this is accurate as of Friday, um, or Thursday, excuse me, is uh, 354,140. Questions? Good. Next. Street lights. Um, currently, you see an adjustment or an increase based off fiscal year 17 of $5,000 in this year's budget, um, or in this upcoming fiscal year, excuse me, uh, of $5,000. Uh, Reading Municipal Light has indicated to us that there's their increase of, they'll, they'll be seeing an increase of 2.5% on their rate, um, which is what we've utilized to carry it. In addition to, you know, we're in the, the transition period of the LED changeover. They, uh, they are currently, they've currently changed out 977 lights as of January. Um, they, there's an estimated 1,800 lights, 1,816 lights in town, and they are expected to complete that work by June of 2018. So, so we are currently still operating both the LED lights mm -hmm. and the old style. I think, as a board, we agreed that we would turn on all the lights that could shut off years ago. Mm -hmm. Is the uh, total number of lights 1,816 include the lights that had been turned off? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Sorry. I, I might have missed something. That first, second line that says energy street lights. Is that negative 5,000? No, that, that's five, no, that's, that's, cash just, five. that's an increase of 5,000. That's so, the two and a half percent? I understand it's a two and a half percent increase, but you have half your lights have already been, have already been changed to LEDs, and you, correct me if I'm wrong, you're probably talking at a, a savings of a, when you change to an LED on, on energy, you're going 30 some odd percent. So, so part of the part of the issue is the budget was decreased last year, and right. this year we we'll, you know, we will not be able to cover. Well, I could be short this year. So, so this also addresses that short shortfall also. Mr. Chairman, through you. Yes. So l last year at the budget hearing, we reduced the dollar amount projecting out the completion of the project. The, pr the project is not complete. We're not materializing <coughs> after the savings yet in order to go to the full reduction. And we believe when you include the, the change in the rate, this is the number that we'll, we'll need to forecast for fiscal year 18. At, by the end of fiscal year 18, Andrew, I believe they're projecting they'll be done with the replacement project. Correct. And we'll be able to evaluate what the, the new cost, which will still be lower than it was before we had the lights converted to LED with all of the lights, with, with some of the lights shut off. But that we won't know that for another year or so. We're, we're trying to project it. And, and it's not just the savings we're projecting, it's the rate at which the lights will be fixed or, or changed that we're trying to project as well. But we've been assured it'll be completed by the end of the fiscal year, 18. Are we paying for the lights? No, we pay the rate. My understanding is that, the, that there was uh, some sort of funding that, whether it's built into the rate or not, I don't know. And, and we're not seeing a new rate for it, but RMLD has been doing the replacement. And we haven't been built to it, to my knowledge. It's built into the rate. It's built into the rate. That's what they told me. Yeah, why, are we, why are we taking the action to turn on all the lights again? I, mean, I, I just don't understand. So, so it's a good point only because it's probably a, a great time now to look at what you already have you have them and where you actually need lights and where right. you don't. So instead of putting up a light that you're going to turn on that may not be needed, it's, right. you know, you need the first time to do your, your evaluation. Good. Jeff. Yes. If I remember correctly, and this might answer your question, uh, Mike, uh, during our meeting, we, it was brought to our attention that 
the RMLD was only concentrating on lights that were operating. No, and that, no, no. And that, no? No. That's what I thought was They're part of the discussion. And I, I thought we decided to turn them on so that we would get the full benefit of the program. We, we That's did. what I recall. That we did. We decided to uh, turn back all the lights that were turned on. We continually get calls from people complaining about darkness. We've ignored a lot of them. I, I understand that. I understand, but so, I do recall uh, that I think what Joe is saying, why not do an evaluation of where we really need them and turn them back on? Yeah, I mean, it may, it may, it may be that you're still going to have 1,816 lights, but now you're going to have them in the right location. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that can be subjective as well. But if you bring some, you can bring someone in. You can bring a consultant for very short money that will go, you know, at night will 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 do the whole city. I'm town, sorry, and will tell you where your, your deficiencies are and where you're, you have too much lighting. And it's all based on, you know, it's a science. There's lumens and there's a device that goes out and measures the lumens. And especially with the LEDs now, the LEDs give yeah. off a, a wider range of, of, of light and a different color light. I mean, the color has a lot to do with it. You know, the, the, uh, the, the white light, the white light gives off a, a much better light. Um, so you may, there may be, as, as much as I, advocate for turning all the lights back on, you may be turning them on in an inappropriate place, that's all I'm saying. Well, yeah, you're gonna eat up your 30% because we're turning some back on, where we only end up with like 15 or 20%. All I'm saying is maybe we don't rush to turn them all back on. Let's yeah, I mean, maybe one plan is, again, I'm just throwing this out there, right? <laughs> the ones that are currently on, you replace all those, you right. turn those on, and then after that, you do an evaluation of the ones that are off and whether those ones need to be turned on in those locations or need to be transferred elsewhere, or are not used at all. Bob? Yes, Michael. We, <clears throat> the town was approached by RMLD when they were initiating this program in 2014. It started as a pilot here at this location, up at Hillview, I think, and there was a third location on Main Street, if I remember correctly. And uh, the response was pretty good. People were happy with the lighting. There wasn't a whole lot of spill. Uh, into the private properties, which was, for some folks, I think they were upset by that because they appreciated the light, but many people were, were satisfied with it. So they came back to us in the, maybe the winter of 2015, stating that they were intending to proceed with a full replacement and they needed an answer from the town with regard to whether or not we wanted to do the shut-off lights. And we took some time to consider whether we wanted to do that or not. And along the way, they were replacing the lights that were turned on lights that were reported damaged, they would replace with an LED to the extent that they could. So last year, after the budget was approved, uh, was reviewed at the April budget hearing and then approved at June town meeting, I had brought, I, I met with the public works department and the police department to discuss a strategy for turning the lights back on and the outcome was that we believed the most appropriate course of action was to have the lights that were shut off turned on and we brought that to the to the board, I think maybe in August or maybe it was in September prior to notifying our MLD and the board uh, concurred with the approach and so we, we have issued notice to them to continue with, with working and they've told us that they'll finish by the end of the fiscal year. If we, if we want to change course on that, um, you know, the, the work's happening, it's something we're going to need to do. But, but as of right now, we have notified them that we want them to, to turn on the lights because one of the feared outcomes and one of the outcomes they expressed to us was that lights that they didn't convert, they would most likely take down and we didn't want to lose those locations. So it came that the, the most efficient for now approach was to, to handle this way. I, we never looked at really bringing a consultant in to help with us, uh, but that's certainly something we could look to do. Yeah. And you know, I'm sure our MLD is all on staff. They may. Do that for you too. Again, it, it, uh, Michael, it's not about trying to reduce the number of lights. I think it's more about Where putting them into it, you know, the appropriate place. That's all the suggestion yeah. was. Uh, you know, there are there are some blind spots, you know, black spots, and there are some locations that may be overlit. That's all. That's all the suggestion was. I mean, oh, I understand. I'm sure there's a whole. You know, I'm sure the the work's all been done as to the number of nights there are and how much savings there are. So, yeah, I don't. You know, I'm not trying to reduce the number of lights. I just think that there are some locations that could could use it. There's, there's a lot of places where the lights have been removed that's fairly dark. Right. You can argue about whether you need a light there or not, but... Until you hit a deer. Until you hit a deer, right, exactly. Next. 
uh, <clears throat> tree care. So this budget is uh, currently level funded. Um, just an update on where we stand with some of this. Um, there is a grant under Maya that DPW currently has that is going to go out and evaluate hazard trees this, this spring um, and provide us with a, a listing of those hazard trees and locations and that's kind of what we'll be working off of moving forward. Um, there'll be more of a plan in place over the next year or two to, to capture and, and maybe GPS some of these locations and, and start identifying our, our trees in general, the town trees, and then uh, in addressing the hazard trees. And do I have a question? It's not, not totally related to town trees, but you know, I think the town administrator asked you to look at a yes a couple of a lot on Susan Drive. It's got trees hanging over the road. In fact, a piece of it broke off on the snowstorm onto the street. Uh, what's the common practice? We send a letter to the owner of the property, and if they don't respond, what recourse do we have? So if, if we go out and we identify it's a private tree on private property, but it could possibly impact the public right away, um, technically we have the authority to cut anything within the right of way. Um, if you draw a straight line up into the sky from the edge of the right of way, we, we, can, we can do whatever we want to at that location. So we would, we would mitigate it to that level if, if needed, and then if there's additional, if it appears that it, it could still be a hazard at that point, we would send a letter to the, to the resident, um, and this is what I've utilized in the past elsewhere. We'd send a letter to the resident explaining the situation and, and the, the tentative liability that, that could be there. Um, usually we've had fairly positive response from residents. I, I've never, I haven't been in any, any situation where we've had to go beyond that, so I'm not sure what our legal recourse would be. But that would be something we would we'd have to talk to town council on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes. If I may ask, so you, you send a letter of a, a notification to the property owner, uh, and that consists of what? I mean, who's respond? Who who removes the tree at that point? I'm not talking about the overhang. I understand that. But if you remove the overhang and there's a tree that's leaning towards the road, you have a concern about that. Right. So. That's on the, the property owner. Um, it'd be there. We're not. We're not doing. We're not providing services for private property owners. So they would be required to hire a, a contractor to deal with it. And if that tree were to fall over and block the road, then then what happens? Uh, well, the first thing we would have to do is remove it. <coughs> um, typically, we would remove anything that falls into the street, anyways. Um, and then we would have to have the discussion whether we seek recourse or um, or some other action <clears throat> against the property owner. I have ne I have not been involved in any situation where we've gone after any right. homeowners um, where there's been an issue. Most of the issues we see are not due to negligence or somebody refusing to do the work. It's just something that that had happened. <clears throat> so acts of God you take responsibility for. We'll clean up anything on the right of way that, that is a safety hazard. And then we have to address the private side with the residents. Thank you. Next, maintenance, machinery maintenance. Machinery maintenance. <clears throat> um, so this currently has a union wage increase that's contractual of 67.93. Um, under miscellaneous capital, there's a fuel system upgrade. Uh, you'll see there's a picture of it on the next slide. I'll show you in a minute. Um, but this is, and this I believe may have been brought forward at one point in the past. Um, this is to upgrade the current gas boy system that's 18 years old down at the DPW garage which services all the uh, town fuel needs. Um, the current system is not, the software is not supported or serviced. The hardware is is not supported or serviced either. The majority of this upgrade is really a software-based upgrade, though. Um, there is some hardware related to it, but the software that's down there is obsolete. It's not networkable. It's not, it has very little reporting capabilities. It's only one point of use down there. Um, there's only one computer it's on. Um, 
So we, what we're really looking to do is, is scrap that system. It does involve some hardware and some electrical work, but um, the majority of it is actually a, a software system. Andrew, do the gas tank, the tanks themselves get inspected? Yes. Do we have any issues there? Uh, currently, we do not. Uh, we've had some minor work done to them. There, there was some, so they get inspected. There's a couple. There's a couple different inspections that happen with the fuel systems. Um, the pumps get inspected. The, um, the measuring devices get also get inspected, and the the tanks themselves get inspected. Um, we have re we did replace one of the probes in the tank recently because of failed inspection. Not a significant um, event. Uh, we replaced it. They certified it, and we submitted our certification paperwork to the DEP with no issue. Does the um, DPW get involved with the fuel tanks at the Hillview? Negative. I'm not aware of anything we do with them. Maybe it's a question to check on just what's being done there to keep them in, uh, in code. I know I was on the commission when those get put in it's a triple line tank because it, you know, it's above yes. the ground. Yeah, there's, there's, there's some annual requirements and um, I've lost track of annual. who's responsible for that. So. Um, then in addition to under the miscellaneous capital is um, the, there's an electronic diagnostic tool which is essentially uh, very similar to most <coughs> mechanic shops um, used to read the codes in on engines, um, we have a variety of different equipment and trucks, so we have to find a, a piece of equipment that's actually a tool that's capable of reading as many manufacturers' codes as possible. Um, currently, right now, what we do is we send any piece of equipment that has a code. If we can't Google it on on the internet, we got to send it to the uh, the manufacturer or the, the dealership, which is not a great option. Um, it's not very cost effective. So this would allow us to at least diagnose, diagnose our own equipment in-house and at least figure out if it's something we can repair in-house without sending it out. Next. Uh, that's a current fuel system. Um, the left-hand side is what, what's there now. That would actually, that device on the top would actually be replaced with the device on the right. Um, that's the hardware portion. And then there's a, a software portion that would you know, we'd work. We'd have to work with IT, be installed locally on our one of our servers, and um, that would allow administrators, myself, management, whoever, to to access the system and manage the fuel system, and pull the reports and, and have oversight on that. <coughs> Moving right along. Moving right along. Uh, cemetery and grounds. Um, there's an adjustment. On, on the union wages, uh, $28,572. <coughs> it's a contractual. How many employees sit in Paul? Uh, Parkson Cemetery is currently actually two, two employees. So this is increases for two employees? No. And this is? No. This is what you're carrying. That's the adult. Correct. Yeah, there's, that actually, there's a there's one position on the DPW that's split between highway and cemetery, or excuse me, road and street cemetery. Um, that's where the, the difference in that position would be. For some reason, in the past, that was broken out. It's one of those things that maybe we need to look at in the future. But Liz, 
just for a little clarification, so um, the DPW director requested this, the vacant position, which he talked about on his very first slide. The position is split between cemetery and grounds and uh, road and street. The town administrator's recommendation carries that position in the salary pool. So this is a difference in, in the two budgets. Also, last year, this position was carried in the salary pool as it is still a vacant position as it was in and is currently in FY17. So that's what this is. It's not a new position or anything like that. It's just that the position was carried in the salary pool for FY17. The DPW director is requesting it for FY18 to be put back into his budget. The town administrator at this time is leaving this position in the salary pool. So for clarification, that's what, what it is. It's not, it's not a new position. It's not an increase in the salary. It's just um, the DPW director is putting it back in his budget, which drives an increase over FY17. Uh, and the town administrator is, in his request, carrying it in the salary pool as it is currently today. It's a split position. It's split between road and street yeah, okay. and cemetery. Okay, the next item was repairs and maintenance. Well, just quickly on the oh. grounds. Just quickly on the grounds. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, we can afford to do it this year, but you know, you look at the center of town where the third meeting house is and that hill and that grass, it needs some attention. It's getting worse every year. We need some material on that, or some kind of a process we got to follow, or something to get that grass. It's getting it's just getting worse. Have you seen you've seen it? I assume, right? Summer. I started in October. Um, Pretty bad. I mean, clearly, it's something we can look at this spring and see what. I don't know. It's got to be on. captured in this year's budget, or next year's budget, or somewhere. But we can't let that deteriorate anymore. That's us. That's really our centerpiece for the town. And I just highlighted new DPW director. You just kind of keep it in mind. Your guys down there. Sometimes they're down there cutting. I don't know what they're cutting. There's nothing to cut. It's right. down to dirt. So you can keep that in mind. And if there's some fine. If maybe it's very little money you need. You can investigate it. Sure. Even if it's a few thousand bucks, that can make that place look a lot nicer. Than That's grass. a water issue, though. If you wait till 19, you can have as much water as you want. Yeah. <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> you got to do something because it's deteriorating. We, it's deteriorating. We shouldn't let it go away. It's just like to me, like any building we have, we, we should pay attention to it and make sure. If it's a water issue, then we'll figure it out. Mark can probably score some free water out of Andover. And <laughs> rest. Turn the meter off for a couple days. Well, we, we can definitely take a look at it. Um, this is the time of year to start looking at some of that yep. stuff. So I'm told there's no more snow coming. So. Yeah, right. That's what um, Joe said. I hold him accountable. Week. Uh, Eleven okay. eight then is uh, just a restoration from the 2015 budget. Same amount of money. Correct. Yeah. This, for some reason, and I think this goes back to the the, the changing of the budgets over the last year. Um, it was pulled out of the last year's budget, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is put back. Um, to me, I don't know how you can do any cemetery and grounds maintenance without money to do cemetery and grounds maintenance. <coughs> so that was my request. Um, in addition to that, there's a miscellaneous capital item on there, uh, $15,000 to replace one of three functioning mowers. Um, there's a 2001, which is the oldest mower that DPW is currently using. Um, this would re replace that one. And then th there was two other mowers, so we have a total of three functioning mowers. So, if you're coming on board, this goes back probably to 14 and 15. Uh, DPW director had talked about uh, continuing the uh, necessary improvements to expand the cemetery. And I see no funds in here to continue that. I don't know where, this, where that stands now. Maybe you could answer that question. So it would be a capital request. Uh, because of the, the magnitude and the type of the work that would be done, although I don't believe we have such a request for FY18's consideration. Correct. Um, you know, there may be one that comes up for fiscal year 2019. So then I would ask the question is, how many empty graves do we have in reserve at this point, and are we getting close to the point where we 
so, can't kick the can down any further than we have. So um, to kind of hit on the first part of your, your question, um, I'm, I'm aware there was some push a while back to do a expansion of the cemetery. Um, walking in the door, I clearly was not ready to, to, to proceed, uh, you know, go out, go look at that until I had more information. Um, what I did look at was I looked at what we do right now, um, what we have done for burials over the last uh, fiscal year, and then what's left for, for burials. Um, currently, we have 18 double graves and, and two single graves available just in the section that we're working, and there's still additional sections available. The initial thought was we're okay for this year, through to next year, and we can, we can evaluate the, the status of the expansion project and see what it's going to entail. Um, I do have some, I do have information in my office from the previous evaluation of it. It's just we haven't got to, got to the point of looking at it. Um, there is some details under the, uh, in the narrative sheet of the budget that gives you some of the information on, on the um, interments and, and burials that we had, have done this year. So. Um, I think at least at this point we're we're okay through this year, um, and then as um, the town administrator had indicated, we'll, we'll look at fiscal year 19 possibly if if that's something that we need to look at. Well, that's you know that's more than a year. It's and it's much more than a year if we have to spend money to you know basically they dig. Out, my understanding is they dig out everything in the next. Seg section and you know then fill it so that the materials on the ground are suitable for digging a grave the and burials, correct. closing it up and, and I guess it seemed like in, a couple of years ago we were okay now you're saying there's only 18 usable yeah, in the current section we're in, there's, there's 18 double graves left. Um, Are you still telling me there's another section that's complete that we can use? There's, there's another section that hasn't been touched yet, correct. That's oh, still okay. All right. okay. Correct. That's different. Um, that's currently the, the mower that we're looking at replacing. Um, the left in the bottom picture is the current mower. The right top is essentially what a replacement mower is. Same, we most likely be looking at the same type of mower. You like these mowers? Um, they have their purposes. It, one of the things we need to look at is um, you know, the cemetery. A lot of um, a lot of municipalities have gone to the stand-up mowers because of the, the tightness around some of the headstones and some of the other areas. So we we'd look at it, um, evaluate what's what's probably the best option and have a couple vendors come in and we take their stuff for a ride and see how it works. That's kind of how we do it. Uh, town buildings. Town buildings. Uh, so you'll see an, 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 excuse me, an increase under energy electricity of 29.90. Um, that's based on the 2.5% increase that Reading Municipal Light has given us. Um, repairs and maintenance is an increase of 10,005, and that's based on the anticipated increase in our services and materials that we, we bid out. Um, those contracts that are listed there, carpentry, masonry, electrical, HVAC, and plumbing, those are all due to expire uh, the end of this calendar year. Um, I would expect to see them uh, have some level of an increase in those, those rates that we have. Well, the intent would be to rebid, rebid those contracts. Um, that's how we do most of the maintenance work around town. Well, I think Michael. Joe had his hand up first. Oh, yeah. So you know, every year I, I talk about this building, and you know, we still have to be here for a long time. So. You know, we talked about the ten thousand dollars. I think is that the same ten thousand dollars? Is a different ten thousand dollars? We set aside to do change carpets. This is different. And where is that money? You're talking about. Just so I'm clear, are you talking about the money that we appropriate typically at October town meeting, the fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars? So there's um, 
you know, several projects that Julie is managing with that 50,000. There's designated purposes for it um, that were approved at October town meeting. We did an additional uh, $50,000 for town buildings at June of 2016 town meeting as well. So those projects are ongoing. Um, and I, I would let Julie speak, speak to that. But um, this is for routine, um, you know, plumbing services, electric, electrical services, and cleaning as well. On the sake of time, we don't have to go over it today, but I would like, once the dust settles and all our budgets and stuff, to have Julie come in in a future meeting to give us an update on all that. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. It may make sense to do that on April 3rd when the capital um, budget is presented as well. Yeah, um, so you can get a status update on the open projects Perfect. and where the other capital stands yeah. and then the new capital. Thank you. Okay. Right. Sure. Yes. Tom Jim. Williams here. Um, is there, do you know if there's any audits been done on um, on light fixtures throughout the town buildings to see if there's potential savings on that would be in offices or in town buildings? Yeah. I'll let uh, Julie speak to that. She's aware of that project. Yes, in 2011 there was an audit done on all the buildings. Um, they did replace um, a lot of the light, all the lights in this building for TAs, but no, they didn't do LEDs at that time. So I met with um, the energy manager over at RM RMLD about a month ago, um, and I am planning on participating in upgrading a lot of the lights, starting with the exterior lighting with LEDs. Thank you. Stormwater. Uh, stormwater is currently um, under wages, union wages, a, a contractual increase. Um, a portion of the majority of, per, no, not the majority, a portion of personnel are paid under stormwater in addition to being paid out of um, DPW. So you'll see a, that's kind of where you see the contractual increase, as is the the clerical for position also. So the the budget at number twenty nine thousand six fourteen is more than one employee. Correct. How many? The breakdown um, would be in the DPW combined payroll sheet, which is part of the okay. budget book, <laughs> yeah. um, and it breaks it down. So it okay. looks like it's. Uh, if it's in the sheet, I can find it. I. I it looks like about thirteen, maybe. Part of Andrew's uh, salary, okay. so the, it's a, the engineer. It's, it's the mix of personnel. Yes, yep, and the breakdown is there mm -hmm. and it's listed under stormwater share. Yep. So one of the things that has come up, Andrew, uh, in thinking about stormwater and the fact that uh, the uh, requirements get more and more stringent as the years go on, and some communities have gone on and passed a, uh, uh, a fee usually with the water bill, uh, not the, not part of the water bill, but with the water bill right. for stormwater. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm looking at actually our total cost when you deal with consulting, engineering, and whatever else gets applied to dealing with what we have to deal with annually now, plus what we have to be prepared for going forward. And I also know that the town is joined with some other communities in uh, a lawsuit against the EPA for not the current uh, license, but something that's coming down or they're about ready to impose on us. Well, they already have imposed on us. I'm not sure exactly why. But are we at a point where we, the board should be thinking about this from the point of view of creating a fee? Um, well, there I am familiar with some communities, and, and um, Reading is obviously one of them. Um, as a local community that has a stormwater utility fee, um, it, it's an option to to look at to address the cost associated with the upcoming permits um, and, and future future permits. I don't know if we're at that point at, at this stage of the game, or if it's it's clearly a discussion that needs to happen um, on on how some of this stuff is being funded. The, the new permit, which goes
goes into effect um, in July is has numerous requirements that if you followed all of them, it would be cost prohibitive. Um, it's not it's not financially feasible for most communities to even to, to follow them. But we are making progress on doing some of the stuff that is in there, and a lot of that stuff is benefits us in other ways also. So it's not. Even though it's stormwater related, it, we are we are seeing a benefit out of it also. Um, but it, it is definitely a, a area that's going to need to be looked at. Obviously, you know it's you know in the, the boards the board and the town administrator needs to consider how we how we want to approach that. I guess my question is, as I look at this slide, is this the total cost? No, this would be a portion that would be into consideration. There's other costs that that are done to. The regulator operating budget and other capital projects that we we see that are based on stormwater. Can we, can we get a total accounting of what we'll be spending in, in this 2018 budget for stormwater? Can we pull that all together? Yeah, I, I think that we we can. I mean, I think you're looking at. I mean, I think what you're not seeing here is the debt service on the capital projects. I think every, everything else from a cost standpoint should be represented. I mean, there may be a thing here or there that is, you know, in, in directly or indirectly related elsewhere in the budget, but the idea when we came up with this division, which again I understand was under the, under the previous director, was that for the most part, when you looked at the aggregate of the DPW's operations, there was a share of it that was attributed to stormwater, and this represented that share. Okay. Beyond that, again, we've done capital projects. We did one. I don't know if we did one. In, did we end up doing one in, in, in 17, or did we? We did. That's right. For future. A previous one as well. So Before that, right. right. So there are projects for which we're paying debt service that we, you know, or, or we will be paying debt service that we could add to that number. I think you're looking at the cost. Okay. Again, it's not $29,000. Just to be clear, it's the total of the. Uh, of the department's request, which is $292,706. That we can attribute to? Stormwater. $292,706. That's the total stormwater request operating. for operating expenses, plus the debt service for the projects that we've completed or are, are ongoing. For the benefit of uh, those who may be watching or who may be watching it in, on YouTube in the future, how, how does union wages fit into the stormwater? What, what, is, what kind of work is done relating to stormwater? Because it, it, to, I think to many people they, it's hard to vi visualize. Uh, you know, it's just stormwater and the range and falls to the side and, you know, what work do they do? I mean, okay, so, um, uh, so how do union wages actually play a part in stormwater, the stormwater budget? So, so on our end, the, the guys <coughs> on the, the ground um, are really a, a big piece of the whole stormwater puzzle, so to speak. Um, everything from reconstructing catch basins to repairing them to cleaning them. Um, we do a lot of outfall work, impro outfall improvements, um, any cleaning of the, those areas. Even even when we get involved in street sweeping, um, that's part of stormwater. Okay. Um, there's mapping, there's a whole mapping portion of it, which that involves both the DPW guys and some of the office staff, even myself in some cases. Um, there's all all those duties. Drainage repair. Drainage repair. Okay. Uh, pipe. You know when we do paving work and we replace corroded um, metal pipe with you know upgraded you know plastic pipe. That's all part of the stormwater system. Great. Thank you. Next. Uh, sanitation. Sanitation sees a decrease in union wages. Um, there's currently one staff member that's involved in sanitation. He inspects the trucks um, on uh, Tuesday mornings as they roll in the roll into town to make sure we're not getting charged for waste that's already inside the trucks. 
Um, that individual is at a lower rate than previous personnel doing the job, so that's why you see the decrease. Um, solid waste collection has, sees an increase of 16, 610. That's based on the contractual agreement um, for fiscal year 18. As you can see below, we are, our current collection contract is with JRM, which does expire in June of 2018, as does the disposal contract, which is with Covanta, that expires at the same time. So we are in our last year, we will be in our last year for that contract, and that's the, the rate increase on that contract. Uh, there is no rate increase for the last year of the disposal contract. Um, Household hazardous waste, we increased that by $3,000 due to last year's attendance at the um, Household Hazardous Waste Day. There was a significant increase in, in attendance and waste collected. So we've, we've increased that $3,000. We'll be looking at that event this year and seeing what we can do to, to maybe pull that cost back down while keeping the attendance high. Obviously, we want. We want the attendance. We would prefer the, the waste turned in than put on the side of the road. Joe, on the bottom. Yeah. Joe. Yes, Joe. Quick question on household hazardous waste. What, what did you spend last year? Um, I'd have to look at that. I, I, I don't have that. It's right here in the budget, actually. It's like three, it's like 3,000 change. Did you spend 3,000 change? 300,000 change. Sorry. sorry. 300,000 and change. I don't have No, household hazardous waste. Just oh, so, oh, I'm sorry. Day? Sorry? The special collection day? Correct. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I can. I still, as I'm asking, is, you know, I'm curious as to the $3,000, how it affects it percentage-wise, you know, is it an anomaly that a lot of people move, you know, a lot of homes get sold and people are just cleaning, cleaning out? Um, yeah. You know, we, when I was in Chelsea, we peaked, and then the next four years, we actually had a decrease every year because people got rid of everything they had to get. So we did, we did have that kind of, it went up, it went up, we peaked, and then it started to come down again, then leveled off. You don't have to raise your hand for me. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. If I may speak to that. So this increase um, is a real increase. Previously, these uh, special collection and hazardous waste days were handled completely differently. And with what happened within DPW last March, um, they were run differently. Um, previously, vendors would collect the funds and they, they would then dispose of the items and the town was not paying for those disposals. So now the town is doing it the proper way and paying for those disposals and collecting the, the money for whatever item is being charged for. So wait, previously the, the property owner was bringing it? And, uh, and there was vendors yeah. that would collect the items and from the property owners. And the property owner would pay? Yes. So the budget was 18 last year. You actually spent 10. That's what was budgeted 18. You actually spent 10 in 2016. Oh, so now it's going from 18 budgeted to 21 budgeted. But we only spent 10. Are you, are you speaking of just overtime or? Hazardous waste. If you're looking for spent 2016, Actual Mike, it's only for half a year. No. FY 2016, actual expended was 10. You budgeted 18. And then FY 17, you budgeted 18. And now you're uh, budgeting 21. That answers your question, right? But it just confuses me more, but yes. Do we see the income that we received for the uh, running the hazardous waste? Yes. We don't get if, if there are items that are charged for. If there are items. Right. right. Correct. There's a list of items that some aren't charged for and some are. Well, I'm just saying when we were preparing the cost, and we mentioned that other years the volunteers collected for their groups. Now we run all, we pay for the hazardous waste to be disposed of, mm -hmm. but we also are receiving some income. Has that been subtracted from what the net amount here? No. Do we know what, how much money it has reduced? I, I can get that in. By? I can get that information. Um, I don't have that offhand right now, but um, no, really. we can look it up. 
It, there's also other things that are paid from um, this line item as well. It also has to do with um, all the needle disposals that we have, whether it's at the police station or the fire station. There's a monthly cost for those, um, and that comes out of this line item. And it, they average about $72 a month for those disposals. So, you know. Questions answered? No, okay. it makes sense. I have, uh, with respect to the collections and disposal contracts, even though uh, they're not going to impact this coming fiscal year, they will be next year. Any idea of where things are going in that direction? Um, unfortunately, up. Um, there's some discussion with um, a couple, a couple other groups to get involved in a in a <coughs> consortium discussion about possible uh, new contracts, both on the collection and disposal side. So we'll, we're going to kind of see what what that dis where that discussion goes as far as what some of the options are. There's also um, the option of looking at how we collect and what we collect, and, and possibly seeing what whether there's some changes there that could be could be made to improve some of those costs. Okay. Jeff? Okay. Yeah, please Joe. sorry for trying but no, it's um, fine, Joe. You know, Liz at a time of shake. Can you tell me the last time we put it out for an RFP for the trash and collection and disposal? So when I was provided the contract when I arrived here in 2014, uh, I want to say it had just recently been put up, maybe within a year or two prior to that. Uh, and I can tell you that there was a spreadsheet that articulated proposals from, from multiple vendors. And it was JRM, JRM had been selected. You know, the way that that was conveyed to the market, I'm not exactly sure, but I, I do recall seeing that there was a comparison between multiple proposals for the town. And I'm not advocating that, I'm not implying that JRM is not the company we should be using. I think they, I think they do a, a decent job. Um, the issue I have is sometimes, you know, municipalities get complacent, are comfortable with the vendor. And because this is one of those ones where you don't have to put out, you just, you know, they'll just negotiate a new contract with them uh, every couple of years. Um, I, I, if it's, if it's been more than, if, this contract was just renegotiated three years ago and not put out. I would suggest that we look at an RFP. There are a lot of there are a lot of advantages to, to talking to, as you know, talking to several vendors as opposed to one. Um, especially in a community like North Reading, where it's not a very difficult place to pick up. It's you know compared to a, an urban environment, so. <laughs> I just don't think that we should, and again, nothing against Sharon, but I just don't think that we should just enter into a contract based on negotiations without putting it out there to see what else is available. Thanks. Andrew, I think what's most telling here is the, the next slide, and I'm just wondering, uh, uh, and I know we have a uh, solid waste committee who whose chair has done a phenomenal job along with the committee and saving the town money, but it looks like we're leveling off again. And I don't know, we, we did, there was a, uh, we, we went to the two barrel limit and uh, that seemed to have an impact, maybe force some more people to do some uh, recycling, but the recycling, if you look at the, the tonnage, hasn't changed very much. It's been up and down, but since 2009, you know, it's, it kind of peaked and then it's slowly dropped off and then it went up a little bit again. Uh, I think you got to look at the growth of the town, though. What? I think you have to in incorporate the growth of the town, increase you know, new houses, new developments that are getting pickups. I, I think there has to be, yeah, when you look at these numbers because they're not that far off. Yeah, that could be true. Uh, I've just noticed that... Uh, you know, I have a neighbor across the street that, you know, I don't know where they generate the kinds of material they generate. I mean, they do recycle, clearly. <laughs> but they fill up, when they fill up barrels, they, you know, they, they proceed with the two, 
barrel limit, but they're heat way over the top. And I'm just wondering if uh, you know, JRM's gotten a little, you know, they're just ignoring uh, those people that are exceeding the limits. Um, well, there's clearly, there's a lot of room within the solid waste area and the recycling side to, um, to look at. Um, we have, it's probably the single most um, involved issue we have in the office as far as calls and, and working with a contractor, um, both calls from them and calls from residents. Um, you know, in going to uh, Mr. Fody's point exactly, I, I think it's, it's an area we really need to look at where we go. You know, there's a good opportunity with a new contract um, to see what we can do to improve that recycling piece. That data is not compared to the growth of the town, as, as was mentioned, but it would be interesting to see how it does shake out compared to the growth. But that's probably where we can make the most financial um, decrease in the cost is, is improving that recycling. Well, I mean, I mean, the program has been effective because we haven't had to raise the rates in a long, long time, and we've been carrying a little bit of reserve that may be slowly going down. But it's it's allowed the board to you know, review it annually, you know, and say, hey, we we finished the year with a surplus, and we we don't have to deal with the with the rates. But if you're talking about you know, renewing not only the pickup but the disposal side of it uh, right. for 2018, even though it's another fiscal year away. It, could have some impact on us if we don't take some some action. Correct. There, there, there's also the current um, decrease or the, the the financial benefit to JRM and the other collection companies for the recycling has gone away. So we'll, we're sure to see a difference in that contract when we start talking with them re with recycling because they're not making the money that they used to make on recycling and, and that's impacted a lot of a lot of the other communities mm -hmm. also. But, but I think Jeff has a question. Well, yes. just to go back, just with, to continue on with what Leander just said, not only are they not recognizing the benefits of recycling, it's actually going up. Uh, I think right now, you know, at one point it was just, they were getting about anywhere from 25 to $50 a ton back for recycling. The, the need for recycling, especially in China, has gone down so much that we're actually going to be looking at probably in the next year and a half, recycling could be costing us $25 a ton. Mm -hmm. So that's where you're going to get the hit. So while while we appreciate is you know what, what the 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 environmental benefits of recycling, right? The financial benefits are clearly not going to be there anymore. And I don't know that it'll, it'll ever come back. Okay. Yes, sir. Quick question. Um, at Edgewater, uh, do we have large groups of uh, apartments that are not included in our rubbish pickup, such, such as Edgewater? No. Pick none, none of the apartment complexes are included in the town's trash or recycling programs. Right. So we, we Nor is in the agreement potentially for the additional homes at uh, the Berry. Right. Yeah. They're I, I believe I read the agreement to it's take care of their own. To have a separate private. That's, that's what I was wondering. Substanding. And then one other quick question. Um, the, oh, never mind. Lost my thought. Jeffrey. Yeah, uh, I want to go back to something that uh, Mr. Fody was saying with regard to trash recycling. Uh, they were getting $25 a ton. Now it may swing to a $25 a ton cost. To the town is that that right? Potentially. So so with that trend, uh, I think is that a prime reason why you suggest that we put out an RFP to start, try to get something advantageous, more advantageous at this time? I don't know. If that's the prime reason. It's one of them. I, I just again, this has nothing to do with any specific contract or anything like that. I just think that you know when you go shopping for a car, you don't buy the first one you you, you see, right. right? So same thing. I mean, I think it's 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 and you know, typically, what, right? What I would do is, uh, you know, I would do a three-year contract, and then maybe renegotiate another three-year. But anything longer than 
than that. I think you need to go out and put feelers out because there are new companies out there. There are there are uh, companies who have lost um, other municipalities that are looking. You know, they have trucks available now and they're just sitting there. Um, as far as labor, I mean, I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, where any place I've seen it, if you leave one company and go to another, I can assure you most of the employees are. are are being hired by that previous company. So yeah. service isn't going to change a whole lot. Right. Um, it's just about it's just about what the uh, what the uh, cost. Uh, yeah, I mean what's what's available out there. I mean right. companies lose you know communities all the time. And again, I'm not I, I'm not In, pro anybody right. or anti anybody. <coughs> Thank you, Jim. Fuel and vehicle, yep. Bob. Bob, I'm oh. sorry. Sorry. One, one quick follow-up. Do we get a comparison, of, or do we know what the other towns like Reading and Linfield or Peabody uh, paid for their uh, pickup from JRM? Uh, we we can get that information. So, yeah. Okay. Because I know JRM seems to do all the towns in this area, so Correct. it's only in their business to be able to do the same area. Fuel and vehicle pooling. <laughs> so currently, this is a fuel budget. Um, there is there's a suggested decrease of $25,496. Um, as you'll see on the next slide, is you'll see some of the, the charts indicating the rate um, and the and decrease in where that came from. The current debt right there is the current rate that we're paying right now. A uh, dollar ninety a gallon, and two dollars and five cents a gallon for diesel. And we that contract uh, goes all the way out to June 30th, 2018. Excuse me. Is that correct? It goes out to 2018. <coughs> that contract does, yes. Yeah. That's so a consortium contract, also. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear, Bob. It goes out to when? June the contract 30th, 2019. 2019. Yeah. Oh, I see. You don't have that. Right. I don't have that. Yeah. Um. <coughs> Currently, that's, and that's our annual usage over the, over the last 10 years. Um, average gas usage at 38,500 and average diesel at 23,000. Yeah. Jeff. Yeah, um, the, the contract that we had, how long was it from when to when? It, July 1 of last year to June 30th of 2019. Oh, 2019, okay. It's a three-year so, agreement. I guess that last year, the rates really went down, right? So that's our 10-year cost per gallon. Yeah, I'm just worried about the last contract. Uh, and knowing that it goes to 2019, uh, I'm not professing to know which direction the rates are going, uh, but is there an advantage to re-looking at those rates now because they may go much higher later on? So, so that contract's based on the daily average. It's a percentage over the daily average of the cost of a oh, gallon of. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, correct on a barrel of oil. So it's based on the fluctuation of the, in the market. Okay. Um, that's what you see here is our the diesel in the pink and the gasoline in the in the green. As you can see, there's been some decrease over the last few years. Um, and then the next. Next couple charts. There's also a projection in the next couple charts. Yeah, also, see that, yeah. um, this is the usage by department. A lot of a significant amount of the usage, at least on the DPW side, is seen during a snow snow season, particularly on the diesel end. So you'll see a tend to see a decrease if we have a, a light winter. Um, it's fairly consistent over the last couple of years, though. That's gas usage by, by department, DPW, police, fire, school, and the Council of Aging. Any questions? Well, I think the policy that we put in place is seeing some results as well, positive results. You know, before you got here, Andrew, this used to be a very big issue for me. Yeah. Took a lot of issue with it. I still don't like the fact that we put it all under you. I still believe that each department head should be responsible for their gas. It shouldn't have to fall under you. Um, 
That's fine. At least it's going in the right direction now that we have a policy. And I, you know, I did take some issue with some of your guys driving their cars back to New Hampshire and driving back. But I think we've got that under control now. At least I assume we do. Yeah, there, there's no, there's only, yeah, we, if there's a take home list um, coming up in the fleet list. So you can see that. But that's been reduced apparently. But I'm, from I'm, my I'm, understanding. I'm very happy with it this year than I have been in the past years. But I still think we can go to the next level and put it back into the departments where it belongs and let them be accountable rather than you be accountable for the department heads gas usage. I'll move on. Okay. I was just going to say I don't know why. Any other questions for Andrew? Michael? That's okay. No? Um, so just a, this is kind of an update on the fuel forecast. Obviously, if I was really good at this, I wouldn't work here. <laughs> I would be forecasting fuel elsewhere. Um, there's two locations that we tend to look at for fuel um, usage. Gas Buddy is one, one location. There's, this is their estimate for the upcoming years. This, these numbers have been adjusted to remove the federal fuel tax that we do not pay, um, that the rest of the retail world pays. So we're looking at a $2.20 um, cost per gallon for gasoline up to 226 in 2018 and uh, up to 260 for diesel at the end of 2018. And you based your budget then on these numbers? Correct. There, there's some, there's obviously a lot of fluctuation in those numbers. Um, there's, there's a, they break it down by month, but we use, we use an average number to, mm -hmm. to come up with. Any questions on the fuel forecast? Um, this is the current vehicle list minus, you know, the small, small pieces of equipment. Um, the three highlighted vehicles in green are the take, current take-home vehicles that um, were, were referred to, and that's the myself, the town engineer, and the building, uh, the water superintendent. So what does the capital folks think of this list? I mean, you look at all the dump trucks. Look at all the pickup trucks. And we continue to request to buy more of these. I mean, do you, is this typical amount of trucks for a little department like yours to have? I mean, this is a lot of vehicles. I mean, is the way to start getting rid of what you don't need anymore and just, I mean, this seems to be a when, when, when a new vehicle was purchased, the old one goes away. I think last year we got rid of two and bought one. So then when a new vehicle is purchased, the other one doesn't doesn't stay. I understand that. But there's a lot still on this list that they don't use. There's no way you're using it. If you don't have enough guys to use all these vehicles. We and do yet. not we not drive every vehicle simultaneously, correct. Or um, even within a year. Unfortunately, I, I can't really give you a great answer at this point because I haven't been here through a whole cycle of the season to tell you, you know, what do we have that's, that's possibly not being utilized properly or, or at all. Um, in addition to that, you know, one of the things we need to look at is, you know, are there areas where we, where there's a, a vehicle, a multi-purpose vehicle that can be utilized instead of two different vehicles? Um, and, and at this point, I'm not able to answer that question. Um, it does not seem excessive, just based on my experience with other DPWs. Um, we do currently have, a, we are a little short on staff, but because we're short on staff, we put one guy in one truck to do a job as compared to being able to put two guys out on a job in a truck. So there, there, is, some, there are some areas that we need, to, we need to continue to look at as we get staffed back up and then see how we function. Once we function through a full season, you know, I'll, I'll have a better handle on how we actually operate during the course of the summer and, and some of the other projects we do. Joe? Um, just looking at the vehicle list. Um, but a year and a half ago, I think the town of Ministry, I had a, a very long discussion about street sweeping. Um, you know, you get a piece of equipment here that's 12 years old, there was, con there was a discussion, I think last year, about buying a new one. Uh, first off, and Andrew, you can agree or disagree with me, street sweepers are probably one of the pieces of equipment that are down the most just because of the dust and all that, and the filters, and it just, they're, they're very high maintenance vehicles. You know, I had suggested that, and I had done a, 
uh, sort of a checks and balances type of thing for the town administrator. Suggested putting that out to bid, contracting it out. I think it's, if you look around, I'd say more communities than not are now going out to bid with street sweeping services. You know, we're in a situation where you don't do it every week. You can do the, I think, again, I can't off the top of my head recall what I did, but I think you can do the whole town in four weeks if you bring a dedicated company in just to do that for us. Whereas we're, you know, we're doing it over the course of three months. Until last year we were, yes. Right? And um, so it's just something I throw out there that you may want to consider. I just think there's a lot of savings. And now it frees up one and a half bodies too that you could, you know, that they're, when they're, while they're sweeping, they could be doing other things that, that the department needs them for. So just, just something to throw out there to consider. Thank you. Um, I think you're somewhat correct. We did have some discussions about a year ago. Uh, so I don't know if it was in the CIP meeting or not. Uh, but I think one of the things that we were concerned about was the when we contracted out, and, and, and I know your example is a little bit different. You, you're saying contract them out for a four week period or for a six week period, whatever the case might be. Well, you, that's you what hit every street saying. once. Right. right. The town hits every street once. Right. Right. I, so I did a, I did, based on how fast the equipment goes, and I actually gave it, a, you know, I think a, at the time I gave it like a 15% leeway advantage of saying that, you know, if it goes this fast, and then I added 15% on the end, I think the cost was, was, you know, $20,000 a year or something like that. It was a, I forget the number. I have, I, I have it, I can pull it out again. Right. And, you, and your, your point was to do it for a specified period of time. And, and I think that the, the, um, response to that was when we have used or tried to use uh, uh, a contracted uh, company that they would do it at their convenience because they had so many towns and that was would be well, taking you, a long time. But you, I, put that in the, you put that in the, your specs. Right, right. right. So I, you put it in your specs. You have to do it yeah. at, first off at the, at the direction of the uh, Direct, director of public right. works and no, no earlier than this date, no later than this date. Right. And then, so if you give it a two and a half or a three month leeway, then the director can decide when he wants that in that period of time, when he wants, when he wants it done. And 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 I think they they uh, the question came up: How much is it costing? Ten thousand dollars a year to clean it out and stuff. You have to dismantle the whole thing and clean it out. I sweep. I'm talking about. Oh, sweeper. I don't know that. I don't know what the uh, again. I think we, we. I can assure you, a 2005 sweeper is not going to last you much longer. Right. I'm surprised it's it's whoever's maintaining that is doing a very good job because it's it's 12 years old and I'm surprised it's, it's still yeah. functioning. Yeah, it, it I, came up in capital I think two years did. ago to replace it, right. and we didn't do that. Right. Any other questions regarding the vehicle list? Water projects. Uh, so, on the water side, um, just a current project update, and um, Mark may be able to add a little more to this, um, but currently the water meter project, um, there's a draft RFP that was provided back to us from Western and Sampson for the meters and the AMI system, which is the, uh, the wireless system that's part of that whole meter project. Um, that's being reviewed by us now. The intent is that goes out. That'll go out to bid in March. Um, the, the schedule is there for um, evaluating and awarding it by May, and then um, and then in June, looking at putting together the RFP for for the installation portion of the project, and then currently scheduling the start the installation in September of 2017. So, Andrew. Uh, Several years ago, we uh, went out and bonded this project in an article, and it's lagged for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, have you looked at the amount of money that's available for this, and are we going to end up, maybe it's an unfair question at this point, but based on your experience, and maybe Joe, you have some comments. Uh, do we have enough? I don't know if you want me to address this one, Mr. Chair. Who? I said I don't know that you want me to address this one. No. Well, this is a. I mean, I'll. I'll 
hand it to him first, and then yeah. I'll. So th this, so in, in some discussion with uh, Weston Sampson, there was some concern over what was appropriated and, and what the potential cost of the project is. Um, the, the thought at this point, or at least the point moving forward, was let's get the project moving, let's get the IFP, uh, excuse me, the RFP out there for for this contract, see where that comes in, um, and then put start to put to get put together the installation of services, um, IFP, and, and see where we where we end up with. Um, potential estimates and, and take it from there. Do you anticipate having all of that done in time for us to, if we needed to go and get uh, additional money for the June town meeting? No. Negative. Negative. The, I, the IFB I don't see being put together before the June town meeting or, or put out and, and, and bid on by that point. And the IFP is the for the cert the installation of services. Installation of services. Yes, Joe. So, I believe we, the CIP committee approved this three years ago, at least two, two years. Two ago? years ago, yeah, at least. I think it's two years ago. And at the time, it was, it was a tight budget. I mean, I did. I did a lot of investigation on this, and, and it was a tight budget, but it was doable for a fixed system. Um, the problem you're going to have now is two years later, what's going to hit you is, and you may, you know, I don't know if there's been so much of an increase in the uh, equipment, but you're going to get hit on prevailing wage. I can assure you prevailing wage has gone up somewhat over the last two years, if not substantially. So. I, I don't, i confident at this point that the 1.7, is that what we did? The award, uh, we, I can assure you the 1.7 is not going to be enough. I'd be shocked if it were. There was, there was some question on, on the department's side back then if 1.7 was going to be enough. Mm -hmm. Now I can assure you 1.7 is not going to be enough. And that's just because it has, you know, it just, nothing was done for two years. <coughs> when we when we did this, the 1.7 included a little bit, not a lot, a little bit extra. It could have been a couple hundred thousand dollars extra. I think the estimate was less than that. We actually went for a higher amount. Yeah, I think than the estimate. So I, think I don't know. You you'll know you'll know when you get back the the uh, the responses. It's, it's unfortunate that it's taken two years to get to this point. Right. Well, of course it's not. Not him. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Wasn't, wasn't pointing to Andrew. Like that. <laughs> I don't take it personally. I guess, but it's Joe, then if the prevailing wage is going to bite us, right, and we'd go out to bid, but we have to pay the prevailing wage, it would seem to me this is the kind of thing you'd like to do in the winter when construction jobs and everything else is slowed down a little bit. I don't know. It's going to make much of a difference. Um, yeah. You know, there's other ways of looking at it. You could, you could hire temporary s staff yourself and and probably pay less. You know, you get if it's if it's a year project, you bring on two people for a year. Then you're not paying. I, I can see money. going into a lot of homes when none of that's been touched, right? That it isn't a matter of just going in there and turning off the water. Well, that, building yeah. the meter and putting a new one in, and then whatever electronics have to be added to it. Yeah, unfortunately, that's something that you know Mike's going to have to figure out. If if the plumbing looks bad, do we even bother, or do we shut it off outside? There's, there's a lot entailed. A lot, there's a lot involved. I mean, okay. many the one advantage we do have is we use what's called a meter horn, so we're not literally touching the old iron pipe. There's a copper fitting that the, most of the homes the meter sits in, so. That, that is an advantage. It does depend on what is there to shut the valve. Is there an old gate valve to shut down? Do you really want to touch that? Um, well, you know, so, I, you know I, I mean, I can remember years ago, and it was uh, Dick Spindler was still the yeah. DPW director, and I shut my shut off valve. because there's no shut off on the other side of the meter. I shut it off to do oh, something cool. in the house. It's in the middle of the winter. When I turned it on, I couldn't get the water back on. Yeah, unfortunately, the old, the old, it has a gate valve that comes down in the middle of that pipe. You 
do your work on your side, you've taken all the pressure off it, you've got 100 pounds pushing against this side, so it's pushing the valve one way, then you go to open it and that stem breaks, so it's broken in the closed position. More and more, the newer homes especially have a ball valve instead of the old gauge valve, which is a much less... Well, I'm just valve. thinking that it's not just a piece of cake to go in there no. and say, it's going to take 30 minutes or an hour to change everybody's meter. Anyway, all right, so we got a challenge coming up. I guess that's the, the bottom line here. That I would agree we, with that, yes. We would all agree, mm -hmm. it seems, that we don't have enough money to do what we set out to do at this point. Possibly. MWRA, you want to comment on that? Uh, MWRA, um, the, connection, the water connection, um, as you're all aware, 9 Mill Street has been purchased. Um, that's the property that being looked at for the pump station. Um, we're currently having meetings with uh, Wright and Pierce, who is the town's consultant. Um, they are pulling together the water main plans for the work that needs to be done in Reading. Uh, there's a meeting scheduled with us and them to go over some of that work coming up. Um, <clears throat> they're currently working a preliminary design report for the pump station, um, expected back to us around mid-March. For review and then uh, <clears throat> there's a s scheduling of the uh, meeting with Reading Engineering Office to discuss with us in Western Sam uh, excuse me right Pierce to discuss the uh, the crossing at the river um, and then we're in the process of reviewing the KMP uh, Coleman and Pages Town Council provided some comments on the FEIR agreement that we need to get back to right in PS and we're in the process of reviewing that. That's kind of where we where we stand are at this point with that project unless there's further questions. I'm just gonna make two comments. One is that and I'm sure you've heard it from me already that this is an important project for the town and we need to do everything possible to keep it on schedule. And roadblocks will come up and we're gonna have to address them with a little speed. I'm a little concerned about KMP and the review of this FEIR still on the list. But. Well, yeah. they, they completed their review yeah, within 24 right. hours of our last mm -hmm. discussion about this. Okay. And now yes. we need to respond to them. Yes, they, that has now been back, it's back in our hands as of okay. beginning of this week. Um, my second comment is that uh, for those that are not directly involved with this project, that the uh, town of Reading selectmen and their town manager and every and their DPW have been just worked so well and uh, been so cooperative in helping move this project along. I think that you know, the public record should state that uh, we're very appreciative of their contribution to making this happen. Anything else, Andrew, on this? That's all I have on the MWRA stuff. Um, so currently the water budget, as you see, is, um, has a proposed increase of 1%, which puts it at that $3,954,529. That does not include an adjustment as it relates to the capital projects, Michael? Correct. That's correct. So that's something we're going to have to take into account with the water rate. Yes. Right. That, that, that's correct. That, that percent increase is for the departmental's operating request. It does not reflect a projected water rate, nor does it reflect all the debt service that need to, needs to be added to that. That's an action that will take place after we've gone through the capital planning process and in, in, in advance of a water rate hearing to take place in either May or June. Mm -hmm. So these are the, the increases or the adjustments you'll see on the, um, on the water budget under personnel services, um, there's an, ass an assumed contractual increase of 2% laid into the water budget. Um, in addition to that, the engineering intern that we discussed at the beginning of the, the meeting, um, this is the other half of that cost share that was in uh, the engineering budget. Um, energy electricity sees a, a similar increase of 2.5% as based on the Reading Municipal Lights increase or indicated increase and then uh, the, the water 
itself sees a, a rate increase of 102,794, and that's based on the IMA with, with Andover for our water supply. And it's based on how many million gallons for the year? You recall? <coughs> I think the number was 320, I Um, in addition to that, you'll see the training and education, similar to the other, similar discussions uh, with the other departments, um, is the increase in training added to the, uh, both the new staff and the existing staff to, uh, to provide them training as, as, as needed and required. Um, continuing along the, the budget, uh, as we previously discussed, the, the change in the telephones, uh, or the cell phones, I should say, um, this, the intent was to shift the water, the phones that are used under the water department to be funded under the water department, um, for the cell phones or, or tablet service currently what's being utilized. Um, other supplies, $2,263. That's a projected two and a half increase in the cost of chemicals. And dues and memberships, $7,051. That covers the increased memberships for new staff, which is not as much as seven grand, but, um, but the also cost share for the <coughs> code red system. So the code red system is, is cost shared. It's not in the administrative budget. Previously in the past, um, it has been in the town administrator's budget, the total cost. Um, but in prior years, water has paid for half of it, and the town administrator's budget has turned back the other half of it. So for FY17, the whole cost is budgeted in the town administrator's budget. However, we feel that 50% of the code red system is utilized for water breaks and different water items. Um, and the water department should have it budgeted and not just have to absorb that cost, you know, annually. How, how much is the, that 50% of the total cost of the code red? Any idea annually? The contract, I believe, is, is approximately $11,000, if I remember correctly. Okay. And, yeah, and shared 50-50. Miss Aaron, Bob, Bob. I assume we're wrapping things up. I, I yes. just wanted to make a statement Questions. on this budget, and you know, it's probably my fault why I'm disappointed a little bit. It's probably that I, because I didn't bring it up before. But, you know, we had an issue in town, a serious issue, and you lost some guys in that issue. But you know, you read through your budget, you read through all the budgets, and they're really you would never know we had a problem in town. And I only bring this up because I think it's responsible of us to make some changes in the way we do business to make sure that we never have an issue that we had before ever come up again. And I'm talking about little things, you know, like putting a camera down at the fuel station so it's always recorded. Who's coming in, using our fuel, buying, our, getting our fuel, and so on and so forth. Putting D GPS trackers, which I brought up before in other meetings. I, I believe in it. I know it's a little bit of cost, but you know what? It gives the public a little bit of... They just know that the town's doing something to make sure that they put the protections in place so things don't happen again. And I think it has to be addressed in this budget. I know it's a bad budget year to do these things, but I think it would be wrong of us not to at least address it. And other than that, I thought you did a great job. And I know that you learned a lot this year, and I'm sure it will get better every year you go along. Thank you. Any other budget questions or comments? We'll call it a wrap. Uh, I'd just like to uh, one thank uh, Mark uh, and our engineering staff at the DPW during the transition period. Of course, Bob, uh, what was his last name? Oh, Bob Moylan. Right. Uh, and the work that they did while we're waiting for you, Andrew, to come on board. Uh, much appreciated. Comments of Julie and uh, the work that she's done throughout. Town Hall and the other buildings said we have nothing but good co compliments. Thank you for that. And Andrew, <coughs> again, welcome on board. Thank you. We have some challenges going forward, and a lot of them fall right on your lap. 
<laughs> and uh, hopefully, uh, if you need support from us, uh, uh, we'd like to hear about it. Very good. Thank you. I appreciate it. With this, motion I adjourn. call for a motion. To so moved. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Second by Mr. Ewell. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.